Please uh, know that we're all excited that you're here in person. This is great. Many of you know that we were going to have this symposium last September and had to postpone it because of COVID. And we are so <laughs> thankful that we were able to have it and in person, it's, it's wonderful. So uh, my name's Courtney Broadus, for, if I haven't met you yet, and together with Bill Hopewell sitting here, we're uh, co-hosting this symposium in honor of John Murray. And I'm sure John Murray is, is the, what, the person who has brought us all together. And we have a, a whole day of, of talks that will take off from uh, John Murray's contributions and take us into the future. But now I, I want to uh, welcome Dinny Murray, otherwise known as Diane Johnson, a famous author of both fiction and nonfiction, uh, critic, essayist, and as we love to tell people, uh, the writer of the screenplay for the horror film, The Shining. And, uh, <laughs> and also uh, an important or help in organizing the symposium. So uh, Dinny, you may officially welcome everyone. Thank you, thank you very much for coming. It's been uh, a joy to see as many old friends as I myself happen to know, and I'm sure you all know uh, each other. So it's, it's great to get together. Um, the program says that Dinny Murray is going to talk for 15 minutes about John, <laughs> and I assure you I'm not going to talk for 15 minutes. But I thought I would say something about John's death uh, because it has some clinical uh, implications. John died the first week of, of COVID. He uh, had been being treated at a French hospital, Gustave Roussy, for uh, an, a tumor on his leg or hip. And, and they had a miracle knife kind of thing, and he would go every day and get five minutes of radiation, which meant many, many trips to Gustave Roussy and, of course, no masks. Uh, and it probably was completely inundated with COVID, so he got it. And um, with someone 92 on the cusp of 93, it's, as we know now, a serious matter. It, because it was the beginning of the AIDS epidemic, nobody really had any measures. We had heard that there was Paxlovid in uh, America, but there wasn't any in France. Um, and so uh, there was no treatment. Some of you may know John's feelings about in, intubation. Um, but several days into his hospitalization, which he was, he, he was not really very conscious, but enough to ask him, shouldn't I go and urge them to intubate you? He said, intubation is not the end of the world. So uh, I did go and plead with the French doctors to intubate him but they felt that that would be a mistake. Um, so uh, he, he didn't really have any treatment, just support, and uh, was sick for a week, and more or less comatose. But he did have some last words, and these I will share with you because they'll strike people differently and perhaps more, uh, justly in, in some cases than others. He said, uh, after being silent for days and days, I'm sorry I was cranky. <laughs> so I just leave you with that. <laughs> so. so this is a lot of fun. Uh, it's a, the greatest gathering of old friends and former trainees and 
people that we've worked with over, over many years. So it's uh, really great to have all of you here. Um, it sort of looks like Courtney and I have gone to our n n neutral corners, <laughs> but we actually got along pretty well in uh, putting this together. So um, my task is to introduce Talmadge King. Uh, Talmadge is uh, Dean of the School of Medicine at UCSF and uh, as Associate, uh, what are you, Vice Chancellor for Medical Affairs. And we were very pleased when we first contacted Talmadge, he said, um, no, he had an unbreakable commitment that he couldn't, uh, he wouldn't be able to be here. But uh, he broke his unbreakable commitment and, <laughs> and here he is and we're very pleased that he is uh, chosen to grace us with his presence. <laughs> so, the truth is they really guilted me. Um, <laughs> so, they, uh, there was this phone call between the two of them and me and they were, they talked all around it, right? But when I got off the phone call, I told Moselle, my wife, oh my God, I have to say. <laughs> um, and even though this thing had been promised for a long time. Uh, I knew I had to stay. And, I, and it's great to be here uh, and welcome everybody. And like Phil just said, it's so wonderful to see uh, so many uh, uh, old friends and um, colleagues. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm like a, I'm a hybrid. So I'm a Colorado person and a San Francisco person. And so I, I sit in, the, Venn, in the, the, two, the overlapping Venn diagrams between the two programs. And I come at it with that perspective to, to some extent. Uh, and getting to know John was uh, one of the highlights of, of, of my career because uh, I had admired him from afar, having trained in Colorado and, um, and, and reading, uh, reading his work and, and um, uh, and so getting to know him was, was really a highlight. As many of you know, he was a, UC, a University of California system lifer. Uh, he began his career as a faculty member at UCLA in 1957. And John, if I think this story is true, but he, he would tell the story that he went to UCLA to be a cardiologist. And when he, but when he arrived at UCLA, he learned that they had hired him to set up the pulmonary disease division. And so his, his career and life changed and he became a lung doctor and the world has been fortunate uh, because of that. So that was a, an important turning point in his professional life. And the other thing is when John came along, it was at a, at a point when pulmonary was really becoming a subspecialty. Um, it was a dramatic uh, change in, in the profession that had been dominated largely by work related to tuberculosis. But then other diseases started to become uh, important um, to manage and learn about uh, asthma, emphysema, cancer, uh, and, and other uh, lung diseases. And John became an important part of, of, of that development. There were new activities such as uh, intensive care, uh, the physiological studies became much more prominent, uh, and fiber optic bronchoscopy was being developed at that time. So John went on to be a tireless worker dedicated to San Francisco General Hospital. Uh, it's Zuckerberg San Francisco General, but it's still the general to me. Um, he was the chief of the, of the division from 1966 to 1989. He arrived at a, at a time when the hospital was being fully integrated into the UCSF training program. And he was a key fig figure in making that partnership successful. He served as chief of the medical staff and he conducted a, a successful research program that was focused mainly on the pathogenesis and treatment of acute lung injury in ARDS. After retiring in 1994, he continued to serve as an attending physician in the MICU, teaching and inspiring future physicians to value uh, concerns about patients. So I come along in 1997. I joined, I joined the faculty at the General, and I distinctly remember my first meeting with John as chief of medicine and him as an attending physician. And, he, and we talked about the usual friends that overlap, and he looked, looked at me and he said, 
I want you to tell me when I should stop. And that was an amazing comment to me. It's like, just tell me if, if I need to, if, if I'm not contributing and I, and I should stop. And then every year after that when he came, he would meet with me before he started in the ICU and ask me the same question, should I do this? And I would always tell him, John, and because he, he was beginning to be concerned that he was away and he, he wasn't keeping up. And what I told him was, you know, John, the, 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 we have great residents and fellows here. What they need from you is all your wisdom. And they are waiting for you to come so you can sh share that with them. And he would leave and have a great time attending and always get accolades from the house staff and, uh, and the fellows for, for his contributions. So he, so he had a tremendous influence on many, many young, young people. Um, he had a keen intellect. He was an, an amazing professor of medicine. And he had the unique ability to present, either in writing or in his public pres presentations, difficult topics, and he made them simple. And I, used to, I remember going to ATS, and he would get up and give a talk, and it would be a very complicated set of issues. And John would make it seem so simple. He was incredibly articulate uh, and clear about uh, uh, the message that he was delivering. You always left thinking, uh, thinking that you had learned something valuable. He never slowed down after retirement. He, in fact, he published more than 40 papers after, quote, retirement. Uh, and then he was actively involved in the Murray and Nadell textbook of restaurant medicine which is now in the seventh edition led by, by Courtney, which you'll hear about later. This book re continues to reflect John's clarity of thought and writing and his commitment to the application of sound scientific principles to pulmonary medicine. It's known to be a, a, a readable, clear coverage of, uh, of, of pulmonary disease that is often said to be the gold standard textbook in pulmonary medicine. So I was thrilled uh, when in 1994, I was asked to write several chapters for the second edition. And, uh, and then I was over the moon uh, in, in 2010 after I'd come, and I was asked by John to be, uh, and Jay to be one of the editors. So I started as an editor of the fifth edition. And it's been uh, really fun to work, and many of the people who worked on the, uh, who are editors of the book are call colleagues and there are most, several of them in the room today. So that's been a wonderful experience. And, and that experience was also a learning experience for me to watch John guide us through the process of, uh, of writing that textbook and figuring out what was important. It's, so it's, it's difficult to overstate his influence at, at UCSF School of Medicine. Um, he taught so much to our community. He established the ICU, he created a national model for the division. In doing so, he helped San Francisco General become a, a prominent place for high quality research and teaching. Part of his legacy is the John Murray Award for Excellence in Internal Medicine, which, is, which recognized faculty who demonstrate excellence in academic medicine and dedication to the humanitarian mission of San Francisco General, uh, and this award has been given since 2003. And also, he, there's the John F. Murray Distinguished Professorship, which with the help of John's family and the UCSF found, Foundation uh, it has, what has been established, and later you'll hear from Brian Graham, who's the current uh, holder of that professorship. So nationally, John helped to create the field of pulmonology itself. He established, uh, he was one of the prominent members establishing the National Society, the American Thoracic Society. Uh, he played a, 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 an outsized role in that, uh, in the development of ATS. He guided the journal. Uh, he helped design training programs. He worked with the National Heart, Lung, and Blood, Blood Institute. He was everywhere, and he contributed at a high level. Uh, his, he, John left an indelible mark on clinical practice of pulmonary medicine, and importantly, on the process of identifying and selecting uh, trainees who, uh, who have carried on the work that he started. So in summary, John has influenced so many of us at UCSF and at, and at San Francisco General and the specialty. He's truly a giant in the field of pulmonary medicine and is dearly missed. Uh, and I personally uh, thank him for 
uh, his clear writings and his contributions. I remember the, the, one, the first book I read by John was The Normal Lung. And at the time, it completely changed my thought about, I, I was a first year fellow at Colorado and it was so clearly written um, uh, and so helpful to just setting the floor for my understanding of pulmonary disease that I have always been grateful for that, uh, that little book that had such an uh, outsized impact, certainly on me and maybe others as well. Um, so with that, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you so much for coming to this. It's so wonderful to see so many people who have traveled here from other places to share in this moment. Uh, welcome to UCSF. I uh, hope that you get the, many of you probably haven't been here since we built this new campus. Um, we have, we have, we have, uh, when I came to UCSF, there was only dirt here uh, in 97. Uh, Genentech Hall, which is right next door, was going up. And in the subsequent 25 plus years, um, we have done several million square feet of new space down here at Mission Bay, including a, a hospital. Uh, and we still have the mothership up at Parnassus, uh, which is where my office is some days. Um, and uh, so we have two major campuses, and we'd like to share that with you while, while you're here, uh, if you'd like to, like to see, look, look around and see it. But thank you so much, and thank you for uh, your support of John, and uh, we really hope you have a, a great day uh, in this symposium. So thank you. Next, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Missy Chen. Missy is a, a nurse, a longtime nurse in the ICU. I've known and worked with her for many years. Um, I was very surprised one morning when driving to work to hear on NPR Missy's voice talking about uh, COVID uh, in, the, in the ICU. And uh, so we've asked her to give some uh, sort of personal reflections on John as an intensivist um, in the uh, medical ICU at San Francisco General. Missy? I want to thank Dr. Murray's family and Dr. Osbratis and Hopewell for inviting me to speak today to share my experiences and memory of Dr. John Murray and his everlasting impact on my profession. I've been in the medical cardiac ICU at San Francisco General for the past 23 years. I began at SFGH in 2000 as a nursing student. I was then hired as a bedside nurse and then eventually as a designated charge nurse. I had the honor of knowing and the privilege of working with Dr. Murray for over 10 of those years. One of my very first memories of Dr. Murray was when I was barely off orientation and the MICU team came to the bedside to round on my patient in 5R. As is customary during rounds, the physicians, respiratory therapist, and bedside nurse form a makeshift circle outside of the patient's room. As a green bedside nurse, I had very reluctantly joined this circle. I was just off orientation, and although someone thought that I was capable of caring for a critically ill patient, I felt I most certainly was not. As I very hesitantly took my place in this circle, one of the residents obliviously stepped in front of me, blocking me from the rest of the participants. Dr. Murray immediately held up his hand, pausing the resident's presentation and said to him, you have just removed the only clinician who can effectively speak to what is actually happening with this patient. <laughs> I suggest you stand behind her. <clears throat> I was mortified because in all honesty, I could not effectively speak to anything, but that moment stuck with me. Here was this attending with his reputation and legacy, which I was very much aware of, showing me such respect, and quite obviously making a very clear statement about the valuable role of the bedside nurse. But I think what stayed with me most was that he said it so factually. He did not say it in a, may, in a way that was meant to scold or embarrass this resident. There was a kindness in his reprimand. And in the end, it bestowed in me a sense of belonging, as well as his significance in my role. And quite profoundly, Dr. Murray had made a statement to everyone in those rounds that all members of the ICU team were important and worthy of respect. Everyone was valued. Dr. Murray was not afraid to have the difficult end-of-life discussions with patients and families. I think it was because he had an unwavering devotion to his patients. He was one of the most gifted individuals I have ever worked with in having these challenging discussions with both patients and their families. I believe this was not only because he was so loyal to his patients, but because he was so dedicated to the notion of dying with dignity. 
Dr. Murray felt that it was a basic human right to decide how one's life should end. In honoring this, he always encouraged residents, interns, nurses, respiratory therapists, and social workers to participate in these end-of-life discussions. And in doing so, he gave us all the ability to advocate for our patients, as well as the tools to navigate the future difficult end-of-life discussions that we would all eventually face in our careers. After his retirement, <clears throat> Dr. Murray spent the majority of his time with Par in Paris with his family, but would come to San Francisco in the summer to attend, most notably in July when the new interns would start. While here, he would schedule his health appointments, and in doing so, would need labs drawn prior to these yearly checkups. One day, quite early in my career, he said to me, okay, Missy, you seem to be the one to go to. I need you to draw my labs. He handed me his gold plastic outpatient card and like 10 blood tube vials. I think I might have seriously considered resigning at that moment, because although he had great veins, had I missed, I'm pretty sure that would have been the end of my career. Thankfully, I must have done okay, because I was his designated blood drawer for the rest of his time with us. And quite honestly, in all of my 23 years at San Francisco General, being John Murray's phlebotomist might be the highlight of my career. <laughs> there are only a handful of nurses left at San Francisco General who worked with Dr. Murray. When I was asked to speak on behalf of nursing, I asked each of these nurses to share what Dr. Murray meant to them and to our profession. Every one of them said that it was hard to articulate exactly what it was about Dr. Murray that was so special. But they all said that maybe because it was because he was not afraid of death or dying. Maybe his mission was never to save or cure everyone. Maybe it was to simply give respect to the life one had lived. And maybe that was good enough. One fateful evening in March of 2020, Antonio Gomez came to me and told me that Dr. Murray was dying of COVID-19 in a Paris hospital. We both thought that maybe he would forego a ventilator in order to save it for someone else. Hopefully someone who would survive this pandemic, hopefully someone who would go on to live a life of service and truth, thereby honoring Dr. Murray's mission of dying with dignity. When those of us at San Francisco General heard that Dr. Murray had died, Mary Taylor, who has worked as a registered nurse at San Francisco General for 39 years, passed out bow ties, and the nursing staff wore them in his honor. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to shine light on a man who undoubtedly had one of the biggest impacts on my personal career, as well as my professional one. Not only did John Murray teach entire generations of healthcare workers how to be better clinicians, he taught us all how to be better human beings. Thank you. I have the pleasure of introducing Brian Graham to speak next. Um, Brian is the current chief of the pulmonary division at San Francisco General, otherwise known as ZSFG, and he's the current holder of the John F. Murray Distinguished Professorship. Now, we were fortunate to recruit him from University of Colorado uh, in 2019 with just a short time to kind of get his bearings before we hit him with COVID. And uh, he then faced a challenge that turned our entire medical system upside down and kept, kept everything afloat and has done marvelously. He's active clinically at San Francisco General. He also has a vibrant research program in studying the mechanisms of pulmonary hypertension. Thank you, Brian. Thank you very much, Courtney. And thank you very much to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, I wanted to acknowledge Courtney as the primary provider of the photographs that I'll be showing here. Uh, and so um, uh, this first photograph was taken in the lobby of the new hospital, if you haven't been there. Um, and this was done, I think, just before the hospital opened in um, 2015. Um, as opposed to most of you in the room who I think have known John and met John many times over many years, I've only met him once, and it was at this event that Courtney organized. Uh, this was a lunch at the uh, Tartine Manufactory in the Mission. And um, I, there I had the opportunity to meet John. He's, as you all know, a remarkable fellow. I don't remember the details of the conversation, but I'm sure we talked about the legacy of the division and the many changes that have gone on over the years. And, um, and, and again, the, the four of us, the four um, division chiefs, have had the opportunity uh, at this time to sort of talk about and reflect back on the, on the legacy and the, and the changes that have gone over. Um, this is a, another photograph provided by Courtney that um, is from the rooftop garden of the new hospital. It has a really amazing overlook over the city and is one of the highlights of the, of the hospital. Um, 
some of the things that I'm sure that we talked about at that lunch were the values that um, were kind of um, instilled upon the division uh, by John and then carried on by Phil and then Courtney. And that includes excellence in all domains of academic medicine, uh, respect for the patients and the families that we take care of, um, respect for our colleagues, the nurses, the respiratory therapists, social work, et cetera, pride and responsibility, and, and, again, and the care of the underserved, which is really the core mission of San Francisco General Hospital. Um, we, as an academic uh, pulmonary program, um, have uh, domains in, ac in clinical care, research, and teaching. And without going into the details, we uh, cover a lot of uh, ground uh, amongst a relatively small faculty. Uh, this is a, a composite of all of the uh, present members of our faculty. I'll stay up here for just a, a minute so you can uh, see the people that you know. It's really one of the things that I was struck by when I came was the remarkable um, strength of the faculty in terms of the, uh, the expertise and the friendliness and um, the collegiality. Uh, one of the um, kind of key uh, data points I'll, I'll point out is the, um, is the distribution of uh, emeritus full professors, associates, and assistants. And it really, the fact that there's this, um, this um, uh, clear uh, uh, trajectory where there's you know, a, a very natural progression from assistant to associate to full, it, it speaks to the mentorship structure within the division whereby the older uh, faculty mentor the, the junior faculty successfully and everybody sort of slowly rises and progresses through the division. And that I think is, really speaks to the strength of the mentorship structure that was instilled in the division by John. Uh, these are some recent additions to our faculty. Uh, just uh, speak very briefly on this. Chris Berger is a um, physician scientist who joined in um, 2021. He is supported by a K23 award and uh, studies TB diagnostics and therapeutics with um, a particular interest in implementation science and uh, human-based design. Rahul Kumar is a PhD uh, scientist who joined um, last year and studies hypoxia-induced pulmonary hypertension, uh, basic mechanisms of disease using mouse models. Leslie Seho is uh, joined just this year. She is a joint recruit between ourselves and Parnassus. She has a particular uh, area in lung transplantation, which we're very excited about. Um, in particularly related to disparities of care, uh, as our patients at San Francisco General sometimes have limited access to lung transplant and other advanced treatment measures. And uh, Dr. Richard Wang is a, a physician scientist who joined in 2019. His particular, and he's supported by a K23. His particular area of interest is the overlap between cannabis and HIV and lung disease. Um, and so uh, he's uh, um, really made fantastic strides in that. He's also supported by a California state grant in that domain. Um, we have uh, five administrative um, uh, um, staff that, uh, that run the operations of our division. Jenny Fowler is our division manager, and then um, Kristen Wong, uh, Anisha, Mary, and Katie are the other members of our uh, administrative staff. And in addition, we have 42 uh, research staff that support the PI, so our total complement in our division is between 60 and 70. So I wanted to speak briefly about the, um, the John Murray professorship. So uh, it's really been uh, Courtney's kind of mission over the last, I think, five to eight years or so to have more <laughs> to, to, uh, to obtain funding and, and fill the professorship. And so uh, we use the professorship within the division for many operational sort of uses, and these are some of them. So uh, the first is supporting the gap between uh, K awardees and our target salary. As you know, uh, cost of living in the Bay Area is relatively high, and so where the K salary support comes in is, is a little lower. And so with the addition of clinical time, there's still a gap um, to where we want the salaries to be um, for, a, for a living wage. And so we use the John Murray professorship to fill that gap. Uh, we also use it for some flexible leadership positions, um, including uh, doc, uh, Dr. Thacker, who's our um, uh, pulmonary diversity, equity, inclusion, and social justice champion. And then we have a, a well-being champion and a staff, a faculty well-being champion and a staff well-being champion as well. And they have a little bit of uh, FTE that's supported through the, the Murray professorship. And then we use it for benefits for the entire division. We have a weekly clinical conference that we pay for lunch. We do social activities. The photograph here is an outing at a Giants game uh, last year. And then uh, we recently had a divisional strategic retreat. 
And uh, the photograph here is from that divisional strategic retreat. Lawrence Wong brought uh, bow ties for all of us, and so um, we, uh, we took this photograph. It was really remarkable. This is the, the greatest number of our pulmonary division faculty I've ever seen in one place at one time. Uh, because through, through, you know, I mean, we do Zoom and whatnot, but, but to actually get everybody into one room was really, really remarkable. Um, and so uh, the, the future anticipated uses of the professorship funds then um, are, again, just sort of appreciating its flexibility and, and discretion of use, facilitating the fellows joining the faculty through the coverage of that salary gap, and then support for faculty and staff activities. There. Um, and so with that, I'll conclude. Um, again, John Murray had a, you know, uh, uh, amazing impression on the division that is really left to this day, instilling great values in our in our faculty. It's really led to this extraordinary mentorship structure that uh, that elevates us all. And um, and I want to acknowledge um, the the really the the people that have contributed to this um, the Murray professorship, uh, Courtney. Um, uh, uh, Ms. Ben, uh, Bernadette Glenn, the director of the William Hurt Foundation, and then the Office of Development here, and then the many donors, including, I'm sure, many, many people in this room. Thank you very much. I want to uh, slip in to introduce Phil, because he's going to introduce the rest of the program, so this is a, a good place for me to slip in. He's well known to, I would say, every single person in this room, uh, he had a long association with John Murray, so when he speaks about John Murray, we listen. And has been a faculty member at SFGH slash ZSFG for 50 years. Key things to know about Phil was that he was the chief of pulmonary for many years. He took it from John Murray, and then he gave it to me. And he gave it to me in good hands, and it was in good shape. <laughs> He's been associate dean at SFGH, and he founded the Curry TB Center, which uh, over many years has continued to uh, be a center for education, technical assistance, and training in TB here and abroad. So his academic research focuses on TB and HIV-associated lung disease. He's received many awards. And I haven't mentioned, but I hope each of you has the white booklet that has the program, and it also has biosketches of each person, so you can, each speaker, so you can read all about uh, Phil's many awards. But he is uh, actually particularly proud of the award that was given to him in John Murray's name, which Talmadge described, the John F. Murray Award. And Interestingly, it's given for this combination of academic excellence and dedication to the humanitarian mission at SFGH, which was important for John Murray and also for Phil. Take it away, Phil. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. So um, you may have noticed if you read through the program already that it's pretty eclectic and it's hard to find a particular theme that unites all these various topics ranging from ARDS to global lung health to uh, journals and um, knowledge transfer through, through journals and, and through textbooks. But the uniting theme is areas in which John Murray made significant contributions. So let me start here with a photo of San Francisco General as it would have been when John uh, came in 1965. Uh, the hospital was built in 1915, was opened in 1915. Um, those of you who are familiar with the structure of San Francisco General will note that the four uh, long uh, wings that face on Potrero Avenue are still standing and uh, uh, still being used. Um, but the building here circled uh, is the chest building. And that was the building that uh, John basically moved into when he came to San Francisco in 1965. Now this wasn't, it was called a chest building. It was basically a, a TB building. Um, Ward 53, which is the third floor uh, by where the circle is, was the ICU, and in the ICU was a solarium. This being, having been largely a TB hospital, fresh air and sunshine were important. And um, on Saturday mornings, John would hold forth in the solarium, uh, 
using uh, an example of a patient in the ICU uh, as a takeoff for a discussion of clinical respiratory physiology. And uh, as was noted in the tribute that's in the booklet that you all have, um, one would think that house staff would resist anything that took their time on a Saturday morning. But in fact, uh, they enjoyed these uh, seminars. Uh, basically, they were seminars uh, very, uh, very much and uh, valued the time and, in, in retrospect, really appreciate the, the knowledge that was conveyed. Now, the chest building in 1965, when John showed up, uh, had about 200 TB beds. You can see that this was built for TB by all the balconies that are around, and again, the, the idea of fresh air and sunshine, although effective chemotherapy was available at that time. Um, most of the physicians uh, that were there were TB docs. Um, there was, if I remember correctly, and I wasn't there at the time, uh, there was one physician who was um, a reasonably broad-based chest physician, and the rest uh, managed uh, tuber tuberculosis. Um, no, these these uh, physicians in place at the time were not UCSF uh, faculty, uh, and in fact, this was right at the time when San Francisco General began to be incorporated or integrated into the programs of UCSF. So. Uh, these physicians were, were not UCSF faculty. There was no ICU in the hospital at the time. There was one spirometer, and that was based in cardiology. And uh, Elliot Rappaport, who was then and for a long time chief of cardiology, guarded it very carefully. Um, no training program, and Although um, rigid bronchoscopy was done, the fiber optic bronchoscope hadn't been invented yet, so of course it was not in use. But this is kind of the raw material that John started out with when he came to San Francisco. I don't know whether he knew what he was getting into or not, um, but this was not uh, a, a, a resource-rich, uh, either in terms of uh, academic facilities or, or actual money, uh, not a resource-rich uh, environment in which he had uh, chosen to work. But he went from that um, uh, sort of meager beginning to build, as has been described already, a world-class uh, training program in pulmonary and critical care medicine. He obviously didn't do this himself. There were many colleagues who were involved at the time, Jane Adell, um, and others, Warren Gold, who uh, were at, at Parnassus. Um, but um, this, was, this was a heavy lift uh, to, to get this off the ground and to make the progress that he did over the course of uh, his tenure uh, at San Francisco General. Um, I thought this quote from Mark Fisher, who I'm sure some of you know, he was both a resident uh, and, and then a fellow, in the late 70s. And he uh, wrote me uh, an email uh, giving his regrets for not being able to be here. Uh, but he went on to say that he'd been in practice for 43 years in Port Angeles, Washington. And uh, you can read for yourself, but it, uh, he says, it seems like only weeks ago that I joined uh, you, Dr. Murray, and others at San Francisco General. He mentions the weekend sunroom clinical physiology rounds. And then he says, I've been forever grateful for my UCSF training um, and appropriate vigor woven into, rigor woven into a, a professionalism of, of exemplary collaboration and collegiality. My time with Dr. Murray over 40 years ago became embedded into my DNA as a physician and person. So I think that sort of nicely encapsulates the way a lot of us feel about our uh, time spent with, with John Murray. So the, again, the program uh, is very eclectic, but the uniting theme, which, uh, which does exist, is these were all areas in which John made significant contributions. So before launching into the program, um, I'd like to 
call out one, one person in the audience who doesn't know he's being called out and probably would be mad, mad at me for doing it. Um, let me just skip that. Uh, Steve Lazarus, who has been a stalwart of the service at Parnassus, uh, is in the process of really reti retiring. He, <laughs> he tells me that he actually retired four years ago, but nobody recognized it. And it seems to be a common malady among, uh, among us in pulmonary anyway, that we've learned a lot of things, but we haven't learned how to retire very well. Um, both Courtney and I have continued to work post-retirement, and Steve says he actually retired four years ago. But Steve contributed a lot to the service at, at Parnassus as, and to the training program as a whole, uh, as you can see listed there. So, Steve, if you would like to stand up and... <laughs> So we now have a, a break, a 15 minute break, and then we'll come back and um, get into the meat of the program. So while you're all getting your seat, I can introduce our next speaker, Michael Mathe, who is going to present some hot off the press or soon to be in the press uh, information. And again, many of, of you know and uh, have, it, have spent time with my, I was gonna say, and love Michael, which I think was what I meant to say. So um, if so, you know that Michael is the true triple threat. He is the savvy clinician, the amazing teacher and mentor, top-notch researcher. His many awards are outlined in the program guide, and I hope you do find time to look at that. Uh, and you will see that he's been recognized on the one hand for very prestigious research awards, and at the same time for very prestigious mentoring awards. So he is recognized for these important aspects of an academic career. And he's been my mentor over many years, and many in the room, I'm sure. One notable thing about it is about him is his ability to take research from the bench to the bedside, carrying out clinical trials with the potential to treat or prevent lung injury, and most recently with stem cells and in the COVID era. So Michael. Thank you, Courtney, very much. And it's such a pleasure for all of us to be together Courtney and Phil did such a tremendous job organizing this. It's so wonderful the family can be here, Denny and everyone else. And um, I think uh, it means a lot just in the informal time together, let alone the formal time. So my topic is focused on a new global definition of the acute respiratory distress syndrome beyond Berlin because that's the definition we're currently working with. And this is especially apropos to John, because I remember, as I will show you, when um, we put together in 1988 this quantitative definition of ARDS, John said, well, you know, Michael, definitions are supposed to be, not supposed to be immutable. They should change. They should evolve. And uh, that's what we have to do now. So I feel like it's in the spirit of what John would want that we have moving ahead with um, uh, and uh, advancing the definition. So these are my disclosures, no uh, conflicts for this presentation. So my uh, objectives are first, my appreciation to the CVRI and UCSF and to John Murray for his mentorship to me as a fellow and a young faculty investigator. I wanna consider some of his contributions to ARDS. I'll give a brief perspective to prior definitions of ARDS and understand the limitations of the current Berlin definition of ARDS, and then show you the rationale for an expanded definition and why we think a global definition of ARDS is particularly needed. Now, I just put this one slide in as I was preparing the talk to think about what I thought would be the first golden age of lung research at UCSF and the CVRI in the 1980s. Um, 
Julius Comro had come from Penn and established the CVRI that transformed UCSF as it attracted investigators from medicine, anesthesia, surgery, and pediatrics. And then Holly Smith transformed the Department of Medicine to attract top investigators. As we all know, John Clements discovered surfactant, the most basic discovery in lung research to this day that translated to saving thousands of premature babies with respiratory failure in the Lasker Prize in 94, and John just had his 100th birthday last week. John Severinhouse developed the CO2 electrode, making arterial blood gases a reality. Mike Harrison pioneered fetal surgery. Mike Bishop and Harold Varmus, outside the CVRI, received the Nobel Prize for discovering oncogenes in 1989. And John Murray, as already described so well by many of you, led a strong clinical program focused on respiratory failure in ARDS. So my specific appreciation to John is detailed on this slide. My medicine residency training was at Colorado with considerable exposure to Tom Petty, who did inspire me and help generate my initial interest in ARDS. My first clinical rotation at UCSF was in 5R with John as my attending. It was a great month, and I had in the second half of the month, I luckily had Phil as my attending. I knew I was going to do my research with Norman Staub, and Norman and John had just received one of the first NHLBI pulmonary vascular score grants focused on ARDS. I maintained a very close connection with John as my interest developed in both lab-based research with Norman and clinical-based ARDS research with John. My clinical research focused with John on biologic markers in the plasma and ARDS patients, and John was really helpful in encouraging this direction. And in this, this uh, article is uh, an example of what, um, what this uh, collaboration with John led to. Um, there wasn't much research in ARDS except in animal models, but we did a study at San Francisco General Prospective, 45 patients with non-pulmonary sepsis, quantified by the lung injury score I will tell you about, all had a clear chest radiograph and then they developed ARDS. And it turned out elevated von Willebrand factor antigen, a plasma marker of endothelial injury, predicted both ARDS and mortality. And I think this established the value of studying the biology of ARDS in patients, not just animals. Carolyn will go into this in much more detail, but at the time it helped convince the lung division to include biology in our clinical trials of ARDS in uh, 1995. So I'm indebted to John for that. So uh, here's the eternal picture we all love of John and his apartment in Paris. It's just hard not to look at that and smile and remember how happy he and Denny and the family were there. And this slide also shows this expanded definition of ARDS, a four-point lung injury score that we came up with because we needed a quantifiable measure of lung injury, which we didn't have. And as everyone knows, I think, John argued for the heterogeneity of ARDS. And again, Carolyn will go into this in more detail, but John was a splitter, and uh, it's important and has long-range um, benefits. And of course, we know he succumbed to ARDS from COVID in Paris and three years ago this month. So the story of ARDS begins, as most of you know, with Tom Petty's publication, The Lancet, in 67, of the description of ARDS a manuscript that was turned down by the New England Journal, the Green Journal, and JAMA, and uh, finally got published in Lancet to, uh, to their eternal happiness. It was uh, amazingly well done, described the syndrome, and provided evidence that PEEP had value. Excuse me, let me go back one. Now, I want to put this in context because the focus really is these ARDS definitions. So, so the original description by Tom Petty was crucial. Um, and then the four-point lung injury score that we published in 1988 um, ended up helping the field a lot for clinical research and clinical trials because it quantified the degree of lung injury by hypoxemia, level of PEEP, compliance, and the chest X-ray. But the big breakthrough occurred in 1994 when several investigators from both uh, Europe and uh, North America got together and created the, um, uh, what we called the Acute Lung Injury and ARDS North American Consensus Conference. And this basically said that ARDS was patients who had a PF less than 300, although those between 200 and 300 should be called lung injury. 
And then, as I will show you, it advanced to the definition of ARDS we're working with now, the Berlin definition, um, which uh, is what we want to uh, revise and expand. Now, the North American European consensus definition was very uh, helpful. It did focus the field, both clinically and in research, and in fact, I'm showing you with a yellow arrow, arrow the endotracheal tube, to indicate that that definition, uh, uh, for the most part, was used in intubated patients. And this definition uh, subserved the publication of our randomized clinical trial that showed low tidal volume saved patients' lives, drop mortality from 40 to 31 percent. Then the fluid conservative trial showed that fluid conservative improved outcomes. And then the French went ahead and did a terrific trial with proning, which made um, uh, a major difference in mortality. And just imagine if we hadn't had these studies before COVID hit, how much worse the outcomes would have been if we didn't have these, uh, these uh, uh, trials. However, as you will see, there are limitations because of um, the narrowness of the definition. So the Berlin definition, I won't go through all of this, but it, it uh, focused in on the timing being roughly within one week, the chest x-ray should have bilateral opacities, not to be confused with atelectasis or pleural effusions. The origin of the edema should be primary lung injury, such as pneumonia, uh, but patients may have coexistent volume overload or mild heart failure, but it could be ruled out by an echocardiogram as the major cause. And then the categories were mild, moderate, and severe hypoxemia, which have turned out to be quite, turned out to be quite predictive of outcome. So patients with mild, moderate, or severe hypoxemia did have a progressively worse outcomes. And of course, there are many factors that contribute to mortality in ARDS, but this validated this basic um, approach. However, should ARDS really be defined by the presence of an endotracheal tube with positive pressure ventilation? Well, an excellent editorial by Derek Angus and JAMA in 2012 with the publication of the Berlin definition pointed out this potential limitation, like how many patients are we missing with ARDS because we're relying on an endotracheal tube. And in a, um, a review that Carolyn and I and others did just before the pandemic in 2019, um, we, uh, we reviewed the mechanisms of injury and repair, but almost all of these studies, it should be noted, were done in animal models in which the animals were not intubated, um, which then might give us a hint that maybe we're out of step if we're doing our trials only in patients who are intubated. So I'm going to give you a very brief case presentation to illustrate the challenge. Here's a 54-year-old woman with worsening respiratory failure. She's had COVID-19 positive up to 10 days prior to presentation to the emergency department, now with six days of progressive shortness of breath and dry cough. Initial oxygen saturation in the emergency department was 72%. Chest x-ray, as I will show you, has diffuse bilateral infiltrates. She's admitted to the hospital initially on six liters nasal cannula, started on dexamethasone and remdesivir, but overnight gets much worse, transferred to the MICU, and currently is on 50 liters high flow with an FIO to a 0.8. She did not have an arterial line, and her oxygen saturation was 94% with an SF ratio of 118. Here's her chest X-ray. I think everyone would agree this shows bilateral infiltrates consistent with a bad viral pneumonia. But does this patient meet have ARDS by Berlin? Well, she does not meet the oxygenation criteria. There's no blood gas. She does not meet the requirement for positive pressure ventilation. Yet everything about her clinical presentation fits with what we know about ARDS, inflammatory lung injury, increased pulmonary vascular permeability, um, uh, increased lung weight, loss of aerated lung tissue, and uh, all the clinical characteristics physiologically. So what has changed since the Berlin definition was published in 2012? Well, first, as I think most of us know, a marked increased use of high-flow nasal oxygen for acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, really um, brought to the forefront by the pivotal French trial in the New England Journal, the Florale trial in 2015, and then 
uh, marked expansion of high flow during the COVID-19 pandemic. Now here is a diagram to just remind us what is high flow nasal oxygen. So the breakthrough here that made this all possible is you could deliver a high concentration of heated and humidified oxygen through a nasal cannula. Before we were limited to just giving low lower flows of oxygen without humidification. Flow rates could go up to 10, from 10 to 60 liters per minute. And in fact, it does generate low levels of peat, two to five centimeters of water. And furthermore, um, it does increase carbon dioxide excretion, so it decreases the dead space. And it does reduce the work of breathing, uh, proven in the original publication. And um, in fact, it's this publication, I think, one of the four most important trials ever done in critical care medicine. Uh, that high flow nasal oxygen through nasal cannula and acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. This was a study of patients who presented to the emergency departments in France, and they were randomized, 310 of them, to receive either high flow face mask or non invasive ventilation. And uh, they excluded COPD acute exacerbation by getting a blood glass, the gas to make sure the PCO2 was less than 45 eliminated uh, heart failure or chronic respiratory failure, and pneumonia was the common cause. And it turned out high flow reduced the intubation rate in patients with a PF less than 200 and actually improved overall survival. So the use of high flow increased substantially during the COVID-19 pandemic. It was used both in and outside of the ICU for treatment of severe hypoxemia, and then uh, increased availability and familiarity has led to a further increase in high flow following the pandemic. And in fairness, of course, high flow was not available and not being used when the Berlin definition was considered in 2012. Uh, what else has changed since the Berlin definition in 2012? Well, there's now been growing and wide recognition that the SF, or saturation of arterial oxygen, FiO2 ratio, is a reliable uh, surrogate for actually measuring a blood gas and uh, calculating the PF ratio. This was proven in an excellent study by Todd Rice at Vanderbilt in 2007. And um, as I will show you, it was used successfully in a, a large ARDS trial uh, we, we finished a few years ago. Now, in using the SF ratio to estimate the PF, it's important that the patient has to have a uh, oxygen saturation no greater than 97%. If it's above that, then as you can see here, you're on the flat portion of the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve, dissociation curve and you can't really get a good reading. So it has to be 97% or less, but the correlation with uh, hypoxemia is excellent as shown in this study. Um, now, what else has changed since the Berlin definition? Well, um, there's been a marked increased use of bedside ultrasound, now particularly in resource-limited areas, but some in other uh, modern ICU settings. And, um, and of course, it's much more available, as I will go into, in uh, resource-limited areas. And because of this, uh, Beth Riviello, a terrific investigator at the BI in Boston, she developed what's called the Kigali modification of the Berlin definition, in which, um, so I think it comes up here on the next slide, she argued that um, what are we gonna do in settings where there are no blood gases or the chest x-ray is not available? And so she said there's no reason we couldn't use the SF ratio and we could use uh, ultrasound to detect infiltrates in the lung and of course, in addition, the emphasis was that in most of these settings, there's no PEEP and often minimum oxygen support require um, available. And uh, in, in a parallel study, she showed that the hospital incidence of ARDS in Rwanda and other hospitals um, uh, was 4% with a 50% mortality. So her argument was that we should consider modifying the Berlin definition and that a formal adoption of Kigali would allow for a better estimate of the true global burden of ARDS. But it had not been formally adopted yet. Um, so in the three major, major changes since Berlin is increasing use of high flow, recognition that the SF ratio is a reliable surrogate for the PF ratio, 
and recognition of limitations of the Berlin definition for resource limited areas. Uh, so therefore we think it's time to reevaluate the Berlin definition. So Taylor Thompson, Lorraine and I uh, published this article um, a little less than two years ago in Lancet Restory Medicine trying to stimulate our field to consider an expanded use of the Berlin definition for all the reasons I just summarized. And we thought there would be a major advantage here because we could identify patients also earlier in the course of their lung injury, of ARDS, and this would facilitate testing treatments at an earlier time point. It is possible that many of the treatments that have not been successful, the pharmacologic agents, might be successful if they were applied in an earlier time period. Have we missed the boat by only testing them largely in ventilated patients? So um, with help from uh, Lorraine and Taylor, we organized a global consensus conference and put together, I think, a di very diverse group of uh, experts, including representatives from six continents, academicians and clinicians, physician and respiratory therapist, patient representative, and global representation from North and South America, Europe, Asia, Africa, and Australia. There was no formal affiliation with any professional society. We thought that would be a mistake. If we waited to go through the professional society process, we'd still be here two, three, four years later. We wanted to make this very ecumenical. This was a little tricky, I have to tell you, because in the Berlin definition, it was largely taken over by one society, and it was fine, but we wanted to avoid that process. I talked to the leadership of ATS and other societies, and they were generally in agreement that would, be, that would slow this process too much. Uh, so we formed this group, and you see the members of the group, many uh, from UCSF, including, of course, Carolyn, Kathleen, and others, and um, we had six video conference meetings. Of course, ironically, the COVID pandemic facilitated us working together and having these video conferences, and then uh, several additional meetings of subgroups. And the goals of the conference are summarized here. We unanimously agreed that revisions to the Berlin definition of ARDS should be considered. The committee further agreed that an updated definition of ARDS should meet several criteria. Identify ARDS according to the agreed upon conceptual framework and the evidence to date. Facilitate rapid recognition and diagnosis of ARDS for clinical care. Um, be applicable in resource limited settings. Be adaptable and modifiable for testing of specific therapies and be adaptable for easy communication to patients and caregivers. And one sidelight here is one of the members of this committee is Margaret Harridge, the remarkable professor at the University of Toronto who's pioneered the whole field of post-ARDS and post-ICU problems. And um, Margaret just published a tremendous review in the New England Journal on uh, outcomes after critical care. And so one of the points she made was that if we have this modified definition, we'll actually be able to talk to a lot of the patients, even if they're on high flow or not intubated, and we'll be able to get more of a history of their, of their um, neurologic muscle and uh, um, overall functional status, which we rarely can do when we're talking to patients trying to assess them in patients who are already intubated and ventilated. So the major goals of the conference, uh, I'll just go through briefly here. The first question was, should intubation or non-invasive ventilation required for be required for ARDS diagnosis? And um, there's quite a bit of evidence to say that it should not be. I'm showing you here a publication from our group here at UCSF in collaboration with Lorraine Ware at Vanderbilt. Um, in which um, intubated and non-intubated adults with ARDS were defined by their level of hypoxemia and the bilateral infiltrates. And of the 457 patients with ARDS, 106 or 23% were not intubated at the time of meeting ARDS criteria. At that time, the non-intubated patients had lower morbidity and severity of illness, but at the end of the day, mortality at 60 days was the same in the two groups. Another point is this uh, less well-recognized study in critical care medicine measured the biologic markers that we frequently use to try to understand pathogenesis in patients, uh, RAGE, surfactant protein D, ANG2, IL-6, IL-8, 
And in this study, the investigators showed the levels of these biologic markers were the same in patients who were not intubated versus those who were intubated, arguing that the biology was already uh, well in process. So the advantages and disadvantages for adding high flow, uh, greater than 30 liter, equal to or greater than 30 liters per minute are listed here. The advantage would be it focuses on patients who require high levels of oxygen support and low levels of PEEP, regardless of the presence of an endotracheal tube. It would account for the evolution of clinical practice as we know it exists today, it would facilitate enrolling patients in clinical trials, as I said, in an earlier stage, and the endpoints could include now how many patients actually proceed to intubation. And as I said, it'll facilitate st studies of early ARDS and the natural history of lung injury. The disadvantages can be that it might be challenging to estimate the FiO2. However, this was done successfully in the FRAT trial and in others. Is the cutoff equal to or greater than 30 liters per minute optimal? Should it be 20 liters? We settled on 30 because that's a level of, that usually generates PEEP of about two to five. And what can we do with an expanded definition of uh, ARDS that's including high flow in resource limited areas? So that's a separate issue we dealt with. The next issue was the uh, SF ratio. Is it an adequate substitute for the PF ratio for assessing hypoxemia? And briefly, I think the answer to this is yes. This was a terrific study published in CHEST <clears throat> in which 34% uh, of MICU patients in this study were diagnosed by the SF ratio. Uh, and compared to those with a blood gas and a PF ratio, baseline illness, morbidity, severity of illness were similar. Ventilator-free days, length of hospital stay, and mortality in the groups were the same. And actually, SF ratio correlated with mortality better than the PF. And then as I alluded to earlier, we used the SF ratio to enroll patients in our 1,000 patient trial of neuromuscular blockade and about 13% of the patients uh, with no problems. And the advantages here of the SF ratio are listed. It's continuously available. It's not an intermittent measurement like the PF. Highly sensitive for hypoxemia, easily interpretable, non-invasive, no risk for procedural complications, and of course, more readily available in resource-limited areas. Now, there are disadvantages. Uh, we don't get any information about the arterial PCO2 or the pH. Um, there can be and will be measurement errors that are increased by poor perfusion, patients in shock, vasopressor, severe hypoxemia or acidemia. And importantly, there is evidence for reduced accuracy in patients with darker skin pigmentation. This latter point is a focus of major studies around the world, and the companies that manufacture ox oximeters are under tremendous pressure to improve them. This is a big issue with the FDA, and I think we will see this evolve in the next two to three years. But this does show that the inaccuracy rate can be higher in African Americans than in Caucasians. The final issue is, can ultrasound be used to diagnose bilateral alveolar infiltrates? Well, most of us don't have a lot of experience with this. Um, uh, however, um, there, is, uh, there is data in the literature, much of it from resource-limited areas, that shows ultrasound can be very effective. Um, and it, uh, it is somewhat operator-dependent, uh, but it has good diagnostic accuracy for alveolar filling and consolidation in patients with ARDS, and this is one study that shows that. And Lorraine, just this uh, week, has an excellent editorial in the Blue Journal uh, discussing this issue and arguing that ultrasound is probably accurate, but we have to make sure the operators are well trained. So this is a, um, a figure uh, that uh, is intended to show what we've really proposing for a change. The top the top panel shows a patient with um, ARDS from uh, sepsis and shock who has, with a yellow arrow, showing it an endotracheal tube in place. So this would fit very much into the classic current Berlin definition. The second panel shows a woman who's being treated with high flow only, but you can see from the x-ray has bilateral infiltrates, is on high flow, and very much meets IRDS criteria with uh, an SF ratio of 114. So this would be a new category, non-intubated ARDS. And the, the bottom panel shows a patient 
in a resource limited area where uh, there's no blood gas available or chest x-ray, the patient's receiving some face mask oxygen, and you can see with the ultrasound that there is evidence of bilateral consolidation. And this patient uh, would fit then with our recommended definition for patients in a resource limited setting. So in summary, the recommendations and advantages of the new global definition of ARDS are, are here. Expand the Berlin definition to include non-intubated ARDS with either non-invasive or high flow with a minimum flow rate of 30 liters per minute. Add the SF ratio as an alternative to the PF ratio for the oxygenation criteria. Allow the use of ultrasound with a well-trained operator to diagnose bilateral infiltrates. We did solicit input from members of different societies as opposed to a formal uh, process of uh, approval, and that was the ma a major contribution. They said, well, you should specify that those using ultrasound have to have been trained. Apply the Kahali definition for ARDS in resource-limited settings, and thus patients in these settings will no longer be excluded from the diagnosis of ARDS. In the future, incorporate biology into the definition of ARDS, recognizing likely overlap with pneumonia and sepsis, and recognizing the heterogeneity inherent in any definition, a point that John emphasized very much, and Carolyn will go into in considerable detail. And uh, we hope to determine, over the next few years, the relationship of biologic categories of ARDS, such as hyper and hypoinflammatory subphenotypes, and uh, see how these fit into an expanded uh, global de definition of ARDS. I think the plan is to wait and have comments and questions in the, uh, in the session we're going to have at the end of the day. Thank you very much. I am now pleased to introduce Carolyn Kelfie. Carolyn is, as you have heard, is leading a new era in the study of ARDS. So one championed early by John Murray, who described himself as a splitter, wanting to split ARDS into different subgroups as opposed to a lumper, the, the others who wanted to combine it all in one group. Um, so she will explain, but she's helped us see into a thicket to recognize that there are potential subgroups in there, su subgroups that may respond differently to treatment, and giving us finally something that we can do for ARDS. She's a generous colleague, a savvy researcher, and an inspiring mentor. Thanks for coming, Carolyn. Thank you so much, Courtney, for that kind introduction. And I feel honestly incredibly honored and humbled to be here. I really appreciate the invitation to participate from Courtney and Phil and from the Murray family. Um, it's a real honor to get to contribute to talking about Dr. Murray's legacy. So probably my most important disclosure here is that I am not a fortune teller. I felt very also intimidated by this idea of talking about, wow, the whole future of ARDS. Um, there are so many different places we could go, um, where to begin. So I thought I'd begin back at the beginning when Dr. Murray was first starting his career, as we heard from Dr. Hopewell and as we heard from Dr. Mathe around this original definition of ARDS, 12 patient case series published in The Lancet in 1967. Um, we heard about this syndrome characterized by severe dyspnea, tachypnea, cyanosis, loss of lung compliance, and diffuse alveolar opacities on the chest x-ray, coming from a variety of precipitants. And most of the original cases, as you can see on the right, came from trauma, pancreatitis, and pneumonia. Seven out of 12 of the patients, 58% died. And there was apparent value to what was then called expiratory retard, and we now call positive pressure ventilation with PEEP. And at the time, it was noted that the response to corticosteroids was variable and inconsistent, but occasionally observed. So where are we today? Well, I think our outcomes are fortunately much better, and that's due in large part to many of the advances in supportive care that Michael just outlined for us. You've already seen the survival curve from the Lung Safe study, which found studying almost 30,000 patients from 
ICUs in over 50 countries around the world, that ARDS represented about uh, a quarter of patients that were mechanically ventilated. And you can see this survival curve shows much better than 58% mortality. In fact, mortality is now 30 to 40% depending on your severity. So better, but still not something we would want for ourselves or for any of our patients. We have a better understanding of pathogenesis. You've seen this slide as well, um, understanding both injury to the alveolar epithelium, to the vascular endothelium as well, the importance of impaired fluid and ion clearance, endothelial and epithelial injury and inflammation, as well as the importance of appropriate lung repair. So with all of these, almost 55 years now, where are we, what are the challenges? Well, so mortality has improved, but it's still high, 30 to 40% at one month, and we have no successful pharmacotherapies after decades of clinical trials for typical ARDS. Corticosteroids, we've had dozens of studies, and it's still controversial. 55 years later, we still can't really come to agreement as a field on whether or not we should be treating our patients with steroids. We have the syndromic definition that Michael just very eloquently went through, um, which has been improved greatly, but is still a syndrome, right? This is not a disease. And so maybe that is limiting our ability to find new therapies. Uh, as Michael also alluded to, Margaret Herridge has opened our eyes, and as well as many colleagues, to the fact that many of the patients who survive ARDS suffer from psychological or physical sequelae that are slow to resolve. And the global burden of ARDS is likely high, though we, we don't even quantify it very well because of the issues that Michael highlighted, where our definition is premised on having access to a sort of resource-intensive environment, and access to basic therapies like oxygen is still lacking in many regions. So what does the future hold? Well, I think there are many new and exciting areas of discovery. Michael already covered the global definition, which I think is expanding inclusion in many different important dimensions, and hopefully will help us enhance the population impact of all of the work that's being done in ARDS to a truly global audience. I'm hoping that we will have new technologies to enhance both lung repair and regeneration as we move forward, and that we are doing better now in terms of focusing on outcomes that really matter to our patients, especially long-term functional outcomes. I am not going to cover all of these today. We've only got a little less than half an hour. Um, but instead, I'm going to focus on a topic that Michael brought up, um, and, and in large part really because of why we're here today, which is Dr. Murray, and this idea sort of ubiquitous to a lot of disciplines in medicine of whether we should be lumping or whether we should be splitting. Or should we do some of both? And now we can call that precision medicine. It sounds a little fancier. Maybe it looks better on a grant application. But really, it's this idea of whether deconvoluting some of the heterogeneity within syndromic diseases can help us to better match therapies to patients. Uh, and I go back to these editorials very often. Anybody know what year these were published? Close, 72, very close. Um, so this was 1975, very close. Um, Dr. Petty, Confessions of a Lumper, and Dr. Murray, the ARDS, May It Rest in Peace. Um, and I just want to highlight this quote that I think was really prescient from um, this publication. And he says, now is the time to encourage the dissection of ARDS. 1975, okay? I was two. Um, I was not working on dissection of ARDS at the time. Um, in my opinion, the best way to begin following this advice is to recognize the differences that exist among the entities and prepare a separate working classification on this basis. Our knowledge about these diseases is woefully incomplete at present, but undoubtedly will increase in the future. Accordingly, the classification will also change as new information becomes available, just what Michael was saying. A decade from now, <laughs> We might still be quibbling over how much further splitting is advisable. Turns out five decades. Um, but we should start by putting the ax to the ARDS log before we worry about how many pieces of kindling it will make. So what an eloquent writer he was. And how prescient to hit on this topic that we are still working on literally five decades later. All right, I'm not going to, to beat this horse because Michael already showed you the Berlin definition, but this is a syndrome, okay? This is not a specific entity, this is not tuberculosis, this is not a specific disease, it is a syndromic definition that by its very essence is heterogeneous. 
Here's two patients with ARDS that were enrolled in an observational cohort uh, at uh, one of our ICUs at UCSF. They both have bilateral opacities on their chest radiograph. I'll tell you neither of them have heart failure. They both have endotracheal tubes. Do they have the same disease? They both have ARDS, but one of them has vaping-associated lung injury from inhalation of heated and aerosolized vitamin E acetate, and one of them has COVID-19. So there's one example of really obvious heterogeneity. Should, it, should we be treating these patients the same way with these two different etiologies? So precision medicine is really, I'm gonna, I'm gonna argue, just more effective splitting, and we're really comfortable with this concept in other types of medical conditions. So this is taken from a Nature Review's cancer publication in which they have the, you know, the very simple concept that you have patients with signs and symptoms of the same cancer, you measure biomarkers, and then you identify subclasses and that those subclasses may respond to different treatments and have different prognosis. So could we apply a similar concept in ARDS? And again, this is really what Dr. Murray was talking about five decades ago. This is a, a workshop report um, published a couple of years ago now on this idea and how we could think about splitting our patients. And there are so many different dimensions to this heterogeneity in ARDS, right? There's etiology up here. Let's see, does the laser pointer work? Yeah, up here on the top left. There's physiology, respiratory mechanics, hypoxemia, morphology, and then there's biology. And we can think that all these different components of heterogeneity may be contributing to the ways that our patients do or don't respond differently to therapy. And just like there are many different ways to slice the onion, okay, there are lots of different ways that we can subdivide ARDS. And once again, people have been talking about this since the original definition in 1967. Some of these are clinically obvious, right? So COVID-19 versus typical ARDS. Etio other etiologic ways to split this. We can split based on tempo, persistent versus rapidly resolving, versus diffuse versus, uh, or focal appearance on the chest X-ray or chest CT high versus low compliance or elastance, depending on where you come from. And this is not an all-inclusive list. But I think what we're looking for here is not just ways to subdivide our patients, because we could all go around this room and probably come up with 100 different ways. Um, but I think we're really looking to find treatment-responsive subsets. And so I think that, that really should be our focus. And I just want to highlight um, another quotation from this really wonderful piece of Dr. Murray's. He said, I believe it is entirely possible, if not likely, that corticosteroids may be helpful in some disorders, but not in others. Examination of the group as a whole could easily obscure important therapeutic responses. Separating, not lumping, leads to more rational therapy. So it was this really, this idea that the reason we're doing this is to find better therapies for our patients. Um, all right, so how well are we doing in that standpoint? So what about all of these divisions that are clinically obvious to us. So some of these are, in fact, useful. I would say that severity and persistence has already been incorporated into some clinical trials. We know that proning, which Michael mentioned in the last talk, is really beneficial if your P to F ratio is particularly low, less than 150 millimeters of mercury. We know that extracorporeal membrane oxygenation is really beneficial only in our most severe patients. So certainly there's a component here to severity that is clinically useful. This could be a whole other talk, COVID-19 versus typical ARDS, but I think that's one example of where reducing the heterogeneity somewhat, not entirely, but somewhat in the type of ARDS that we're studying has allowed us to find more effective therapies. So IL-6 receptor blockade and JAK inhibition were found to be beneficial in COVID, and corticosteroids, I think the data is certainly much more conclusive in COVID than it is in typical ARDS. So maybe there's another place where splitting by, based on a clinical phenotype can help us. What about diffuse versus focal ARDS? So this is the idea that if you have diffuse opacities all over your chest radiograph versus more focal bilateral opacities, maybe that can help us subdivide our patients. So a French trial, the live trial, randomized 420 patients to a personalized ventilation strategy based on whether they had diffuse versus focal ARDS to standard care and unfortunately found no difference in the overall outcomes. And that's the survival curve you see here on the left, really two lines overlapping each other. But it turns out that 20% of the patients were misclassified. And when those patients were excluded from the personalized group, that strategy appeared to be superior. So I think this highlights a couple of important points. One is the potential for more personalized care 
if we're better matching our ventilation strategy to the physiology of the patients, but also the real challenge of misclassification. Once you start splitting patients, it's important to do it accurately, and if you don't do it accurately, you may miss out on the benefit. Okay, now those are all clinically obvious phenotypes. Now I'm gonna talk ab about a little bit of a different approach, which is to say, are there perhaps phenotypes that are invisible to us at the bedside that are present in our patients that we can't actually identify? Um, and so this is the idea that you may have, um, you know, data, whoops, sorry, I meant to get the laser pointer, this, that you may have data that reflects that in fact there are several hidden subgroups within what appears to be a heterogeneous syndrome. So I'm going to tell you about a type of analysis that can actually ask this question in an unbiased approach, looking at data and see if there's statistical evidence that a multi-group model is a better fit for the data than a single group model. And that type of analysis is something called latent class analysis, which is a type of mixture modeling. And when we've applied this to now eight different cohorts of patients with ARDS from six randomized controlled trials and two observational cohorts, we see a very consistent pattern over time, which is that a two-class or a two-group model is actually a better fit for the data than a one-group model, saying that it looks like on the basis of the way the data arrange themselves, there are actually two distinct subsets of ARDS. These two groups we have termed hyper and hypoinflammatory. You heard those terms from Michael. Um, I regret using them a little bit because it's not entirely clear that inflammation is the key difference between these groups. Um, but we used that term because this hyperinflammatory group that makes up about a third of patients with ARDS is characterized by plasma biomarkers of inflammation. So interleukins 6 and 8, TNF receptor 1, a biomarker called PI1, that all indicate a very robust inflammatory response. That group is also characterized by lower bicarbonate levels, so the patients are acidotic, lower protein C, they're coagulopathic, and lower systolic blood pressure. I just want to point out this is another area in which I think Dr. Murray was incredibly prescient. So um, this really lovely study from patients with septic shock, which overlaps quite a bit with ARDS, as we'll talk about more in a couple of minutes. Um, and this was a study of plasma TNF levels, which is another inflammatory biomarker, very closely related to those that I just showed you. And I just want to highlight this image here. Um, this are, these are TNF levels, and I want you to pay attention to the fact that the y-axis here is a log scale, all right? So there's really a huge amount of endogenous biological variation within these patients that all qualify as having the same syndrome of septic shock, right? There are some patients that have very low levels of TNF and some that have levels that are many orders of magnitude higher. And it turns out that those higher levels of TNF were associated with higher incidence and severity of ARDS as well as worse outcomes. And that's really essentially I don't know if I can go back here, what we're seeing here, right? We're seeing that there are these patients who have these very high levels of these inflammatory biomarkers and that they're quite different from those who don't. All right, so the analyses I showed you didn't incorporate any tests of outcome, but then when we asked if the patients who have that hyperinflammatory phenotype have worse outcomes, we found across all eight of these studies they have much worse outcomes. Okay, and that ranged from the 1990s up to the 2010s, and even in the case of pediatric ARDS, where fortunately outcomes are much better, we still see that this hyperinflammatory group does much worse. Okay, now that's fine, but remember, Dr. Murray told us we should be looking for this because it's going to affect, we want to find um, subgroups that respond differently to therapy. And so I think that's why we've been particularly interested in these phenotypes because they do seem to respond differently to therapy. So in secondary analyses of several clinical trials, we see that the patients respond differently to high versus low PEEP, to conservative versus liberal fluid status, and to pharmacotherapy with simvastatin. So this is an image from the HARP2 trial on the left, published in the New England Journal, 540 patients, simvastatin versus placebo, no difference in survival. When you stratify by inflammatory phenotype, what you see is that if you were in that hyperinflammatory group, your survival seemed to be better with simvastatin, suggesting, just as Dr. Murray had said, that maybe by lumping people together, we're obscuring a group of patients that have a therapeutic benefit. All right. So back to the cancer analogy again, we're just a couple of decades, maybe three or four behind the oncologists, but a lot of the 
breakthroughs they've had in oncology have come because they've been able to identify these biomarkers that split patients, right? So can we do that in the setting of ARDS? Um, I think we're making some progress. This is work that's been done by Dr. Pratik Sinha at Washington University, where he determined that a three, sorry, three variable model using interleukin-8, protein C, and bicarbonate could split these patients with ARDS pretty effectively into the two phenotypes. Sorry, this is probably hard to see at the back, but the area is under the curve 0.94 or 0.95, so pretty effective in terms of discriminating these two groups of patients. It turns out that multiple different models actually performed quite well in this setting. I'm gonna show you some data from one that used IL-6 bicarbonate and TNF receptor one, uh, where we were able to study a small handful of patients with COVID-19 ARDS early in the pandemic and use a novel point of care assay to measure these biomarkers and actually classify the patients in real time. So that biomarkers were measured, the data was entered into an algorithm, the sites were kept blinded to what the phenotype was because we didn't want it to influence their care, but we were able to actually do this logistically. We found a pretty low prevalence of the hyperinflammatory phenotype in COVID-19, interestingly, um, but more importantly to us, it demonstrated that this type of approach where we're stratifying our patients in real time might actually be feasible. I'm gonna show you a little bit of data, just going back to Dr. Murray's um, point about corticosteroids that suggests that this approach might actually be helpful in identifying patients that respond well to corticosteroids. So we also developed a clinical variable only classifier model, which I'm not going into in the interest of time. But when we applied this to uh, this model and classified patients, about 500 patients enrolled at Columbia University over a two month span in spring of 2020, before corticosteroids were standard of care for COVID, okay? So this was before the recovery trial came out and only about two thirds of patients were being treated with corticosteroids. What we found is that that hyperinflammatory group seemed to have better outcomes when treated with corticosteroids, and actually the opposite pattern was observed in the hypoinflammatory group. So now this is big caveat, steroids were not randomly assigned, certainly could be confounding by indication here, but really going back to Dr. Murray's point, corticosteroids may work in some patients and not in others. So what's the reality of this actually happening sometime in the foreseeable future? I, I think it's pretty close to happening. So Dr. Danny McCauley from Queens University Belfast is leading two major studies where he's conducting real-time phenotyping of patients. One is the FIND study, where he's already enrolled almost 400 patients with ARDS and acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, phenotyping them using biological assays in real time. And the next is the PANTHER study, which I'll tell you about a randomized control trial that's in the planning stages of actually stratifying patients in a prospective clinical trial um, uh, moving forward. Also, uh, a little bit closer to home, Laura Esserman, who many may, of you may know for her leadership in the breast cancer space and precision medicine, has been collaborating with many of us, including Kathleen Liu and Clark Files from Wake Forest, to lead a real-time phenotyping effort in the iSpy COVID network. So really trying to integrate the principles from precision oncology into the critical care space. This is what a precision medicine trial in ARDS may look like. This is an overview of the plan for the PANTHER trial led by Dr. McCauley, which will be a collaboration um, between the G7 countries. Um, the goal here is to take patients with ARDS using these real-time biomarker assays to stratify them into hypo and hyperinflammatory, and then randomize them to a number of different potential interventions with interim analyses to identify which treatments may be working best for which subgroups, and then the ability to iteratively, in an adaptive fashion, drop potential therapies and add others. All right, so just to go back to this idea of Dr. Murray's ARDS, may it rest in peace, is it possible that we're actually not going to use this syndromic definition at all moving forward? I, I don't think that's actually the case. I think it's still going to have quite an important place. Um, but I think there is also a movement uh, afoot at the same time to think about really redefining critical illness. And this was a, a piece published in Nature Medicine last year led by John Marshall and David Masloff around what the future of critical care medicine might look like. And this group, um, which in full disclosure I was a part of, um, divided critical care medicine really into three eras. The first being the foundational era here, 
where we had our first description of ARDS. The second being what was termed the acceleration era, where you had the first definition of ARDS, as Michael mentioned, and the Berlin definition, and analogous advances in sepsis. And then this group posited that we're on sort of the precipice of a new era, which they call the precision era, in which patients are really classified based on their underlying biology, not just on the basis of a syndromic definition. So what's the evidence that this might work? Well, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm just gonna show you a little bit of evidence. And um, this comes from a group out of the Netherlands, the Mars Consortium, led by Lua Boss, who said, okay, well, what about if we take these biomarkers that stratify patients with ARDS and we look in patients who don't have ARDS, but they're just mechanically ventilated? Are those useful in any way? And what they found was that if you um, were classified as being in the hyperinflammatory phenotype or another type of classification, reactive versus uninflamed, even in these patients that didn't have ARDS, this was associated with much worse outcomes. So this is the hazard ratio of a poor outcome, even after adjusting for severity of illness, age, and sex. So suggesting that there may actually be syndromes that cross, or I should say treatable traits that cross across syndromes within our ICU. We have some data that's under review right now that suggests that these quote-unquote ARDS phenotypes are actually present in patients with sepsis. So this is data from four different cohorts, summing to, uh, I don't know, almost 3,000 patients in which we identify these consistent phenotypes that look very similar to how they look in ARDS in patients who have sepsis. And it turns out that if any of you rec remember activated protein C, which we th thought was going to be a major blockbuster, right, for sepsis, many of us treated patients with activated protein C in the early 2000s until subsequent trials, including the prowess shock trial, found that it didn't work. Well, it turns out if you stratified patients in that trial into these inflammatory phenotypes, you found a differential treatment response. So the hypoinflammatory phenotype, patients did worse with activated protein C, and the opposite pattern was observed in the hyperinflammatory phenotype. So perhaps the risks of these therapies are dominating in patients who may not benefit, and the benefits are being restricted to a smaller group. So this really brings us to the conclusion here, which is lumping and splitting, maybe we need to do more of both, right? So maybe we need to split our patients more into biologic phenotypes, but also recognize that there may be treatable traits that cross our syndromic definitions. Um, this is a figure from an editorial that I really like because it's very straightforward, and it, and it posits that perhaps the old paradigm of where we defined our patients, particularly for pharmacotherapies, maybe not for supportive therapy trials, but for pharmacotherapies based on these syndromes may need to evolve into one where we identify treatable traits that are objective and measurable and that respond to therapy that cut across syndromes. In a more complex iteration of the same idea, you can see that these traits may be modified by any number of important comorbidities, age, environmental exposures, genetic background, um, but really moving from this idea where we have these clinical syndromes into an idea where we categorize patients on the basis more of biological mechanisms for specific therapies. And this is the sort of a, in closing from that nature medicine piece, um, what I think we're going to be striving for in the future in critical care medicine, which is phenotypes that are derived from a combination of clinical, biological, physiological, imaging, and multiomic parameters, and which respond differently to treatment. So we have a long way to go in this, but I think we're still really feeling Dr. Murray's enduring legacy uh, on our field, particularly from my perspective and his advocacy for splitting within the syndrome. Um, I think he was very prescient in identifying this biological heterogeneity within ARDS, and that may influence response to treatment, and it may actually be present across critical illness syndromes. Remember that slide I told you on, showed you on TNF was from septic shock, actually, not from ARDS. And I think in the future we will be focusing on this idea of multidimensional phenotyping and treatable traits. So I think the future of ARDS has many dimensions I haven't covered today, but I think it will likely involve precision clinical trials, and I think these are likely to come to an ICU near you soon. Thanks so much. So I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Juliana Ferreira from the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, where she is, I think you're a full professor now, right? Or have you She's associate professor and um, is uh, 
in the uh, Division of Pulmonology and Critical Care Medicine. We're moving the discussion of ARDS not only from different subtypes, but to different locales, and hear how the, this particular problem, a new problem, was uh, addressed in a different setting. Juliana. Thank you, Phil, and thank you, Courtney, for the invitation. I'm really honored to be here and, and really inspired by just being here today and realizing the impact that Dr. Murray had on, on many of you in and, and, and pulmonary and critical care medicine. I'm going to talk about managing COVID-19 ARDS-associated um, in, in a low-resource setting and talking about how we manage it in Brazil. So critical care has a, a, a larger or greater burden in low and middle income countries. So it's associated with scarcity of resources, access to critical care, and of course that varies a lot depending on, on what low and middle income country we're talking about. If, if we look at the definition from the World Bank, you could have low or middle income, and in middle income countries you have upper, lower, and lower uh, middle-income countries, but there are many challenges, and among the challenges are uh, gaps in epidemiology and lack of uh, um, guidelines applied to our uh, regional contacts. So many, many uh, barriers to applying uh, caring for critical care patients, and that will, of course, be different in different countries. Um, Brazil is ranks number 12 in, in terms of economy, in the, uh, but in, we're not proud to say that we're number nine in terms of disparities. Uh, it's a very unequal country. We, we do have a universal system of healthcare, which uh, survived uh, the pandemic and, and terrible uh, administration we had during the pandemic, but it's a historically underfunded um, system uh, and it's also very unequal across Brazil. So we have, for example, a few numbers here. We have 2.3 uh, beds, ICU beds for 10,000 uh, population in Brazil. And, and the name of the system is the SUS, or we say SUS. We have 1.3 beds uh, in that system. So that's the private system. It's available for anyone. But if you're in the southeast region, where I live in Sao Paulo, it's 2.6. And if you're in the north region, where is the Amazon, it's 1.3. And the private sector has, of course, many more um, ICU beds per population. So when, we, when the pandemic hit us, we, we already had what we call a static strain. There's always a strain in Brazil. There's always lack of access to critical care and, and, and healthcare in general. But the, having a pandemic adds a dynamic strain on top of that uh, real strain we already have. And that's particularly hard for um, vulnerable populations. So of course it will access, will, will impact people with living in areas with less access to healthcare, less ICU beds per, per population. It, of, of course, as in many countries and in the U.S., will affect um, minorities harder than, uh, than other uh, population. And, the, and there are many reasons for, for these disparities. Uh, there is, of course, a differential um, spread of the virus, uh, depending on where you live in Brazil or your economic status. Of course, m many people couldn't stop working when the pandemic hit, so we didn't. We had lockdowns, but lockdowns were very. Uh, there's a was there was a lot of disparity in the lockdowns because not everyone uh, was able to stay at home. So if you're a lawyer or if you uh, work in a bank, you can work from home. But if you're selling food on the street or if you're uh, working, driving a bus, you, know, you, you still have to come to work. And that, of course, affected uh, vulnerable populations much more than uh, privileged populations. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of what we did at the University of Sao Paulo. Uh, our hospital is uh, affiliated with the university, so it's a public hospital. It's a referral hospital. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you what we did to manage COVID in there, and then contrast with what happened across Brazil outside of the university-affiliated um, world. We, we started planning and, and uh, preparing for COVID in January because um, 
because the, the pandemic hit China and then Europe and then US, before it came to Brazil, we had the advantage of uh, being able to see what, what was happening uh, in other countries and try to prepare. So we, we all saw those maps for, for many, 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 many days. I would uh, access this website every day for a long, long time. I heard it, I think, it's, I, I think they, they finished it just recently. Uh, and so in January, this is what we had. So, oh, so, excuse me. Um, a big uh, epicenter in China and a few other cases elsewhere. And so we were preparing for, for we didn't know, of course, and, and, and I know all of you know what I'm talking about. Although we felt we were preparing, we were not even close to be prepared to what happened. And we, so this is our uh, campus. The, we have several institutes, so several buildings in the campus. This is the main building. And we, our plan was, well, we're going to have isolation areas in each of these buildings, right? As a, and, and the triage was, the questions we asked when we were suspecting of COVID in the beginning were, have you been to China in the last two weeks? Remember when we thought this would be the criteria? So we thought, okay, we're going to have a few isolation areas in each of these buildings, and um, we'll continue to do what we have been doing all this time and caring for other diseases. Our hospital is like the major reference uh, tertiary center in Sao Paulo. And, but of, of course, it changed over time, and this is end of March, and we, we already had like terrible um, situation in, in, in Europe. That's when Dr. Murray uh, uh, got COVID. And uh, the East and the West Coast of the US, and then you see Brazil was already having, uh, uh, starting to um, uh, uh, go up in the list of cases and deaths across the world. And obviously not very happy about this, but this is what was happening. And then we had to change all the plans accordingly. So the, the, the decision here was to um, isolate a whole building. So the main building was going to be a high exposure or COVID only area. And the other, all the other buildings were supposed to be COVID free, but we don't use the word COVID free anymore because of course that was impossible, especially because for the healthcare workers and all the other workers were circulating in this hospital. So we, of course we had cases in the other areas too and, and many of our fellows uh, got COVID in the low exposure area. Uh, and, and so this building has 900 beds and we had, when the, when the pandemic started, we had 84 ICU beds and divided in several ICUs and we had to, of course, increase that number uh, and so we had to move. I, I, I have this, I, I, I continue to find this picture very um, impactful for me. This is our ICU emptied because we had to move in two days to another building. So our, our ICU is in the Heart Institute, so we all had to move to an, a different area. So we took all, we had to take all the ICU beds and the ventilators and uh, uh, pumps and everything and, and, and move to a new area. This is also very shocking to look at. This is March 30th, and we're not wearing masks, right? We, we only wear, wore masks with, with patients because we didn't have a lot of masks. There was a lack of masks, so they were reserved for when we had patients. So this is like a few hours when we were opening the new ICU and we didn't have any patients yet. The minute we had one patient, then we spent months uh, dressed like that and wearing, uh, of course, uh, uh, protective masks around the ICU, even outside of the the beds. We had we had a, like this new area. It was supposed to be a new ICU, and it was built three or four years before the pandemic, and it was never occupied because the, the we didn't have money to hire nurses and physicians to occupy the area. So it was brand new and empty. And then now we had the opportunity to. To, to use that area, which is, um, had very, very good um, beds and, and space for, for patients. So our charge was to uh, 
deliver the best possible care given the, the situation to as many patients as possible and, and continue to be a reference in, in Sao Paulo. And we had to expand and increase the number of ICU beds and we had to do this fast and we had no experience in, in doing this before. We, we started doing uh, treatment port protocols. Uh, I, I filmed these videos like in two or three days with my phone and uh, we had it on the, on the website. Those videos were accessed for, from, from all over the country in Brazil. It, they were not close to our institution, but we had to develop uh, treatment protocols and, and try to standardize treatment across um, all of the ICUs, especially because we were, we're, we're building, well, uh, increasing the number of ICU beds and bringing in new teams that had never, uh, sometimes never worked with uh, such severe patients before. A few items were obviously very, very important to, to increase capacity. So we needed uh, more oxygen, so we, we doubled our capacity. We needed generators to make sure that we would be able to deal with any power shortages. We need to increase uh, masks and hand sanitizers. We, 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 we needed to multiply it by four. Uh, and we, we, we needed more ventilators. And of course, I know all of you went through that, but it was a scarier, oh, I don't know if it's scary, I don't want to um, assume it was sc scarier than for other people, but it, it, was, it was, we were really afraid we wouldn't have the resources to do this. And it was not just oxygen or, or uh, generators, we needed, we needed infusion pumps, we needed catheters, hand sanitizers, sedatives in Brazil. We had a few days in our hospital where we were really afraid we wouldn't have enough uh, neuromuscular blockage uh, medications or, or even, I don't know, uh, regular sedatives to, to care for as many patients, like so many more patients than we were used to in a time that it was hard to get all these medications across anywhere in the, in the world, especially in Brazil, uh, and a lot of competition for, for um, buying those medications. And we also needed to figure out how to, uh, how to offer ca the cafeterias, the resting areas, changing rooms. Uh, so uh, a lot of people were involved in, in making sure we wouldn't collapse when we were preparing to care for, for many more patients than we were used to. We had to expand uh, our uh, ICU beds into wards, so we had security cameras to film the patients, and, and so these areas were not prepared to have such critical patients, and, and we, we didn't have intubated patients in these areas, but we had patients, for example, in high flow oxygen or NIV alone in a room, so you have to, to make sure you're not missing uh, when they're deteriorating and need to be intubated. So. Of course, we, we used uh, wards to care for p critical patients. We turned our operation rooms into ICUs, and because the, the elective surgeries were all canceled, the anesthesiologists were available to, to help uh, uh, lead these ICU areas and, and ventilators, which for me was very, very scary to use the anesthesia ventilators um, to ventilate severe patients with the RDS. This is our, this is our, um, this is the corridor in the operating room in a regular day when, when we were just using this for operations. And this is how it looked during the pandemic with all the, the teams here when we uh, transformed this area into ICUs. And we had, we had, a lot of people had to shift um, from, from their regular um, uh, duties in the hospital to new uh, positions. So we had a rep, uh, the anesthesiologists were, were doing uh, rapid response teams and intubation teams. You could, if you had to intubate a patient in a ward, you could call them. And I know this is probably uh, very common in the US, but that, that's not something we, we used to have in our hospital. So we, in a sense, we, we had to, um, learn how to do this, and that's also something we, we learned from. And tracheostomy team, the, the, the surgeons were working on that team, uh, the di special dialysis team, and we also had the group of palliative care who needed to uh, offer um, consultation for patients in the ICU and awards whenever it was necessary. 
And we also tried to do research and we, we realized we, we needed uh, epidemiological data from our, uh, from our contacts to, to inform how to deal with those patients. So this is a study that, that I led and, and we, we collected data on patients in our institution, so it's a single center. Uh, study, we, we included all the patients that, uh, adult patients in critical care during the, what we call the first wave of COVID in Brazil, so March to June 2020. Uh, all the 300 ICU beds we had available in the, in the hospital at that time, and we involved many, many people worked in the study, and uh, we had a few study coordinators, but, but mostly people working in this were the, the fellows, ICU doctors, a few medical students who wanted to be involved in, in research and could collect some of the data, the part of the data that you collected from uh, electronic medical records. So really a team effort. And, and this is a map of Sao Paulo, just to give you an idea of, uh, it, although it's a single center study, uh, it's like, it's like a, a, a countrywide study. So this is, the, the, the black dot is where the hospital is. The city of Sao Paulo is um, more or less this area. And the red dots is where patients were coming from. So they were coming from everywhere except uh, areas that are, uh, that are shown in green here, which are, of course, rural areas. So we, we serve the population from the metropolitan area that has 23 million people. And we were like the, the largest referral center for the most severe cases at that time. I'm not gonna spend time showing this is table one, who were the patients, it's the, more or less the same uh, um, epidemiology seen everywhere, about 60% men, uh, average 60 years old, but they had a very high uh, severity score, so a SAPS3 score, very high SOFA scores over the roof, and uh, this was the first wave, so the uh, medium nine days of symptoms, so very late. Uh, we were suffering from, from that um, initial uh, recommendation that people stayed home if they felt, and they only came to the hospital if they were really, really sick. Uh, and, and, and that translated into admitting patients on the first day, they, they needed to be intubated on that first day. So it was very dramatic. Uh, we were focusing on that study on looking at how people, how patients were ventilated. So um, of the uh, of the 1,500 patients included in the study, about a thousand were intubated on the first day, the day they were admitted in the ICU. So these are um, uh, ventilator parameters we were using on that day. So a tidal volume of 6.5 ml per kilogram of predicted body weight, which is I, I was surprised, I was, I was expecting we, would, we wouldn't see um, uh, protective ventilation. Uh, so 80% of the patients were receiving a tidal volume of less that, than 8 mLs per kilogram on the first day. FiO2s of uh, 50%, medium peeps, if, um, if you could say that. And plateau pressure and driving pressure, um, medium values also in the, in the protective range and, and medium compliance. So th this is not different from, from most of the studies looking at uh, severe uh, COVID-19 associated ARDS. But uh, I think what was interesting here is see uh, that protective ventilation was, was applied to, to so many patients. These are our sad outcomes. 80% of our patients were mechanically ventilated uh, for that uh, period of time. Uh, about a third received prone positioning, probably lower than should have been done if we had the resources and the time and the people and everything. Many needed vasopressors and 46% died in the ICU, 49% died in the hospital. Uh, so these are very high mortality rates compared to other countries. We also saw that uh, protective ventilation was associated with uh, lower mortality. So uh, these are, uh, this is a survival curve uh, for protective uh, in blue and non-protective uh, in, in red, adjusted for SAPS3, uh, pH, and PF ratios at admission. This is just to show you that our hospital was, uh, so this is, this is like one of those 
I don't know how to say this, but maybe it's an army hospital. You know, the hospitals that we, we built just for, for COVID that, in a tent. Uh, so they received most of the patients in the first wave. But if you look at the I, patients needed ICU, our hospital was like by far the one in Sao Paulo that received most of the patients. So uh, that came, as at a, of course, at, at a cost. And, and one of the costs is, of course, the outcomes, but also the impact in, in physical and mental health for for many of us uh, in, in many aspects. Uh, and although we had a few strategies to try to mitigate and, and support groups, of course, this is something we're still dealing with. By July, we thought COVID was ending. Remember that too? I, I, it's <laughs> we thought this is gonna go away. This is the last day we were in the, 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 the new area. Uh, this is one of our fellows. She's holding something that says, like, um, the day off, this is what the nurses use when they, they, they say what day they, they prefer to get a day off. So this is, but this is our fellow, and she was like, I need a day off. Uh, but we were all happy this is ending, and we're going to move back to our area. So we're, here we are, the, the team. I, I wanted to, to show this picture because I, I think if we did something right during the pandemic is really building a, a community, a community and, and, and trying to do our best and, and as a team, and I think that made a difference. This is, what happened in our hospital is already pretty tragic, but it, it contrasts very much with what happened across Brazil. So we already had this problem of dynamic strain on top of static strain. This is a study we did in, in uh, 2013 Patients with moderate to severe RDS had a 60% mortality rate. Carolyn Coffey just showed us that the, uh, studies uh, uh, see mortality rates for between 30 and 40%. We already had 60%. And then in Brazil, what happened during the pandemic, this is a database, national database of uh, 250,000 COVID admissions. And, and the mortality, of course, goes up with with age and the need for ventilatory support, but we had 80% mortality among patients who were intubated, showing, uh, but reflecting what uh, people were very afraid of being intubated in, for COVID in Brazil with the uh, perception that it could be a death sentence. And it was, uh, there was a lot of disparities related to that. So this map shows, so the, the and on the left you see the, the Lighter color is number percentage of patients in the ICU, and and the the right map shows the percent mortality. So where people had less access, so this is the Amazon region here, higher mortality. So the maps are almost like opposite, showing where you don't have access to critical care. It could mean like you don't have as many people sick, but that's not true because mortality was much higher. So it's directly related to lack of access to ICU beds. There's also a lot of uh, uh, higher burden among minorities, and this is in, in Sao Paulo, this study is done in Sao Paulo, which is the richest uh, state in, in Brazil, and uh, the 40% poorest population uh, compared to the wealthiest, uh, greater odds of dying of COVID, Black or brown, these are categories, official categories of uh, race and ethnicity in Brazil. A higher risk of dying if you're, if you're from one of those minorities. And of course, if you're in a public hospital compared to a private hospital, a higher mortality too. So uh, the usual disparities uh, magnified by COVID-19. Uh, also, a, a big difference, uh, if you look at the, the the mortality is also reflected on what type of population we were serving. So this is comparing the patients in, in our study in the public hospital with a, a study uh, with colleagues in Brazil as well, uh, with uh, mostly uh, uh, private hospitals, showing that they, the, the mean age, the patients in the private sector were younger, the, they were less sick, they, they needed less uh, ventilatory support, and of course had a lower mortality. And then came the second wave. Uh, 
And this is just a, a map of showing when we were happy, and I saw those pictures of the fowl so happy that we were July, and, and, and the colors of the maps were uh, less strained across Brazil. And then that showed up in the Amazon, and nobody pays a lot of attention because it's the Amazon, and we don't. Uh, maybe it's because they're disorganized or something like that, and we didn't pay it attention, and that was proved to be very, very tragic. And then all across Brazil, the map goes really red until uh, February or March 2021. I'm not gonna, I, you all, you all also, again, you all know what happened across uh, the globe with the second wave. But this is data in, in Brazil just showing over time. So, uh, so this is 2020 and then the beginning of this, what for us was clearly a second wave in 2021. Uh, so this is admissions going up, and then what happened in Brazil at that time, and I think it was true in other uh, places as well, is for the first time, we were having like uh, high numbers all of a sudden on the same, uh, in, in several states at the same time. On the first wave, of it, I think, it started in Sao Paulo and then it spread to other states. But the second wave, after coming out of the Amazon, it hit all the states at the same time, and that led to that uh, lack of uh, access to to care uh, uh, by February, March of 2021. So younger patients, so this dark, dark green is younger than 60 years old, many more younger people being admitted uh, in the second wave compared to the, to the first wave, but then larger numbers for, for both ages, age groups. Um, more need for respiratory support, both non-invasive and invasive and of course, a much higher mortality. Our hospital was again uh, in, uh, illuminated with this red light, which is beautiful, but also I think trying to convey that we were um, living special times and, and trying to manage as we could. The thing is, what happened in, in our hospital in the second wave was really different. I think in some way we had learned so much from, from what what we lived in the, in the first wave. And then uh, we, were, we, we, we didn't move, so we didn't, uh, again, uh, mobilize areas and change uh, to another area. So all the institutes had their own ICUs, uh, COVID ICUs, isolated in the building, but not changing buildings. Uh, the patients we admitted this time were not the sickest of the sickest as in the first wave, I think, because the, the whole state was more organized and could uh, administrate and, and refer patients to more hospitals. So we had a lower uh, sapstry, a lower mortality in that, um, in that second wave in our hospital, which is very different from what happened in the whole country. And, and I, I like to, to think that part of it, it can be, can be um, explained by this framework suggested by um, a good friend, Jorge Salou, from the Rio de Janeiro in this, in this, uh, in this piece where they, where they talk about ICU resilience. So how can we, how can we survive um, pandemics or other uh, situations like this one? It will, it will depend on how we anticipate them how we monitor, how we learn from, from our previous experience and, and how we respond. And, and in, many, in many cases, it will be related to systems, how we improve ICU outcomes will, will be. So everything in this, in this framework is, is related to, um, in, in some way, being organized to, to do all that. For, for us, it was really, uh, many people were were worried that we would be doing science or we're doing uh, research studies in the middle of a pandemic and, and it proved to be so, so, so important. And also how do we teach uh, fellows and interns and, and medical students in the middle of a pandemic in a place where there is scarcity of uh, resources. And, and I think um, this framework shows nicely that you, you, don't, you shouldn't be forgetting any of these aspects when we're trying to, um, to, to go to any crisis and it uh, um, shows how we, we really need to think about this and, and try to, to leverage everything we learned from, from, from this experience to better anticipate 
situations like that in the future and, and monitor uh, everything that we need to monitor to be better prepared and then uh, be able to respond uh, adequately. And with that, I'll, I'll thank you. So our next presentation is from uh, Eric Goosby. Eric has had a number of positions uh, as outlined in the bio in the, the program. Uh, I'll just mention a couple. He was the director of the PEPFAR program under the Obama administration for um, several years and uh, was also more recently the uh, UN ambassador for tuberculosis. So he's in a very good position to understand how uh, COVID affected uh, important public health pro pro problems in um, low resource settings, and basically globally. Um, we'll, we'll have a bit of a different format. Eric is gonna present some of his personal reflections on, uh, on John Murray. Then we'll have a little bit of a back and forth with, with questions uh, directed to Eric about the impact of, of COVID on global public health programs. Eric? Well, thank you, Phil. Uh, to the family of Dr. Murray and to the organizers, um, both Courtney and Phil, um, it's really an honor to be asked to speak to uh, John Murray's um, presence and contribution to uh, my personal uh, journey through the UC system and San Francisco General in particular going back to uh, medical school, uh, residency fellowship, and then as a faculty member. Um, John touched me personally because of attending um, relationships, being on his team, back when the ICU would have a uh, medical team, uh, they would uh, follow patients into the unit and then out onto the ward on discharge. and. I had him as an ICU attending and as a medical ward attending twice. So I really was um, honored and moved at the time and afterwards at his clarity uh, and focus on uh, really um, what the patient needed uh, and his prioritization of trying to uh, understand that better as the um, uh, interaction with the admission moved forward and as dialogue with the family began. Uh, the um, faculty role in uh, his trying to think about John's priorities, John Murray's priorities in the ARDS arena that has been so beautifully outlined uh, and his commitment to taking uh, those lessons and putting uh, capturing them, preserving them in a training program curriculum, uh, in a textbook, guideline, recommendation type orientation for standards of care, uh, and how that indirectly uh, moved outside of just San Francisco General uh, to the country uh, through his work with the uh, ATS, the Thoracic Society, in ways that I saw in international work uh, trickling into not just um, doctor uh, discussions uh, in inpatient, outpatient care, but also in the way healthcare delivery systems thought through what they should do or what they could do uh, in response to uh, pandemic type threats. And I would, I would put tuberculosis as the oldest unresponded to pandemic, uh, but HIV quickly came uh, on my watch uh, after uh, exposure to Dr. Murray's thinking uh, about um, how you translate those clinical experiences into lessons learned, uh, clarify what your lessons are with questions and research, uh, but have that feedback into uh, a curriculum that allows uh, everyone to benefit from it. And he truly characterized that uh, for all of us at San Francisco General, but kept a rigor to it throughout his entire career, which is something that I personally admired. Uh, saw Phil uh, uh, follow in many ways through that same trajectory uh, and realizing the 
importance of the contribution uh, at kind of every stage of, uh, of his orchestration as an attending uh, and a professor of medicine. So leadership in a time of uncertainty, uh, he really did instill in all of those, both in the pulmonary uh, division, but those in infectious disease and in general medicine, uh, that uh, the responsibility primarily evolved and emoted from the patient. His time in 5R, the ICU, the medical step-down discussions that I can recall trying to uh, not allow slippage in the clinical gains made in the ICU as the person's put down to a step-down unit. Uh, and then uh, going through the early uh, discussions in the unit, but also on the ward and uh, in the hospital. Uh, many of you in this room, I, uh, Chip was here earlier, Chip Chambers. Uh, the introduction and discussions around universal health coverage. I can remember sitting in second floor um, conference rooms talking about uh, the ins and outs of that and how each unit director came down uh, for those discussions and John took a very clear role uh, in all of that over all of those years. Um, the need to decide before the data is in to tell you what to do. Uh, we've seen examples of that in ARDS and in the lectures that we've listened to this, this morning. But it was also present in HIV and it was present in COVID. Often the critical care uh, providers in the hospital uh, are the first to confront that dilemma. But the thing that Dr. Murray instilled in me was the understanding that you're going to need to make a decision with the data you've got, and you have to retain uh, the intellectual honesty to accept the outcomes and respond to those outcomes um, as you evolve in the care of that patient. That single lesson for me is something that has served me in my entire career, and Dr. Murray's early influence on that are where I see the roots of that residing. HIV's uh, predominance in many of its manifestations using the lung uh, as the uh, site, uh, again, emphasized uh, the pulmonary division in its orientation to care. Many of the beds were full of young uh, men who came in with late stage disease. Uh, the opportunist opportunistic infections dominating uh, often uh, coming uh, and requiring uh, pulmonary support. Uh, but the thing that I remember the most uh, in his, um, in his uh, style was the withdrawal of care discussions. It's come up a couple of times this morning. The most, um, uh, I think, focused discussions I had ever participated in uh, often without the patient participating, but with the providers of the care, uh, with a family member uh, in um, attendance, or we would meet and then go to a family discussion. But his ability to continually prioritize the needs of the patient, the patient in the bed, not the patient, so not the differences in the patients, what we felt the patient's needs were uh, when there was a family um, discussion or a difference in uh, sustaining care and support, uh, his gentle but persistent ability to tell the truth to the patient and the family uh, was something that I saw always win the day. And the, for lack of another term, the intellectual honesty that it, that it displayed uh, is something that everyone, I think, was impacted by, but took us often uh, reflective time to realize the importance of that intellectual honesty throughout the discussion uh, of a withdrawal with care, especially when your understanding of the natural history and pathophysiology of the disease was either absent or very limited. Uh, and his ability to reveal ignorance uh, to not let that add to the anxiety of the moment, but to add to the trust in the relationship uh, was uh, brilliant in seeing how skilled he was at that over and over again.
So for that, I will be eternally grateful. The global burden of tuberculosis, uh, 10.6 million new cases a year, uh, 1.6 uh, million deaths, uh, puts us in a, a situation where the domino displacement that we saw in San Paulo, as presented, uh, really occurred everywhere. Uh, in San Francisco, throughout the country, uh, everywhere it was measured, we saw a displacement, just as we did with HIV, of attention given in both acute settings and inpatient settings uh, alike. In COVID, it was accentuated because of the measures taken to try to interrupt transmission in hospital settings. The message to uh, patients not to come to hospital, outpatient work, uh, ceased. And as would be predicted, as we did see everywhere, uh, undiagnosed, untreated, uh, coronary artery disease, strokes, uh, progress, progression and renal failure, all where measured was documented well. And I think uh, the big lesson for us is to learn how uh, to accommodate the responsibilities that the medical institution has already committed to populations as a new challenge enters. Putting time to understand the relative threats uh, is something I think we would do differently. Uh, half this room was involved in intense discussions in your municipalities, in your hospitals, in your health delivery system settings about what to do, how to do it, when to do it, where to do it. Uh, the same discussion over and over and over again. But that discussion, and, and the ones I participated in, it was months before we thought about the relative impact on other uh, diseases that were prevalent in the same population that was now confronted with COVID. Doing that better is something that we can do, and I think uh, TB is an example of a forever pandemic that has never been effectively contained or responded to, despite diagnostics and therapeutics that are effective. So I see the TB as the oldest, but the highest, because now with the displacement of COVID, that COVID put on us, uh, COVID rose to the highest killer infectious on the planet. But TB is now right back uh, moving it out. So TB is about to become, once again, the leading uh, infectious disease killer. In many sub-Saharan African countries, uh, the TB death toll has gone up. Uh, the number of individuals identified, entered, started on antimycobacterials successfully completed to sterility uh, has dropped precipitously everywhere. Indeed, data collection has uh, wobbled in many places and has gone to an extrapolated calculation for this year's numbers. So I think uh, no one's worried about them being non-representative, but I think we haven't tallied the toll of what that displacement is really going to do. The um, HIV burden uh, is uh, uh, evident in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, as we have all witnessed, the uh, need to uh, uh, diagnose and treat uh, moving to uh, populations that do not have delivery systems that are interfaced at all with them, nor a political will to do so, uh, really uh, was again seen with COVID. I think much of the lack of morbidity and mortality in sub-Saharan Africa was largely due to lack of spread of the uh, disease into the population at highest risk. And as a result, it trickled in uh, through uh, airport, cities with airports, et cetera, uh, and I think saved much of the suffering and death that would have happened otherwise. Uh, it has given Sub-Saharan Africa in particular, with the African Union's work in uh, the AU's Center for Disease Control, which is in every country now, uh, to play the role of not just surveillance, but also um, training uh, and uh, looking uh, for training for uh, health professionals, but uh, also uh, rapid response technical assistance. They have a regional plan now that will put 11 regional centers up that will allow uh, for a uh, identification of an outbreak early 
quantification of it and a concentration of uh, epidemiologists coming from regional locations backed up by WHO's epi uh, cohort and the United States' uh, to, um, uh, to validate uh, data entry and aggregation and analyze it kind of in as real time as can be uh, created. Uh, a challenge for many of us in developed settings, uh, but one that I think COVID has put on the top, on the top of, the, of the list. Um, I think the lack of orchestration globally uh, is still uh, not, has not been addressed. The um, ability to uh, me move uh, resources rapidly to where they're needed, uh, the ability to have uh, a surveillance system that is sensitive enough to pick up uh, low prevalence disease, uh, and have the ability to get it to the authority uh, in country, if it's in the Ministry of Health or a combination of ministry uh, with public-private sector, uh, to respond as rapidly as can be locally, but to have the international um, match to be um, instant. Uh, as soon as the signal goes out, people are converge and expand capacity around uh, case identification contact tracing efforts, which largely had resided in TB and HIV settings and were largely mobilized for the COVID uh, response after the first wave in most of your sub-Saharan African uh, locations. I think the shared responsibility, uh, the fact that the planet has gotten much smaller, uh, it was always small to those of us who were looking at uh, diseases that jumped, but for uh, most of the world uh, in delivery systems that are the strongest, this was not a self-expectation, nor was it a response that we saw uh, from uh, developed settings uh, until um, they really had gotten through their first uh, identification and response. Then centers of excellence or equivalent popped their heads up and started to look around for where other support could be delivered. All of those nodes of capability have been identified, but the system to rapidly deploy and put, uh, identify weaknesses and move uh, strength to weakness uh, are still uh, what they were before COVID. And I fear that our pendulum swing in the dialogues that are going on on a multilateral level uh, are receding back into um, national responses and protecting national capabilities and not really allowing uh, that shared responsibility to, uh, to take root. So I fear that we uh, have not adequately uh, answered uh, the challenges that COVID presented to us, what it did to our delivery systems, it will do again. Uh, our managed care, kind of decentralized approach to healthcare in the United States is the reason so many suffered uh, and died, uh, uh, many without uh, adequate attempts to diagnose or treat. And I think those disparities uh, are critical for us to not forget, but more importantly for us to quantitate and respond to at a local, national, and international level. And I, um, I think that academic medical centers in particular, uh, I believe will be the voice that calls foul and says that this must come back stronger and better. Um, I think uh, if we are able to uh, put this type of orchestration in place, it to me reflects very much the type of uh, medical care that uh, Dr. Murray really uh, displayed to us, the sense of uh, personal responsibility in delivering that care to individual patients and to populations in general. Uh, resides in us as the provider of care, as part of the provider delivery system for those populations. We need to honestly look at our response and see it for what it was and speak to institutions that now don't uh, easily allow 
uh, conversations to enter that uh, challenge um, kind of catchment areas and, and areas of, of, uh, of uh, commitment that have financial um, uh, costs associated with them and have been balanced throughout given regions, San Francisco, larger Bay Area. Uh, we have the resources to cover everyone's needs, but those resources aren't available to everyone, and there is not a platform in which that can be discussed easily. So I think the stovepipe walls between funding lines, third-party payers domestically is our biggest threat before we can uh, develop the response that a pandemic such as COVID uh, demands of a delivery system. I believe the Academic Medical Center has uh, the opportunity to make sure uh, policymakers and leadership globally uh, don't miss this moment. Um, so, Phil, I'll be quiet for a minute and you can ask questions about COVID. So, maybe you've already answered this, but just in general, has COVID strengthened or weakened health systems in, in low resource settings, particularly low resource settings? And looking from mm -hmm. now forward. Uh, there's, no, there's no low um, incident setting that wasn't challenged and confronted by the COVID outbreak. Uh, most did better than developed settings in terms of uh, containing spread and getting uh, low numbers actually uh, infected. Uh, because of movement of people more than anything else, the lack of movement of people, uh, the lack of airport transportation type uh, vehicles not uh, you know, spreading it throughout a country. Uh, but uh, I would say every country was hurt, burdened, and are in need of Recover, you know, recovery strategy that will not come from most of the domestic budgets that are out there. They're going to need uh, donor help and what I would say new strategies around funding lines, funding pots that, uh, that there's a lot of problems with historically uh, being created or added onto uh, to be there for this and those countries that will never be able to afford a more robust response. Uh, we are a rich enough planet and there is enough wealth for us to do this uh, much better and not see uh, a perpetuation of disparities that we really do know how to close. Well, speaking of disparities, um, there's been a lot of discussion of the disparity in vaccine availability, distribution and availability with low resource settings. Uh, as is usually the case, not getting their, their share of vaccines. Is, do you think this will prompt changes like uh, more, more uh, vaccine development and testing in the settings, uh, in, in low resource settings? So, other, other solutions? Yeah, I definitely do. Uh, there will be um, uh, the disparity that is seen in who got vaccinated for COVID, who uh, had second, third boosted, et cetera, is uh, dependent solely on who could pay for it. Uh, there's, it's not rocket science. It's very clear who got it. The inability of poor countries to access free vaccines was burdened by the ability for Gavi to buy the vaccine to get access to the vaccine from all three of the... G Gavi being? Uh, the uh, the uh, Global AIDS Vaccine Initiative is a multilateral effort that uh, was created uh, uh, to respond to low-income countries' needs for vaccinations for M MMW, you know, your measles, mumps, rubella, DPT shot type basics with all of the regional needs in vaccines. They have all of them, and they're about 30% utilized by countries that are eligible to use them. So we've got problems in making available resources that are already there uh, um, available, uh, and a lot of it is lack of desire on part of the country itself to ask for it. Uh, and I think um, 
COVID rose that level right up to the front of the queue in most of these countries. So the awareness that there are those pots, that we as a country are poor and don't have them, has gone up a ratchet. The political ability to respond to them uh, by um, constituency pressure, the population demanding it of their leadership, is just starting. But it is there more than it is in many countries with TB already for COVID. So I'm not optimistic, but I'm, there are things to add on to and to uh, rally around. Uh, countries need to know that this is gonna be something that they need to come from within. The external top-down response that was seen with HIV is very unlikely to be done again. Uh, and I think they should be thinking of a local response core with multilateral donor continuation but not count on it. It's that, it's that shaking now. So I don't, I don't know the answer to this. Uh, actually, maybe you do. But I'm assuming that um, uh, healthcare staff were increased, uh, even in, in low resource settings, to uh, address COVID. Uh, and I'm wondering, number one, is that really true? And secondly, What's the potential for keeping the augmented staff on board uh, after COVID, since COVID has received, receded? Um, the, um, it did increase during COVID. Uh, we saw a kind of a redistribution of existing health professionals in a country. Uh, they went from um, low incidence to to high need settings, but they're still needed in the low incidence area now that the COVID has waned. So those will redistribute back. They already largely have in many countries. Um, and I think it did show the health worker manpower shortage from especially in the doctor and nurse arena, but throughout the delivery system, health professionals are low and needed. Uh, it takes too long to educate. So the fix of a healthcare worker uh, has been, I think, way overused to uh, be the permanent solution. But as a bridging solution, healthcare workers can extend capability for a finite period of time. Most countries don't have a funding line in their civil service system for a healthcare worker. So the donor perseveration on healthcare workers uh, was. Um, uh, a logical response to an unmet need, but the systems that they have to live in uh, to get a new FTE in a civil service budget uh, doesn't happen in most any country, including ours. So that's a, that's a slow fix, even with a threat such as COVID being fresh in their mind. Uh, but people are trying that argument. But uh, people, politicians, do what they have to do or what, they're, what they feel will uh, preclude or preempt a, an attack. And that's pretty much what the world politician is motivated by. It's very rarely a anticipating a, a better future and trying to create that uh, and pull the population to it. It's usually reactive. And I think COVID again showed us uh, how it is a reactive world we're in. Um, but. Um, I'm, I am uh, concerned that there isn't a forum, Phil, where this is being constructively discussed. There's a lot of conversations going on that will go absolutely nowhere. <laughs> so, it's terrible. That was that first smile. Maybe on that optimistic note. Yeah, I know. I didn't mean to say. <laughs> Courtney will be talking to you about the. Uh, future of textbooks as a means of transfer of knowledge, um, and I guess specifically in pulmonary and critical care or more gen generically? You're shaking your head yes to both. <laughs> okay, Courtney. Thank you for this. <laughs> Thank you, Phil, for that sort of introduction. <laughs> and uh, yes, no, I am, I'm real uh, pleased to be 
thinking on this subject. It gave me an opportunity to think long and hard about textbooks. And then after we think about textbooks, then we're going to turn this over to Kirsten Bivens Domingo, who's been thinking long and hard about journals. And these are two areas that John made major contributions. So my disclosures are that I am an editor and an author for two publications. One is the Murray and Nadell's textbook of respiratory medicine, now in its seventh edition. And one is up to date, which is, uh, many of you in the medical field know up to date. It's, I think of it as more of an encyclopedia, uh, sort of more shallow and very wide, whereas the textbook is more narrow and deeper. But I'm going to, when I talk about textbooks, I'm really going to be giving you examples and experience based on Murray and Nadell's because that's what I know. And in fact, I've had quite a long tradition uh, and time with this uh, textbook. Let's see. Ah, got it. So this, uh, from the first to the seventh edition, the first being 1988 with John Murray and Jane Nadell. And I was asked by John Murray to get involved, and that was to look over a chapter that he was editing. And he wanted me to look at it too because it was on plural effusions, and that was what I had been working on. So I looked it over and gave him, you know, my thoughts about the chapter, and he said, very, very nice, thank you very much. And then I was an author, as a result of that, presumably, in the next two editions. And then uh, I was additionally brought on as an editor for the next two editions. And then at this point, I became an editor-in-chief. So I have had a long association with Marie and Nadell and uh, think, have been thinking a lot about textbooks. And you might be interested, when you go back to the first edition of uh, Marie and Nadell, that many uh, our authors there are in this room. So you know who you are. If uh, your name is on that list, you were listed as an author for the first edition. So you too are part of the Maria Nadell family. So over the course of the editions of the textbook, what has, uh, what has happened to textbooks? So one thing, of course, is that it, there has been an increasing competition from other sources of information. <clears throat> Uh, I mentioned up to date, but also journals uh, with lovely review articles. Uh, medical websites uh, abound. Some are curated and, and many are not. And these are all competing for the attention of the learner. And textbooks have more and more been forced to justify their very existence. There are described as being out of date, even as you get the book in your hand. Words that are used are dusty, dead. That's not good. They have been known to be used as a doorstop. They're very useful as a doorstop, I might add. So as at, at one point where textbooks were really seemed to be under siege, I was asked to uh, contribute this special article, Thinking About Textbooks, along with Mike Grippy, who is the editor-in-chief of a, another pulmonary textbook, the Fishman's textbook. And you might not be surprised to know that we came down on the side of arguing that textbooks were essential. For a number of reasons, they had their, their place in the armamentarium of education, but they still had to adapt. So where do textbooks appear to fit in? What, what makes them special? And these are the three categories or three uh, characteristics of textbooks that were always important in Marie Nadell. I'm sure they're important in other books, but they've been mentioned over and over again in prefaces to just about each edition, that the, the book was first and foremost had to be authoritative. The, Authors that are selected, the editors that are working there have to be experts in their field, have to be fair so that they're presenting the data in a, in a balanced way. It has to be authoritative. And very important, comprehensive. So a textbook should include everything that's thought to be important in that field without major gaps and without major duplications. And then one thing that was over and over very important to John Murray and has been continued 
in importance with the entire book, is that the clinical practice should be based on a scientific foundation. So it was kind of the evidence-based idea. But in this case, science was the first third of the book. And uh, whenever anybody wants to shorten the book, uh, the word that comes up, well, should we get rid of the science part? No, 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 because this book is based on the science. That's, it's supposed to be integral to the, to the book. And, as it, and in the course of making the book, it should be a synthesis. It should be integrated. It should be a synthesis of the field. It takes a lot of thought, as opposed to just putting down everything someone knows, to really integrate it and think, what are the most important parts? And, and even though there are all these other sources of information, a textbook should be complementary, or we think of it as complementary, not necessarily in direct competition, because they do different things. So, uh, and by doing that, it can help the trainee, because this book is primarily targeted to, to the trainee and education of those entering the field, but they should help that reader evaluate these other sources or resources available and hopefully develop new ideas based on this foundation that they've gotten from studying in that textbook. Uh, but the book can't be dusty, it can't be dead, we have to think about how it should adapt to a changing world. So if you stop and think, well, how does a print textbook adapt? And for now, I'll be talking about print. Well, you know, we spend a lot of time thinking about this in our editor's meetings. We get together just before the ATS meeting every year. And for the last couple of years, it's been by Zoom. We're hoping to have at least part of it in person this year for the next edition. But how, how can you adapt a print textbook? Well, you can add chapters on new topics that have become important. This last book, Microbiome, was considered to be important enough to be a complete chapter. Um, but there was a lot of discussion about that. And we added a whole, we added a whole section that was supposed to be directed to fellows. Uh, you add expertise. You bring in, obviously, new authors for new chapters, but also editors cover areas of expertise, and I'll show you some of that. You can play around with, the, with the, what the page looks like. You can have color. You can change the layout. You can increase the number of figures, illustrations. You can add key points. You know, you can do things. We've done this where you take all the references and put them online, and you abstract the key points for every chapter and also key readings. And those have ended up being used by some fellows to study for the boards, for example. They just go through and take all the key points, make sure they understand those. And in, in one case, you can kind of speed up the printing. We used to have to wait months and months for the book that had been printed in China to get on a boat and come across the Pacific Ocean to come to the United States. That was incredible. So that book definitely was out of date by the time it got to us. So I, I took out my copy of the first edition here, and uh, the seventh, this is red for some reason I can't explain, unlike the earlier picture. And it does look like this was thicker than this, and we've changed paper and all sorts of things have changed, but indeed there are fewer pages. They weighed less now, on my bathroom scale at least, it went down a little bit. <laughs> and the number of chapters uh, increased by 50%. We really made a strategic decision to make smaller, more maybe digestible, don't suggest eating them, but I mean, you know, manageable chapters uh, on, on the different subjects that we wanted to cover, easier to locate, easier to, to search for. And in the course of doing that, the authors have more than tripled number of authors. And the editors increased too to add more supervision, let's say, over all of these uh, sections. The two initial editors, John Murray, Jane Adele, uh, now we are eight. And one thing that's particularly, I'm particularly proud of is that half of us are female women, and we got the authorship up to 37% women as well, which went up from like 15% to 37%. So we're, that's another thing we can do as we go to the future is improve our representation. And here, here are our editors. You'll see many of us in the audience. Uh, we have Steve Lazarus, Lynn Schnapp, Joel Ernst, Talmadge King, and others are on, following online. So, and to bring in the expertise, 
other than you know the expertise we we bring in these areas. We have uh, Joel Ernst is is not a pulmonologist; he's an infectious disease doc. So he has a particular uh, value to us in making sure we don't say something stupid about infectious disease. He has a full-time job there. And uh, Mike Gottway is a radiologist with a love of thoracic imaging. So he has you know no end of lovely figures for us, and he curates all the figures that go in the book. So he's, he's a key individual. So this is, this is who puts out the book. Now you might be interested in how the page has changed. So the first through the third edition, up till this last edition, this third edition came out in the year 2000, the book was entirely in black and white. The only thing that was in color was the cover. It's even hard to look at it. <laughs> And we were told, ah, 2005, we're going to have color. <laughs> There's the color. <laughs> oh, wow. Huh? It was in the headings. And it really wasn't until 2010 that we really had color figures. And you just think how valuable color is for education, for making points that you want to make in figures, and uh, just makes it beautiful to look at. So. I'm just covering sort of what you can do with a textbook, a, a hard copy textbook. Um, but it'd be interesting to see what John had to think about this. Now this little film was made in 2013 Well, we were in between, we, we'd done the fifth edition and we were now planning the sixth edition. And that, uh, the way we started was with uh, hardbacks and uh, a lot of our old friends, as I mentioned in the early days, now there's a new group of authors, and the important change that uh, I think we all helped initiate at uh, about five years ago was to emphasize the importance of the electronic version of the textbook, which is something we are now putting as much effort and time into as we did in the old hardback and, uh, 30 years ago. So uh, times are changing, and I think rightly so. So at that point, he was looking to the digital era. And we thought that the digital copies of the book were going to take over, that print was just going to fade away, and that the idea of something that was digital was so disruptive, like it had been disruptive in so many other fields, that it was going to turn publishing upside down. So this is uh, the kind of the timeline of what was going on with the textbook. So here are the first three editions. And this fourth edition, which added the color headings, if you remember, at this point, the text first goes online. But it was, it's almost, I think you could search, but that was all you could do with it. Uh, and it was what was called a flat website. It just had no interaction. But then, with the fourth, uh, fifth edition, it started to have videos. And we just kept going. Uh, here, more videos. Now we have audios, so you could really hear what Strider sounded like, for example. Uh, E-figures are figures that are only online, that don't appear in the textbook. And this was almost doubling what was actually in the textbook, that you could get to uh, from the text, from the text uh, in the e-book, and download, and so forth. References all went online, and we could now use updates in the book. So it was an effort to make the most out of this e-book. So I should mention that uh, electronic versions come in two major flavors. There's the ebook, which is really what I'm going to be talking about, uh, which looks like a textbook, and you can search it and hear the figures over here. And this is the same page, but this is in an institutional subscription-based service, in which they put the textbook in with all sorts of journal articles and reference materials and guidelines, and everything's in there. And uh, this one is uh, called Clinical Key. It's the Elsevier version of this kind of institutional product. And I'm not going to talk more about that. So this was the point. This is a, a picture a graph of the num total number of books sold in the US, not textbooks, just all books in millions and over the years, and comparing the print to ebooks. And this was about when John uh, was speaking. And you can see that at that point, it looked like ebooks were going to continue to increase and print books were going to fall, and that was going to be the end of print. 
And we were actually talking about whether they were even going to make any more print books. But that ended up being the peak. And since ebooks have slid back down to where they're kind of seem to be somewhat stable, textbooks have continued to increase. And now I'm told it's, it's a, a record number of, of books in print that have sold. So the difference here is three to four fold. And it's even more so with textbooks. And what, what's going on? Well, around this time, too, that again, that John was speaking, there are studies about the benefit, the value of reading something and studying something in print. That uh, in this case, uh, so several studies have said there's better retention. There's even better comprehension when people read it in print. Maybe because of the haptic quality of the paper or where the location is in the, in the page. Um, but one of the thoughts was, well, over time, the students will have more exposure to digital and they'll get more used to it. And that, that advantage of print will fade and electronic books will come into their own. Um, by, the, by this time, uh, Martin Tobin wrote this personal view and he had very strong feelings that if you wanted to go into pulmonary, you had to have a book, you know, get rid of that smartphone thing. And this was a, a, just a survey you could find. You can find different surveys. This is college students about what they prefer. So here's this 2015 time. And you'd think, well, gosh, by 2021, the deed would be done and e-books would have uh, won over. But e-books, e-textbooks, because now we're talking textbook, uh, hasn't changed much. Print did drop in preference. There are presumably other things that the students are using. But now we have some more studies. Uh, now we're in you know, a little bit later time period, getting closer. The, the students now should really be used to e-books and navigating and so on. But a lot of these studies are looking at why students prefer print. And so this is Australian uh, university students. There are other studies in Chilean dentistry students. And the, the, sum, the, the, the point of all of these studies that I've come across is that they prefer print. The problem is that libraries and other things don't have the ability to get lots of textbooks. Uh, textbooks are expensive, but if they have equal access, they will want the print book, interestingly. Now, this, this study of medical students kind of split the difference because it, the students said they liked print when they were studying something deeply and they could remember it better and such. But uh, they, did, they did appreciate the ebook ability to search and read things quickly. So in what you could gather from a lot of these studies, and they're not, they're not many, but they're pretty consistent, is that print was better for deep learning. There's, there is better retention, apparently, with uh, maybe the haptic quality of the, the touch of the paper and uh, the location in, in a page that can help people remember. Easier navigation through a book. People can highlight. They can write notes in the margin. Again, ease of use. And reliable in settings where there may not be good internet access. So, this has been the, uh, an argument for why print is very popular compared to ebooks outside the US in the developing world and so on. It seems that print is, uh, wins out. Ebook, quick reading, allowing updates, searching, and so on, quick access to videos, portable, cheaper, accessible, because you can change the print size. You know, for those of you who use Kindles, you can change the print size, you can read, have it read aloud to you. So let's look at some of these. So here's what e updates look like. In, in, so here's the table of contents on the side of the ebook, e-textbook. This is Maria Nadell. Here's an update. And you can click on it, read it, or you can go click on it and go to the place in the text where the update's found. A lot of thought goes into the updates. A lot of authors get involved when you're trying to put an update in their chapter. They want it to be uh, just right. <laughs> So this is how you would access references. So you are reading about coronavirus, your hypoxemia. You see a reference that you like. Let's see, where is it? 85. You see that reference you want to know more about. It. You click on it. You get to the reference. You click on the ID. Now you're out of the book. You're in PubMed. You got the abstract. You click. You get to the full text. And then you can get to the PDF and print it out if you wish, and get down here and you see what, what was being discussed in the text. So for someone who wants 
a book based on science, this gives you that access to the evidence right there. Very quickly you can go. No trip to the library in the dusty uh, basement. So here's how you can uh, access your videos. So you're in this chapter, lovely airway biology chapter. Lynn would know it well. It's in her section. Uh, cilia, cilia. Oh, here's a video. You can watch the video of the cilia moving. And you have the figure legend over here. And you get to see the cilia moving. And you read, this is slowed down. Cilia actually move 10 times faster than that. So how wonderful to be in a text and have a valuable educational opportunity right there quickly open up. So this is about making flashcards. This is how uh, some students learn, by making flashcards. And this is a uh, radiology section. Again, Mike Gottway was involved in this. And this, he's showing here the three basic types of nodular distribution. And fellows want to learn this, right? So they're going to make a flashcard. And we're just going to see how that happens. So here's the section. We want to make this into a flashcard. You go over here. You click flashcard, then it pops up over here, and you can write in what, what you want. You can copy and paste the entire figure legend if you want, but we're going to make these simple. The second one, this is random distribution of nodules, so this is a miliary TB. Phil, you'd recognize this. So we'll then over here make that, and now we're going to go down and make the last flashcard. Now, there's one thought, too, that we could provide flashcards. We could make up a deck of flashcards for trainees to access if they wanted. And they could uh, use them and add to them, et cetera. So here are three flashcards. Hmm. Let's see. This looks central lobular to me. Let's see. We're going to click on it. Ah, good. Central lobular. I got that one. And oh, here's that random one again. Yep. So this is a way, maybe, for students to benefit from uh, the ability to interact with the textbook. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> I'm learning every day. <laughs> so this is what it looks like where you can change the reading and the font size. Here's where, if you go into a section now in the book, you can pick read aloud and uh, have it start reading to you. So these are some of the things ebooks now provide, updates, searching, uh, access right to the basic reference material, educational devices, accessibility. And, but they can provide these additional things. And I want to end the talk with some of those. Now, this is a figure I like, again, the airway biology ch uh, chapter. All the cells in the alveolar uh, epithelium, and here they're, they're coded over here, they're identified. But it, it, I think it would be so nice if you could just click on that cell and see where it was located, like that. You could enter it, you could click on it and find where that cell is. Now you see the location, it's much easier to pick it out. And now you have a little cell, a kind of nondescript but very important cell called a basal cell, which is, I think, hard to see. So let's see if we clicked on that. And now you see here these red cells. Those are the basal cells. And the basal cell will repopulate the airway in the case of injury. And you see where they're located. So this is the sort of thing that wouldn't be hard to do particularly, and I think could make the figures much more educational. Here's a, not in Marie Nadell, but it shows you how you could go from uh, step to step and pop open labels or uh, explanatory information. We could also have figures where labels disappear. You could turn off labels so that you could test yourself. You can adapt and modify a textbook, an ebook. Here's uh, the chapter that we added at the last minute in Murray and Adele, this last publication. And we couldn't name it, number it, other than 46A, because it would have to have renumbered all the other chapters, and that would have been a mess. So we, but we slipped it in. So it's in the print and in the ebook. But it shows you we could just slip in chapters if we wanted. 
add chapters to the ebook, and then when the next print edition comes out, they'd be included in that. And we have two in mind for, that we'd like to add before the next print edition. So the ebook of the future, you think will have you know, the interactivity I discussed and can also evolve, adapt between print editions in something that is more akin to a living textbook, one that changes. And, uh, and one thing I'm particularly interested in this, that will be new to this publisher is putting feedback options in. Because one of the frustrating things about putting so much effort into a textbook is you send it out into the world and then you don't hear anything back. You know, you can send out surveys and you can try to drum up feedback, but you really don't know what's going on out there. But we, we have this potential now that we could put in uh, a, a step that people could take and have this on every page of the book. So that when they come to something that's unclear uh, or they think they found a mistake, haha, they would uh, send us uh, this feedback. And it opens up to a little, uh, I haven't found a mistake yet, but we're still waiting. Um, and then they could write in their feedback and send it in, and we could, even if they gave us their email address, we could communicate back with them. So with this, uh, I do argue that textbooks have an essential role especially for the trainee entering the field. They, they are the authoritative, comprehensive, and they are based on science. They, are, they aim to synthesize the field, and in that they have a particular value. Print is here to stay, it appears, but I can't help but think that e-textbooks are gonna continue to grow in importance. When you think of all the things they can do, a portal to just unlimited resources, educational interactivity, the ability to be updated and modified as a living textbook would be, and, uh, and then perhaps feedback. So with that, I'd like to thank John Murray who got me into this, and I've enjoyed the entire uh, experience, almost all. <laughs> Uh, all the authors and the editors of all the editions of Maria Nadell. Uh, the Elsevier textbook division, which is different from the journal division, it's different. And uh, I work with a, a wonderful woman now called Lada Kral. And, and I also want to thank all the people that helped to put this symposium together. And thanks all of you for coming. So. So Kirsten Bibbins Domingo is not a pulmonologist. <laughs> but she does just about everything else. And you could do pulmonary too if you put your mind to it. She comes to us as the new editor. Uh, when did you start? Uh, I'm nine months in. Nine months. New. <clears throat> new editor of the flagship journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA. And she's the product of UCSF and SFGH. We take credit for her, and we're very proud of her accomplishments, which are many. She conducts meaningful research on cardiovascular epidemiology and public health, and is a recognized expert in advancing health equity and reducing health disparities. She continues to travel back and forth from Chicago to her home, which is still in San Francisco, and so we are fortunate to have caught her on her trip back. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you uh, to the organizers for this really lovely invitation. Um, and also thanks for reminding people I'm not a pulmonologist. Um, uh, um, I am, though, uh, um, one of the great gifts uh, that uh, Dr. Murray gave to all of us was attending in July. So I realize uh, in talking to many of you that you have the same experience as me, that starting my uh, clinical clerkships was starting with Dr. Murray. So he was my attending during my first first uh, rotation, my first month as an intern, um, and, and it's been really wonderful to hear all of the talks uh, today. So um, uh, I learned in preparation for this uh, symposium uh, of the role Dr. Murray had in shaping the journal uh, that have been so important in pulmonary, and also not only in shaping and growing a very strong journal for the American Thoracic Society, but also of having the vision 
to think about how journals should grow and his role in really setting the standards internationally. And it's in that lens that I want to talk about sort of my time here and, and what I think are the issues that will face uh, medical journals and are facing them uh, right now. So uh, that's um, uh, the lens through which I am seeing this. And um, the other lens that I'm taking, of course, is uh, my role as uh, the editor-in-chief of JAMA. So this is a little bit about uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA, 140 years old, um, the most widely circulated medical journal um, in the world, and, uh, and some of the stats here. As it turns out, I'm not only the editor-in-chief of JAMA, I'm also the editor-in-chief chief of the JAMA Network. JAMA is one of 13 journals of the JAMA Network. Um, and uh, we benefit from a, um, the same publisher, an independent publisher, the same sort of sets of standards uh, uh, that help all of these journals to be as strong as they can be. Each of these journals have their own editors in chief. Three of them are from UCSF. Um, uh, so uh, UCSF quite well represented in the JAMA Network. Um, and that's, uh, that is, where we are now. Now, it turns out that I took on this role never having been an editor, not an associate editor, not a baby editor, not a deputy editor, not at all. And I took on this role because I think for many of us, we had the experience during the pandemic that the pandemic was a disruptive time. Um, and for me, it was a time uh, that uh, really gave me uh, much more of an insight into how important it was to have scientific information quickly, how important it was to have it disseminated broadly. And, um, and although we did much of that very well in the US, um, we also saw gaps in that. We didn't always have the right types of scientific information we needed uh, to answer the questions we had clinically. When we did have information, it wasn't always disseminated as broadly as it could possibly be to have a real impact on the care of all of the patients who needed uh, the most uh, important uh, timely information. And we also saw as a consequence of the pandemic, well, not as a consequence, but alongside the pandemic, um, a, a rising distrust of science sort of for the lay public and even in, within our uh, medical communities, sort of uh, not sure what we could trust and, um, and and, uh, and that, that was a, a, an important feature, I think, as well. And so when the opportunity to, uh, to take on this role came about, it seemed uh, that journals really sit at that nexus of, uh, of both understanding uh, and vetting scientific content, making sure it's broadly distributed, and then thinking about the many audiences uh, that scientific content is distributed to. It just seemed like a really great opportunity, and, um, and that is, uh, that's why I took this on, and I'm nine months in. Now, you know this is a, this is a time we're dealing with lots of uh, trends and pressures in how we consume our information um, in the things that challenge us clinically and in the academic setting. And all of this is the landscape on which medical publishing currently exists. And it's these many trends that I think have informed the way I've tried to think about this role. As it turns out, since I have, I like to say to my staff, I've spent most of my life trying to get into JAMA and not, you know, not knowing anything about JAMA. Um, I, it turns out having the perspective of an author and having the perspective of a reader is a pretty good perspective to take when you go into a very strong organization uh, that's in a very dynamic time and thinking about, well, what type of decisions do we have to make in order to be relevant to the trends that are facing medical journals at this time? So what I'd want to argue, there are three big issues facing medical journals, and again, this is from my vantage point. The first is that we do have a need for rapid and broad dissemination of scientific findings. Um, and uh, the pandemic made this crystal clear. We also have um, issues that we are facing about mistrust in science and mistrust about science. And um, the journals are a part of a broad biomedical ecosystem 
And many different parts of this biomedical ecosystem are questioning the things that have been the lifeblood of these parts of the ecosystem, whether it's the academic, our scientific enterprise, or our medical enterprise. And in that way, journals are also part of this reevaluation process. So let's just take each of these three in sequence. So uh, the broad and rapid dissemination of scientific findings I think is one of the most important issues. The subtext here is what traditional journals have learned about preprints and open access. So I think before the pandemic, uh, you would, if you went to many of the medical journals, they would tell you why preprints are a disaster, why they are not, there's no business model for them to stay, uh, why we should all be suspicious of them. And what we learned quickly during the pandemic is that preprints, there was lots of great scientific content uh, that was going up quickly on preprint servers. And I really think that they showed that they are here to stay and they have an important role to play in uh, the uh, transmission of knowledge uh, as we're talking about here today. I think what the future role of preprint servers is going to be remains to be seen. There's something about the pandemic when everybody, the brightest minds in the universe are home, uh, focused on their computer to comment on the latest science is not quite the environment that we all live in in steady state in all of the fields that we're in. So whether the future of preprints looks exactly the same as they really did in their heyday during the pandemic, I'm not exactly sure. The other big trend here is in open access. And really, this is a movement to say that if we have all this great information, does it seem fair to hide it behind the paywalls that are the subscriptions? Uh, that is the way that we make our money to keep, to keep going. And of course, it makes sense that we would like to have scientific findings out in the world um, as broadly and as openly as possible. The, of course, flip side of open access, the way it has come to evolve, um, is that it has raised the barrier for authors to publish because the fees for publishing are now on the backs of authors. So each of these are important trends um, that, ha that have shaken up the traditional journals. And I think when, when I started at, at JAMA, um, I think the important thing for me is not to demonize either of these trends, but rather to understand what really is the spirit behind them. And the spirit behind them is what's true for science, is that it's good to have information quickly, and it is good to have it broadly disseminated. Um, but it is also good to have the process that traditional journals have had, which is the peer and editorial review process to provide some vetting of the scientific content. But if we take the spirit of that what preprints and open access have told us is how we've decided at JAMA to basically adapt in this environment. And so the first is to think about how we can do this more quickly. We've done many things uh, during, the, uh, during the first months that I started at JAMA to make sure that we can be as, uh, as uh, we're, we're, that we can um, allow uh, the manuscripts that are submitted to us to make it through our process as quickly as possible. We had become a little bit slow over time, and that I don't think is in the spirit of the time that we're in right now. We also, at the um, just about a week and uh, last month, uh, uh, relaunched JAMA Express, which is uh, a pathway whereby a manuscript can go from submission. Uh, if it's accepted in this pathway to publication within four weeks. And this is for journal, for articles that are late breakers at scientific conferences, um, as well as uh, those topics of uh, timely clinical or public health relevance. And uh, I think this is reflecting that um, what I hear from my colleagues um, is that uh, the traditional journals just have to be faster uh, because they have to keep pace with the push that these other trends are, are are, uh, are putting in our way. Um, right away from the week we launched JAMA Express, we received this publication um, that was published then a month later, so published last week. Um, and this is um, uh, this multi-drug resistant pseudomonas uh, that is being linked to artificial tear use. We published this on the same day that the CDC published these two uh, reports on the same day that the CDC uh, basically published two deaths already from uh, this multi-drug resistant pseudomonas uh, that um, is in artificial tears that are um, found over the counter. 
Um, of course, most of what we do is publish uh, randomized controlled trials that are being released at, timed with a clinical meeting. Uh, this is, was uh, presented in Europe uh, just last month, and I like to highlight this because it allows me to highlight that we have a special section at JAMA uh, devoted to caring for the critically ill patient. And so uh, the articles in critical care have been uh, a really important uh, part of the history of JAMA and the current priorities at JAMA, and it was great to see some of those articles featured earlier by ta in talks that we heard earlier. Um, we also think it's important to put the right context around articles and to do those in as, a timely fashion as well. So these were published simultaneous to another European meeting um, at, in October, and you see um, the, the context around these um, articles as well. So um, that's about timely access. We also want to think about broad access. And, um, and so at the end of last year, uh, JAMA and the entire network announced uh, that we would allow authors on uh, the day that we publish the version of record in JAMA or any of our JAMA network journals, authors can basically deposit their author accepted manuscript in a public repository at the same time. This is our, um, this is what we're calling public access. We are the first medical journal, sets of medical journals to take this step. What this means is that the science, the numbers, the analysis that's in your papers can be available on these public repositories in a publicly accessible way. Um, we know that there's value to what we do as journals um, and, uh, and what the subscription and uh, um, is that it does have value. Um, that value has to do with all of the many ways in which we um, augment the work that's done here, the many ways in which we track when there are retractions or corrections to that work. Um, but the very point of accessible findings is something that we think we have to take a lead on. This policy we adopted in December, and last month the NIH announced that this will uh, likely be the policy that they will have for all NIH-funded research, and I think will really change the way we, um, we think about this. It's still open for public comment, and you should all comment on what you think about this. This option is often called green open access. It's distinct from from open access where the author is paying. This, there's no money involved here. Um, and I think one of the things we highlighted in the editorial, while open access is really focused on equitable access to read, I think not as much has been talked about equitable access to publish and the ways in which publication fees actually stand in the way of many early career investigators, investigators at smaller institutions, uh, puts up barriers to them publishing in uh, in top journals. So let's talk a little bit about um, the distrust uh, that people might have in what's published in our journals, as well as, um, and we see this in sort of two forms. So one is uh, the confidence we want to have in the science that's published. And you know the NIH has taken a lot of stands on these in terms of rigor and reproducibility. Um, uh, we have supported the moves of the NIH in terms of supporting data sharing and reproducibility in science. This is an editorial from the, the end of the year, um, uh, trying to make it easier for authors to comply with the NIH's uh, data, st data sharing um, mandates. Um, we do not have a mandate that requires data sharing uh, uh, as a requirement for publication, in part because a lot in this field, I think, is, is, is evolving. And um, at this point, while we agree with the stance of the NIH, I think how we do this as a uh, 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 global scientist scientific community, how we make data available, how we make it accessible, how we support reproducibility, I think is still evolving how that happens and uh, we will continue to evolve with that process. We also know that we have to keep pace, so it's uh, um, uh, part of the trust that um, uh, that happens in what's on our pages has to do with understanding um, where new technologies might uh, disrupt our usual process that we have for putting trust in the journal. So you have probably all heard about ChatGPT. Um, uh, as it turns out, even though we published this um, just probably two, one or two weeks after ChatGPT was 
was launched. At this point, ChatGPT was already indexed in PubMed, I think four times as an author for articles. Um, so we took a stance here that basically says, um, it's not an anti-chat -chat GPT stance. It basically says this is a tool. If you use this tool, you should tell us that you've used this tool. Uh, it says chat GPT cannot be an author, um, that uh, an author relies on being able to state um, your responsibility for what is in the pages that you've submitted to us. Only humans can be authors. Um, it does have the caution that uh, chat GPT oftentimes gives authoritative sounding um, uh, language in response to the queries, um, and that these, uh, as, as has have been shown, are oftentimes wrong or uh, misleading or biased. This is uh, something that will continue to challenge our field um, in, in sort of interesting ways, and we think that this is uh, the right stance right now. And just to tie back to the um, International Committee of the Journal of Medical Edu um, Editors, we just met uh, this past week, and uh, they have decided to adopt this standard that, that we can came out with. And this is really the international uh, uh, governing body. They've set the guidance that many of the journals um, worldwide adopt. And it was great to see uh, Dr. Murray's legacy in, in uh, setting up the Vancouver standards and then uh, this um, leading to now what is the ICMJE. Uh, so there's misinformation in science. Do you trust what are on the pages of JAMA or any other journal. And then there's also the bigger issue, in my view, misinformation about science, the fact that there is a rising distrust in science and, um, and how do we, what role do we in medical journals uh, play um, in this era. Um, I had the good fortune of interviewing uh, Dr. Fauci when he retired, um, and I asked him about misinformation and disinformation, and he said, you just have to stick to the science. You cannot deviate from it. You keep saying it. You say it over and over again, and you stick to the science. And there, there is something nice and simple about that, and I, I, I think that is something all of us have to do more of. Um, we, uh, in February, published a trial of higher dose ivermectin uh, for treatment of COVID-19. No, ivermectin does not work for treatment of COVID-19. Um, but when you publish a trial at this point in the pandemic on ivermectin for treatment of COVID-19, you're met with one of two responses. Why in the world do we need another trial of ivermectin for COVID-19? Or don't you know all these trials are so flawed? And why in the world would you publish another flawed trial that doesn't show why ivermectin would work. Um, we thought this one was important to publish because one of the, the um, uh, prevailing myths out there on ivermectin is that it just hasn't been tested at a high enough dose or for a long enough duration, and that is what these trialists uh, chose to do. Uh, this trial was uh, accompanied by an editorial on um, the ethics of doing uh, research um, of uh, involving patients' time, of involving researchers' time for areas of uncertainty that are really driven by these pockets of, of misinformation and what is the ethics, uh, where is there clinical equipoise. And then we published an editor's note that basically said, we should not um, uh, delude ourselves into thinking that, um, that this is just about closing some knowledge gap related to the use of ivermectin. That um, us publishing this trial is not going to change the minds of the people who are using ivermectin, and that all of us involved in communication about science have to do more than just publishing these papers, have to do more in partnership to make sure uh, that we are addressing some of the issues related to science communication communication here. Those really um, involve promoting accurate scientific information. That's something that all of our journals do. Um, uh, but I think we have to do more to continue to do that in multiple types of ways uh, so that the information is out there in multiple forms. Um, uh, to uh, work a little bit more in this area, 
uh, that we've started to think more about, which is uh, pre-bunking, sort of giving more clinicians the tools that they need to have uh, science-based conversations with patients. So we've been thinking a little bit more about these types of tools. Um, and then I think probably one of the hardest here is debunking false information, uh, which is another category of ways to approach misinformation. This is, of course, hard because while information and science is evolving, um, one doesn't want to, uh, to say that something is settled science before it's settled science. Um, but I think the role of journals as information is evolving and saying when science really is settled is, is sort of an interesting one that we're all uh, wrestling with at this time. So the last area that I would just touch on briefly is sort of engaging in the broader conversation about the issues that are facing science and medicine. It was great to see that one of the things that Dr. Murray did with the journal was to really uh, not just publish more science, which we're uh, going to be doing at JAMA, but also publishing more about the context uh, uh, for scientific findings or the, the things that are important in a particular field. Um, and that's what we think has also been really important for us at JAMA and the JAMA Network. Work. Um, so these are just a few of the viewpoints that have been published in the past month. Um, this is really about talking, AI is of course disruptive, uh, disrupting both how we think about medical publishing, but also how we think about the tools that are going to be important for, um, for the care of patients. Um, this is a really great editorial talking about some of the, the legal landscapes in, in this regard, uh, and uh, was really uh, nice and well received and, and timely. Uh, we're talking about other issues uh, facing uh, academic medicine. This is on the medical school rankings, um, bad for health and, and the profession. Um, and then um, talking about the large, as uh, Dr. Berwick calls it, the existential threat of greed in US healthcare. This is probably one of our most popular viewpoints in the past month. Um, so publishing um, opinion pieces about the, these broader issues that are facing science and medicine, I think is one of the important roles that journals play play in addition to the science that they publish. Um, just to bring this back to where the opportunities and threats are for journal and medical publishing, this is a viewpoint that was published, written by uh, Johnny Unides at Stanford, talking about the rapid growth of mega journals. I highlight this one because it's very popular right now, but also uh, because it, it sort of sits at this interesting intersection of the pressure to publish in academic settings meets the open access mandate that you actually make more money as a journal if you're an open access journal each time an author has an accepted manuscript. And what that's meant is that, uh, that we've had these very, these rise of these, these journals that publish an extraordinary amount of content because the academic model is meeting the business model in a way that, um, that uh, as is argued here, sometimes there might be opportunities but there are also a lot of uh, challenges and, and threats here. A mega journal here is defined as journals that publish more than 3,000 papers a year. You can see here on this list some of these journals publish more than 15,000 uh, a year. Um, a, some of, many of these journals are really high quality journals. Um, uh, many of them even as this article was being published, were actually um, taken down by Web of Science and had their impact factors removed and they were being regarded as predatory journals. But this is a, a, a clear aspect of the ways in which the broader discussions about open access and then the pressures in academia are giving rise to lots of things that are very disruptive um, uh, in the medical uh, publishing uh, arena itself. Um, we want to be part of these conversations, and so uh, one of the ways we will do this is to, uh, is we think our role as a journal is to actually host the types of conversations about the pieces that are, are rapidly changing, in this case to try to understand those changes that are being spurred by what is often the critique of our current clinical trials enterprise, that it's a little bit slow, it's a little bit expensive, and it doesn't often give you the questions you need as a clinician. We'll be hosting this in person in Chicago um, at, uh, in October 10th and 11th, um, and we'll be using more of our pages to talk about these issues that are shaping our medical and, and scientific enterprise. 
So I really appreciate the, the opportunity to talk here today, um, but mostly to learn about uh, uh, John's vision as it relates to medical publishing. I think my takeaway and what I have read and what I have tried to think about in my own role, relatively new in this role, I was really struck by how much John was so focused and strategic in building the journal that he obviously um, uh, was very important to him, but also how he had a very clear vision for where the whole field of publishing was going um, and uh, played this important role in the um, international space as well. And so it is a very dynamic time and I think it will need all of us thinking more in this way. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Phil. Uh, I am certainly honored uh, to make a presentation at this symposium honoring John Murray. And I really want to thank both Courtney and Phil for giving me the opportunity to, to speak here. I'm also particularly pleased uh, to return to San Francisco, which, as Phil said, is the place where I did my residency training uh, here at UCSF. So in looking back at my time at uh, UCSF, which was from 1973 until 1975, I decided to pull and scan the House staff group photos that I had saved. And on the left is a photo from the VA. And in the front row, uh, you can see Marv Schlesinger, who was department chair at the VA at that time. Uh, here I am at the back row uh, with uh, a lot longer hair and a lot darker hair uh, at that time. I'll also point out a couple of luminaries. There's uh, Lee Goldman, uh, one of my co-interns, co-residents, who later became chair of the department. Uh, here is Sharon Rounds, a uh, distinguished pulmonologist at, at Brown, who uh, also became president of the American Thoracic Society. Uh, the right photo is from Moffitt, and there is Holly Smith, a uh, department chair standing in the back row, and I think here I am again uh, with the same haircut. Uh, unfortunately, I do not have a similar picture uh, from my time at San Francisco General. At that time, uh, Moffitt and San Francisco General had separate internships uh, and a joint residency program, and I was one of the Moffitt uh, interns. And once we were combined as residents, we spent four months at San Francisco General, but only some of us were assigned to the chess service uh, at, at San Francisco General. And unfortunately, this, the chess service was not one of my uh, rotations, so I didn't have the opportunity to work directly uh, with John Murray, though my fellow residents who rotated uh, on the chess service spoke in absolutely glowing terms uh, about their experience there, and particularly about the teaching that they received from both John and also certainly from Phil Hopewell. Uh, however, I fortunately did have the opportunity to learn pulmonary physiology indirectly uh, from Dr. Murray through his wonderful textbook, The Normal Lung. It was published in 1976 uh, when I was a clinical associate in the pulmonary branch at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, and it very much served as the foundation uh, for my learning pulmonary physiology. Uh, the book has a prominent place on my bookshelf, and I still refer to it uh, when I want a refresher about certain aspects of pulmonary physiology. Uh, these are photos uh, of my book, and as you can see from the extent of my underlying on the right, very obsessive compulsive, I valued every word that, uh, that Dr. Murray wrote. Moving on to my assignment for this presentation, uh, I've been asked to talk about the pulmonologist intensivist of the future, competencies and training. Uh, I figured there were two possible ways to approach this topic, either trying to predict the future or trying to propose what the future should look like. I can think of three professions where predicting the future is at the core of their activities, uh, fortune tellers, financial advisors, and meteorologists. Uh, obviously, I don't fall into any of those categories. On the other hand, proposing the future is an activity that anyone can participate in, and as I prepared this talk, I decided I would uh, blur the distinction between predicting and proposing the future and instead focus on how the primary determinants or factors affecting training are evolving and how they will, uh, are or will be affecting training over time. 
However, before covering these factors, I would like to provide a little historical perspective uh, to review some major themes that have been prominent in pulmonary medicine over more than a century and have consequently had a major impact on training. So let's go back in time to trace some of these areas. Um, Koch's identification of the tubercle bacillus in 1882, followed by Rankin's discovery of x-rays in 1895, helped define the pulmonary physician around that time as a TB doctor. Uh, the American Thoracic Society was founded in 1905 as the American Sanatorium Society, and what we now call the Blue Journal started in 1917 as the American Review of Tuberculosis. The people we now call pulmonologists were primarily TB physicians for many years. But with the advent of anti-tuberculous therapy and the closure of sanatoria, there was an evolution of pulmonary medicine to involve diagnosis and management of a broader spectrum of lung diseases. Over time, uh, the prominence of tuberculosis as the focus of the pulmonary physician was supplanted by the importance of smoking-related diseases. The landmark Surgeon General's report in 1964 emphasized the relationship between smoking and lung cancer, as well as its relationship with non-malignant disorders, especially COPD and heart disease. And unlike TB, which diminished significantly as part of the portfolio of diseases managed by the pulmonary physician, smoking-related dis disorders have continued to be a major component of the pulmonary clinician's practice and an important part of pulmonary training. Of course, how the lung works, its mechanics, as well as its ability to affect gas exchange, became a cornerstone of pulmonary training as our understanding of pulmonary physiology blossomed. Much of this research took place starting in the middle of the 20th century through the work of such eminent physiologists as Julius Comro, Jerry Mead, Peter Macklem, and John West. This multi-volume uh, treatise, uh, the one in yellow, uh, on the respiratory system, which was published by the American Physiological Society over a span of more than 20 years as part of the Handbook of Physiology, became a critical part of the library of the academic pulmonary physician who was an aficionado of pulmonary physiology. For those of us like myself who found much of this material in, in these volumes to be above our head, it was invaluable to have these concepts explained in more understandable terms by two distinguished UCSF faculty. First by Julius Comro in his book Physiology of Respiration published in 1965 and later uh, by John Murray in his book The Normal Lung which was published in 1976 and which I already showed you. Perhaps the next advance that revolutionized the toolkit of the pulmonary physician was the development of the fiber optic bron bronchoscope by Akita in Japan in 1967. This procedure subsequently became and continues to be one of the cornerstones of pulmonary fellowship training. And with the transition to digital rather than fiber optic technology and the development of various diagnostic and therapeutic modalities that can now be applied through flexible bronchoscopes, a whole new sub subspecialty of interventional pulmonology has been born. I would be remiss if I uh, did not include what has happened on the critical care side of what we do. The need to support patients with respiratory failure in ICUs made it natural for pulmonary physicians to direct the management of these patients and for trainees to become competent in the use of mechanical ventilation. And I remember way back as a medical student learning about the early po uh, positive pressure ventilators, uh, the Bird Mark 7 and the Bennett series of pressure controlled ventilators. Uh, of course, they were ultimately replaced uh, by further generations of ventilators that were volume controlled and allowed much more customization of delivery modes and patterns. Emerging infectious diseases affecting the lungs became a major part of the training and clinical experience of pulmonologists, in a sense taking over what TB had been for pulmonologists several decades earlier. Starting in 1981, pulmonary trainees and practicing clinicians, particularly in cities such as this one, were inundated with patients infected with HIV and the opportunistic respiratory pathogens resulting from their immunodeficiency, particularly pneumocystis. And of course, nearly 40 years later, the novel coronavirus 
initially identified in, in, in China, uh, evolved into a worldwide pandemic with extraordinary numbers of individuals who developed pneumonia with or without respiratory failure, leading to more than 100 million cases and more than 1 million deaths in the U.S. alone. Finally, in the 21st century, uh, besides emerging infectious diseases like COVID, the cutting edge of pulmonary medicine has become the application of molecular biology and other basic science disciplines to the diagnosis and treatment of lung disease. Two important examples are the uh, development of CFTR potentiators, which have revolutionized the management of cystic fibrosis, and the use of therapy for lung cancer targeted toward modifying the effect of driver mutations or enhancing immune responses to the, to the tumor. So with that historical background of how various factors and advances have affected pulmonary and critical care practice, as well as training over more than a century, I want to shift to a discussion of the future of our discipline. In order to do so, I thought it would be best to start by identifying potential factors that are likely to affect future training models. Those factors are listed on this slide and include ultimate career pathways open to trainees, what do patients need, advances in medical knowledge and care, how the learning environment is evolving, how the care environment is evolving, how the disease burden is evolving, and finally, what may be happening over time in the regulatory environment for training. And I'll try to take a look at each of these factors uh, in turn. So there are a number of different paths that one can follow after a fellowship in pulmonary and critical care medicine. For example, there can be a pulmonary medicine emphasis or a critical care medicine emphasis. The clinician can be a pulmonary specialist without an additional disease focus or can have special expertise in a particular subgroup of pulmonary disorders, such as interstitial lung disease or pulmonary vascular disease. The pulmonary physician can have general procedural skills, particularly in bronchoscopy, or can have specialized bronchoscopic skills that often fall under the category of interventional pulmonology. The setting can be different. For example, practice in an academic setting versus a non-academic setting, or practice in a high-density, more urban medical area versus a low-density, more rural medical care area. One can obviously have more of an inpatient focus versus an outpatient focus. And finally, since it's not an either-or situation, I listed separately the balance of professional activities that one chooses relating to clinical care, research, training, and administration. So what does this mean for the future? I think there will, or at least should be, an increasing ability to customize one's training based on interests and ultimate practice settings or activities. This could mean more formalized development of tracks within training programs, such as general clinical, general clinical but with an area of special interest or expertise, pulmonary versus critical care emphasis, a clinician educator track, a clinician researcher track, a procedural track, and potentially other tracks that I haven't thought of. And certainly some programs have started already with these types of, uh, of distinctions. The next factor I would like to explore that affects the future clinician and his or her training involves looking at what patients need, uh, both now and in the future. Each of these bullet points is applicable to all practicing physicians, not just pulmonologists or critical care docs. I believe that care needs to be increasingly patient and family-centered. This includes understanding the impact of the medical issues and their treatment on the patient's daily life, and particularly recognizing that care should be a partnership between the clinical team and the patient family unit. Decisions about care, especially treatment options, need to be shared and made jointly by the patient and the clinician with whatever family input is desired by the patient. We unfortunately often don't understand or consider the financial implications of care to either the individual patient or to system-wide healthcare costs. We therefore need to understand and practice high-value cost-conscious care, always balancing potential benefits with both risks and costs. And finally, we need to understand and consider the role of socioeconomic determinants of disease and the physician's role in potentially addressing those determinants. The next factor uh, 
shaping future training relates to advances in medical knowledge and the evolution of diagnostic and therapeutic approaches. These fall under a number of categories that I have bulleted on this slide. Uh, molecular and immunologic mechanisms underlying disease pathophysiology and therapeutic approaches, the role of genetic determinants of disease and the potential for gene modification or therapy, increasing use of point-of-care ultrasound, future advances in procedural techniques such as bronchoscopic techniques, and advances in supporting gas exchange and treating respiratory failure. For example, we can expect to see increasing use of CRISPR for gene editing and gene therapy. It's only a matter of time before we see this technology applied to one or more groups of our patients with a genetic component to their lung disease. I think we'll be seeing increasing use of point-of-care ultrasound. Here's an article from the New Yorker in January of this year raising the question of whether ultrasound could replace the stethoscope. And although I don't think, uh, necessarily think it will replace the stethoscope, I do, do believe it will be an increasingly useful and used part of our armamentarium for patients with lung disease as well as in the ICU setting. This is certainly an area where I consider myself to be a dinosaur, having observed the increasing use of point-of-care ultrasound without ever been having ever been trained in this technique. The next factor affecting training is the evolution of the learning environment. During the COVID pandemic, many educational activities, particularly lectures and conferences, shifted to a virtual environment. What I think we did not anticipate is that this shift has in many circumstances not gone away as the pandemic has abated. Clinicians and trainees have gotten used to participating in the virtual environment for educational activities and have recognized some advantages over the need to attend these activities in person, even though there are some disadvantages. And during the past month or two, as has been said before, we've been increasingly bombarded with news reports about artificial intelligence or AI, including potential applications in healthcare. I think the jury is still out about what these applications might be, but I'm quite confident that we will see increasing use of AI in the clinical setting and in the not so distant future. We need to be prepared for this and understand both the use and the limitations of AI in the care we provide to our patients. And it's certainly the trainee, something that trainees are going to have to understand well. I now want to explore how evolution of the care environment is currently and will increasingly be affecting the care we provide and how we train the next generation of pulmonologists. There continues to be a shift from inpatient to outpatient care whenever possible, uh, with both acute problems such as thromboembolic disease and with acute exacerbations of chronic diseases such as COPD. And in all disciplines of medicine, there have been increasing productivity requirements. This means developing greater efficiency as well as possibly altering what an episode of care looks like, both for us as practicing physicians and for our trainees. And finally, just as we have seen a movement of many educational activities to the virtual environment, COVID has led to increasing utilization of virtual rather than inpatient, uh, in-person care. There are clearly some problems with virtual care, particularly the inability to directly examine patients, but there are also some benefits, such as patients not needing to travel for their care. An evolution of the disease burden, some predictable and some unpredictable, will undoubtedly affect the future pulmonologist and his or her training. The predictable component is that we will continue to see, diagnose, and treat greater numbers of patients with complications of both traditional and new cutting-edge types of medical management, including chemotherapy, immunotherapy, targeted biologic agents, and gene therapy. What is an unpredictable area includes emerging infectious respiratory diseases. We saw this in the 1980s with AIDS and in the past few years with COVID, and we will likely have future but as yet unknown epidemics or pandemics. As I will show in the next slide, the importance of infectious disease is complicated by a potential shortage of infectious disease physicians. So this slide compares what has been happening in the fellowship match for ID on the left, compared with pulmonary and critical care medicine on the right. 
And the bars at the top of each graph show how many programs, that is training programs, filled or did not fill their positions annually from 2018 to 2022. And the bars at the bottom show the number of training positions that were filled or unfilled. The dark blue bars show the number of available programs or positions. The lighter blue bars indicate programs or positions filled and the red bars show unfilled programs or positions. And as you can see, there is a dramatic difference between what is happening in ID on the left versus pulmonary and critical care on the right. In ID, a significant number of programs and positions are unfilled compared with what is happening in pulmonary and critical care, where virtually all the fellowship programs and positions are filled. I think this means that pulmonary and critical care physicians will need to be particularly well trained to deal with both traditional and new or emerging infections that affect the respiratory system. The final area that I want to cover is the regulatory environment, which obviously has an enormous impact on shaping fellowship training programs. The two relevant regulatory organizations are the American Board of Internal Medicine, or ABIM, uh, which is responsible for certifying internal medicine specialists and subspecialists, and the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education, or ACGME, which is responsible for accrediting training programs through specialty-specific review committees. There's obviously a close relationship and integration between the regulations that are developed by these two bodies, as there must be consistent guidelines for the requirements placed on training programs and the expectations that are placed on trainees. So here are the general requirements for combined pulmonary and critical care training, as well as either just pulmonary or just critical care alone. For combined pulmonary and critical care, the program, as you know, is three years with at least 18 months in clinical training. For either just pulmonary or critical care, the duration is two years with at least 12 months in clinical training. Some residents also come to fellowship training through a subspecialty research pathway during their residency where they are able to complete internal medicine residency in two rather than three years, but they then have a commitment of at least three years of research training. The ABIM also specifies a variety of procedural requirements for each of the training pathways. I've listed on this slide the procedural requirements for combined pulmonary and critical care training. Uh, but I won't go through them in, in detail. You're familiar with most of these. An important component of training, whether it be residency training or fellowship training, is assessment of the trainee's competency. The ACGME has specified six core competencies which are listed on this slide. There are other models that have been used, such as milestones, which outline various steps along the acquisition of competencies, Another simple model, the KSA model, uh, separates the competencies in the categories of knowledge, skills, and attitudes. And finally, there has been interest in grouping some of the individual competency components into what are called entrustable professional activities, or EPAs. This slide has an example of some of the EPAs for both pulmonary medicine and for critical care. These were developed and published several years ago by a working group of the Association of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine Program Directors. Some are very broad, um, uh, such as uh, managing patients, uh, oops, I guess, there we are. Uh, some are very broad, such as managing patients with acute common pulmonary diseases across multiple care settings, while others are somewhat more specific, such as interpreting pulmonary function and cardiopulmonary exercise tests. So how does this information about the regulatory environment inform the shaping of future fellowship training? Of course, it's difficult to predict future changes in certification and accreditation requirements. It's been a number of years uh, since I was on the Internal Medicine Review Committee for the ACGME, so I'm currently out of the loop as far as any changes they may be discussing behind closed doors. So instead of revealing confidential information that I do not have, I'll speculate about some areas that I wouldn't be surprised to see in future changes. Because of the different career pathways uh, that I mentioned earlier, a reasonable question to ask is how much uniformity there should be in training as opposed to customized sub-pathways. 
One related idea is whether sub subspecialties in pulmonary medicine will be formally recognized. Let's, let's look uh, for comparison at, at what has happened in cardiology, where there are now accredited training programs and certifiable sub subspecialties in adult congenital heart disease, advanced heart failure and transplant cardiology, clinical cardiac electrophysiology, and interventional cardiology. The question is, will analogous sub-subspecialties be developed for pulmonary medicine? Another ongoing discussion involves switching from the current time-based model of training, where residents or fellows graduate after a specified period of time, to a competency-based model, where the duration of time is not fixed. Instead, trainees graduate from the program when they have developed all the requisite competencies for independent practice. Of course, in addition to logistical changes, the competency-based model means that we need to have a valid me method of assessment and people who are well-trained to provide accurate assessment of the trainees. I also wanted to bring up an important challenge that goes beyond the training environment, which is how to train clinicians who have finished training in new procedures or techniques outside of a fellowship program. And then how does one assess their competence? Ultrasound training is a good example of this type of procedure, where physicians like me were never exposed to ultrasound in a formal training setting. So in conclusion, recognizing that neither I nor anyone else has the knowledge or the ability to accurately predict the future for either training or practice in pulmonary and critical care medicine, I hope I've been able to outline some of the important factors that will be shaping the future reality of training and practice. And in this last slide, I've included a few quotes from distinguished individuals about predicting the future. Of course, probably the most um, famous one that people talk about is, quote, prediction is very difficult, especially if it's about the future. What's amusing is, is trying to figure out who really said that uh, for the first time. And uh, it ranges from Neil Bohr to Mark Twain to, of course, Yogi Berra. The business legend Peter Drucker uh, had a more metaphorical way of saying the same thing. Trying to predict the future is like trying to drive down a country road at night with no lights while looking out the back window. Interestingly, Abe Lincoln had a much more positive and forward-thinking way uh, about predicting the future when he said the best way to predict the future is to create it. Um, I think that Lincoln stated beautifully the responsibility of pulmonary and critical care physicians, particularly those who are in academic and leadership uh, positions and the organizations that represent us, such as the ATS, to continually be assessing the environment of medicine and patient care so that we can shape the future in a way that will best serve our patients in the profession. I'm confident that John Murray, as a renowned leader and shaper our, of our discipline and its practitioners, would feel the same way. So, thank you very much. Our next speaker is uh, Richard Vanzel Smith, who is a professor of uh, pulmonary critical care medicine at the University of Cape Town, and who works at a hospital whose name I can't begin to pronounce. I have to have Richard pronounce it for us. Um, Richard has been very involved in uh, various American Thoracic Society activities um, and also has a, a very broad perspective on the global respiratory uh, problems of the world, uh, global lung health. So, Richard. Well, good afternoon and, and yeah, thank you to Phil and, and Courtney for inviting me and to the family. It really is an honor to, to be here. Um, and the 20 hours of flying did not deter me in any way to, to, come, and, to come and join you. Um, so the topic that Phil's given me of global lung health, the comprehensive view, I've kind of changed because that probably is an entire day lecture. Um, and so I've rephrased it to we all matter. And I'm going to be provocative, I think. I'm going to be pointed at some points. I hope I'm not going to be offensive at any point. Um, but to try and cover this issue of, of global lung health. So just some conflicts of interest, and I do have conflicts of interest in this particular talk. Uh, I am African, 
I'm co-chair of the American Thoracic Society International Health Committee, not the ATS Global Health Committee, and I'm going to come back to that. Um, I have received funding from the US. Um, I have a, a few friends who are old professors, or a few old friends who are professors at UCSF, and I'm not entirely sure how I fit into global lung health, because if global is defined as anything outside of the US, then I do global health, but actually I just do lung health. And so I want to play on that, on that theme um, as I talk through global lung health and tell you a couple of stories and try and weave through the picture of global lung health. So global could be the whole lung, and I often joke, we, we heard about subspecialities in cardiology now. I mean, I still look after both lungs, the left and the right. I'm not that specialized. I do not do pulmonary hypertension, so I guess I'm a parenchymal lung doctor. Um, do you mean global as from birth to death lung? And the pediatricians will tell us that by the time you're an adult, it's all done anyway. And so there's a lot happening early on. Do we mean global as in the whole world's lungs? Do we mean global as what often is the case um, when we in the US talk global health? It means international. Everything outside of the US becomes global, which is not the definition that gets used in many other countries. Um, often the term global lung health or global lung disease is access to all of lung health in any context that you're in. And to some degree, in the inner cities of many places, that is global lung health, that the poorest and the most wealthy have access to all of care that's available would be considered in some contexts global lung health. So with that introduction, I'm going to try and weave my way through a couple of these thoughts. Um, but I want to start with three stories um, to illustrate the importantness of global lung health in terms of the globe itself, and tell you a story about my friend Philip and Jewel, a fairly, a fairy named Together and some blood on fire, which will illustrate the relevance and importance of all of us, and what happens here is important to me there, and what happens there is important to you here. So, my friend Philip, so Philip used to be the marketing um, manager or director for British American Tobacco. And I first met Philip when I was doing some e-cigarette research and he was the marketing director for TWISP, which is one of the biggest e-cigarette companies in South Africa. And Jewel, you will know and love to a great extent in, in the US, Jewel being the, used to be the single biggest uh, e-cigarette company. And so you guys banned Jewel in San Francisco, and the US is taking a very hard line on, on e-cigarette manufacturers, and rightly so. But we in South Africa are now 10 years behind you and potentially going to exceed what you saw. And some of our data in, in Cape Town, in that our, I think you would call them seniors in high school, the last year of high school, anywhere between 30 to 50% of the grade in your senior year are vaping, which is a thousand-fold increase um, from the last 10 years. Now, this is not to blame you for banning Juul. I mean, I think it was a very important thing you did. But it means that e-cigarette companies are looking for new targets, and British American Tobacco and my friend Philip, with one L, um, has company has just bought out TWISP, and these are two excerpts from um, newspapers in South Africa that British American Tobacco are now targeting 70 million African smokers with a TWISP. So as you advance against certain things here, those companies look for markets elsewhere. So what happens in the US is inadvertently important to us. A Tugela named Ferry or Tugela Ferry, you all who are um, in the TV space will understand the play on words here, that Tugela Ferry was the outbreak center for XDR TB. And the reason that you know about it 
is because there were a few very observant doctors in this little mission hospital and one of the world's leading TB research centers just down the road who could type the bugs and then the world knew about XDR-TB. To come back to Kirsten's point about open access, I'm showing you the screen grab of the Lancet paper because I don't actually have access to the Lancet paper on XDR-TB from South Africa because it's a paywall and unless I'm logged in through my university's account, I can't actually access the most important XDR-TB patient paper in my own country. But what's important is this is what happened in South Africa and the TB research is here and um, people like uh, Chuck Daly are very aware of this and spend a lot of time in South Africa with the um, MDR and XDR and that was the, in a sense, the kickstart to actually people realizing that TB actually still is a problem. Um, and this is a paper I found um, just again highlighting the point that XDR may have been discovered in South Africa, um, but it's now global. And then to bring us back to the COVID, I just wanted to mention the issue about Omicron, the African COVID virus that um, South Africans got banned for traveling because we suddenly discovered Omicron. The reason we discovered Omicron was because our guys were looking for it. And then surprise, surprise, actually it had been elsewhere in the world, but because we have a very good research center who was looking for it. We just happened to be the first to do it and it wasn't necessarily our fault um, that the world had Omicron. So what happens in my backyard is important to the rest of the world. And then the last one, and it's, and it's, it's um, I think it's, it's quite remarkable that I'm, I'm using this example here, um, that fire in the blood is a documentary on the fight for antiretroviral drugs. And obviously San Francisco was at the forefront of the, of the AIDS epidemic and pandemic. And the impetus to develop antiretrovirals, South Africa has the dubious distinction of having the largest population of patients on antiretrovirals. But part of that was the fight that you I'm sure will be aware of, of accessing antiretroviral drugs in South Africa based on patent laws, inability to actually provide the drugs to South Africa. A company like Cipla in India was prepared to offer it at a fraction of the cost, but international patent laws um, had prevented that. And so again, we are all very interconnected in, in what we do and, and how we approach um, pulmonary disease. So with that introduction, let me dive dive into the issue of global lung health. And I really want to focus on the whole world's lungs. And I think quite a lot of what I'm going to say would apply, in a sense, to a city like San Francisco, where you have a broad spectrum of poor, marginalized, all the way through to, to wealthy, which to some degree is what we have in um, low- and middle-income countries. And then also the issue of the whole person's lung because again, I think that's increasingly important in terms of our understanding of respiratory disease. Obviously gonna talk about pulmonary tuberculosis, some air pollution, tobacco smoking, and environmental, and try and weave that through into the story. So tuberculosis and tobacco smoking, you don't need to um, look at those diagrams too hard to recognize that the colors kind of overlap when one looks in Africa and Southeast Asia. And I was given this paper, um, which comes from 1918, and now I know that the journal was, was published in 1917, so this must have been one of the first articles in the American Review of Tuberculosis in 1918, asking the question, does tobacco smoke increase the risk for TB? Now, I don't know if he remembers it, but the person who gave me this article was Phil Hopewell. I don't know why Phil had the article, um, but it might have been something from his, from his <laughs> training days, yes. It was a, um, and so in 1918, they looked at the issue of, and this is from the US Army, those are the days before we had p-values, um, so I did the stats for you there, and they concluded that smoking does not increase the risk 
of tuberculosis. And for some reason that I don't understand, in 2007, there were three separate meta-analyses, and I've put Michael Bates's name in full because I didn't realize until I spent some time looking at it that Michael Bates is a UCSF Berkeley um, scholar, that tobacco smoking increases the risk for tuberculosis about twofold. If one then looks at the mechanisms as to why this might be the case, and then this again links me as an African researcher into the US, I um, did my PhD in 2007 and was fortunate enough to get an NIH Fogarty grant and subsequently a CRDF grant to study this. Um, and this was a PhD that was, we had this conversation with Sonia and, and Juliana yesterday, we put together at a tea break on the back of a serviette. And that was the, uh, the PhD plan. Um, and got me linked into ATS. So I was fortunate to be linked into a community as an international doing global lung health uh, in an area that was actually really important at that particular point in time. What is also interesting in this space is that, and we did some work on IGRAs, interferon gamma release assays, looking at the um, detection of latent TB. And I was a hap happened to be at a lab um, with Gila Kaplan at UMDNJ in 2011, and one of the staff, their IGRA, went from negative to positive, which at that point was, this is an outbreak of, of TB, shut the lab down, no one may do any work. And I gave them my paper that said, hang on a second, if you do repeated tests for this test, it wobbles. And they didn't agree with us at that particular point. And subsequent to, to that, we've had several meta-analyses, and now we realize that if you repeat these tests, they wobble. And so a little wobble from negative to positive is what would be expected. But because we were doing them in a country where they were not necessarily uh, designed for, we were able to demonstrate in a sense, to the rest of the world that actually there is this wobble and it now has become accepted that there is a little bit of a wobble on these tests, which is why it's important that we test things in other parts of the world because things may look different depending where you are. Um, I spend a lot of time um, smoking in the laboratory. I always um, have the distinction of being the only one allowed to smoke in the building and getting the NIH to pay for my cigarettes. Um, and we did some work showing the interaction of tobacco smoking and some of the mechanisms, which got me to the ATS a couple of times. It got me linked into other researchers, um, and I moved into the space of air pollution, and I talk about the two Johns and some biomass. I'm going to show you a diagram in a moment um, about all of these interactions, but I extended my work from tobacco into biomass, and at that particular point got into another framework or another network of people. And so biomass, um, and a lot of the work again, done through this institution with, with Kirk Smith, uh, Michael Bates comes up again, looking at the impact of biomass not only on the lungs, but also the heart. Um, and this is um, I'm going to say inverted commas, my, my famous diagram, but s somewhat sheepishly I must acknowledge that we just put biomass at the top there because it looked good. We didn't really think it was that important originally. But this interaction of tobacco smoking, tuberculosis, HIV, and COPD, or whatever it is called these days, becomes really important when you're in a context where you have high exposure to biomass, tobacco smoking, you have high tuberculosis incidence and HIV, which happens in many parts, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. And if you move to Southeast Asia, 
you drop a little bit of the HIV, but you bring up more TV, and then underlying all of this becomes poverty. And so when one looking then at interventions, if biomass is so bad or tobacco is so bad, well, let's just give them clean cook stoves to cook on, or let's just give them nicotine patches to solve their TB, I mean, their, their smoking, because that's what we've shown to work. But if you look at the evidence to be able to overcome this pollution to reduce respiratory disease in these settings, it's actually more difficult than you would think. Top article again from Lancet. Um, I did manage to have downloaded the Lancet respiratory one, um, which is the bottom one. Again, in Guatemala, they were very uh, capable of reducing childhood pneumonia. The Malawi cookstove study was very disappointing in that it wasn't able to reduce childhood infections for multiple reasons. So a good idea that may, we think may work has to be tested in the context of, of where you are. And data from our smoking cessation clinic would tell you that in low middle income settings that smoking is often a social and behavioral issue. Life is difficult. The smoke to cope with life. Just giving you a patch isn't going to solve how difficult your life is. And so the standard approach to smoking cessation doesn't necessarily apply in a global context or in a low middle income country. So if we take that and we put it together in poorer income settings, developing countries, low middle income countries, however we wish to define them, we have multiple potential insults attacking the lung. So smoking obviously varies depending on where you are in a country or in the world. Biomass exposure is obviously a variable. Mining I haven't spoken about, um, but silica exposure um, is an enormous issue in many parts of, of the world. Tuberculosis and the impact of childhood infections on lung disease, HIV, and the whole context of COPD is unfortunately bathed in this issue of poverty. And so when one looks at lung health and interventions, it always has to be looked at in the context of poverty. So something like tuberculosis, for example. Well, as long as we can provide the treatment for you, but there's the cost of not working when you have tuberculosis or the cost of having to pay for your TB drugs as to how many weeks of work comes in. So, I mean, TB drugs are dirt cheap in most places in the world, but the impact of tuberculosis has significant financial implications for families despite the fact that therapy is reasonably cheap. I want to take a, a slight little turn to the left and then come back to this diagram again. Um, and I had this conversation with a pilot who, who flew us over. I don't know why it came up with the Earth is flat, but we did actually talk about the Earth being flat and our long flight here. And to come back to lung function. Now, you will all be aware, or certainly the pulmonologists in the room will all be aware of the famous fletcher pito curve, which I've left in the kind of gray area because we've realized that that isn't entirely what happens. We have the um, Antonison and the, um, it's uh, Copenhagen and um, National Lung Health Study making the point that as you get older, your lung function drops off, but if you smoke, your lung function deteriorates faster, and if you stop smoking, the rate of decline is different. And Gold, which isn't my most favorite organization at the moment, seeing their new strategy was to, to say no LABA ICS for COPD, and that's the only medication available in most parts of the world. But be that as it may, Gold have now recognized that there are different flight paths for patients or people with um, lung disease, and the normal being the top part, you have a normal lung decline, a smoking, and you may or may not develop COPD. And some of the work that's been done um, through the BOLD network, demonstrating in that many parts of the world, you have low lung volume to start with and can develop COPD. 
But I want to suggest to you, and I think for those of you working um, in pulmonology, just think of your own situation in terms of the breadth of uh, individuals that you may be exposed to even in a wealthy country like the US, that the world may be a little bit more curved in low-income settings. So if we take the average developed country dweller, your lung function improves until you're 25 or 35 and then drops off. If you are an average smoker, we know that your lung function is worse and if you stop smoking. So that's kind of a fairly given uh, trajectory. If, however, you are a low lung volume person, much like they've shown in, in Malawi through the Bowles study, you never get to where everybody else gets to. You have low lung volumes, and that's a reduction in both FEV1 and FVC. But what happens if you are poor and malnourished is you never get anywhere near where the rest of your population gets to. And I've um, strayed a little bit into the pre-birth because there's a lot going on now in utero that we never really recognized um, that exposures in utero have significant impact after on. So it's not only what happens when you're born, it's what's happening to your parents when um, you are still in gestation. So there I've just put in, and these are obviously all hypothetical, the poor, malnourished. But what happens if you are poor, malnourished, and you have HIV from childhood and have had TB? I have a cohort now of young adolescents who've now reached uh, 18 or 20 who have mother-to-child transmission from, with HIV, happen to get antiretrovirals at birth, but have had TB several times. So we now have this new group of people who have survived childhood HIV who are now living with chronic lung disease. And then heaven forbid if you are poor, malnourished, living with HIV, had TB and started to smoke, we just don't know what your lung function trajectory is going to be like. So I think this sort of dichotomous normal and low FVC, we need to realize that given all the other potential insults that can happen at childhood, and again, even if it is just being malnourished or um, being impoverished or having had childhood infections, may impact on your lung growth and ultimately what you develop um, as an adult as a chronic respiratory disease. None of these people would get into a COPD trial because they haven't smoked enough. So how we look after this group of individuals who have this multifactorial abnormal lung disease in adulthood, we have zero data on, and we just extrapolate from, from where we are. So if we bring my diagram back and we put poverty back into the middle, um, this little diagram didn't actually make it into the Lancet. Um, Eric Bateman, who's my mentor for many years, drew this diagram and the, the Lancet changed it. But really to understand that from pre-birth, from fetal organogenesis all the way through to elderly, there are these multiple attacks, for want of a better term, on pulmonary health and disease, um, often underlying um, or overlaid by poverty. And if we bring that to today, we add in vaping, we have a pandemic of vaping now in South Africa, 50% of, of high school students vaping, the impact of that on chronic respiratory health. Climate change and energy crisis um, has an impact. Um, COVID-19, we, we spoke a little bit about it earlier, the issue of vaccine inequality and the delayed access of vaccines to many parts of the world had significant impact on, on livelihoods. Even something as far away from Cape Town or South Africa as the Russia-Ukraine war has impact on global food security and malnourishment and potential impact on long-term lung health. And then the big issue, which I haven't really addressed to this point, is access to medication. So I made the point about gold saying that a LABA ICS should not be used in COPD, which is fine if you have other drugs. 
but in most low middle income countries, you have little access to inhaled therapy. If you do have anything, you have a LABA ICS because that's helpful for asthma. And a statement like that to say no LABA ICS for COPD, where most of the world's population is relying on it, um, I think demonstrates a little lack of insight as to actually what's happening um, on the ground. So although it may look like a depressing place to work, um, we love what we do and we, um, I think, do important work. And I think what's important is to, to recognize that we're all interlinked. And to summarize that, we can't solve the world's poverty, um, but we can be more economically just, and we've spoken about that today already. Um, we can't solve every problem, but making billions of COVID vaccines or TB drugs, maybe we should reassess how much money should be made of these products when the world is crying out for them. We can't gag all politicians, and I know some of you would like to gag yours, but what your politicians say does impact the rest of us uh, in the rest of the world, and I think we can advocate for all humans. We can't pay for the whole world's research, and there's no, there's no um, imperative that the US should be paying for everybody's research. But I think it's, and I've been the benefit of it, which is why I've, I've weaved my story into this, is that funding, and many of you have international collaborators, that that collaboration across is critically important, not only just that we want your US dollars, but actually that the work we do is important to our context, but actually the work that we do is important to you as well. Um, and that continuing um, collaborative work, and the ATS has been very supportive in that. And so and many of you, as I said, are in that space and already doing it. But I think it's important to realize that the world is a lot smaller than we think. To my friend John, who drives a lovely electric car. We can't all drive electric cars, but we can leverage the intervention for the good for all, and we need to, I think, be more generous with our collaborations. And the last comment, and then I'm out of time, is to say we can't save every life, but we can ensure that the whole person and the entire world's lungs are on the agenda. So with that, I'm gonna stop and say thank you. My pleasure to introduce our next speaker and, um, and our ultimate speaker uh, before we have a, a panel discussion, Lynn Schnapp. She is currently chair of the Department of Medicine at the University of Wisconsin, but her path there started from her fellowship training at UCSF in pulmonary. From there, she went to Mount Sinai in New York, then back west to the University of Washington, then to a medical University of South Carolina's division chief, and then up to University of Wisconsin. Did I forget anything? Um, and she was driving from South Carolina to Wisconsin just as the country shut down due to COVID. And through it all, she's continued her research program in the mechanisms of ARDS and lung injury and repair, and she somehow finds time to work tirelessly to improve the representation of women and underrepresented minorities in our field. She's a very active editor for the Maria Nadell's textbook where she reorganized and updated the entire basic science section. Thank you, Lynn. And she has just served as the ATS president, so she knows a lot about professional societies, and she will now educate us. Great. Thank you for the invitation and for organizing this wonderful symposium and for the family for um, helping to support this. It's been such a wonderful reunion to see people um, who have impacted my life uh, in so many positive ways. Um, uh, we have half of my fellowship classes here um, and I haven't seen Dan in, I don't know, where, is Dan still here? Well, he was here. Um, <laughs> I have a picture. He's gone. I was a little worried that Phil was going to introduce me um, because <laughs> the, the, um, I still remember the letter of recommendation that Phil gave me when I finished my fellowship. Uh, it started, to whom it may concern, 
Lynn killed no more than the average number of patients during her fellowship. <laughs> so, yeah, I still got the job. So thank you. Um, okay, let's see. So um, being back in San Francisco really is wonderful. I, my pulmonary career started here, and uh, particularly the people at San Francisco General, as well as the rest of the group at UCSF, was incredible, incredibly impactful for me. Uh, and um, the picture of John Murray is one of my favorites uh, from an ATS meeting. I think it was at the foundation um, benefit, the benefit dinner, when we still had dancing. Um, I will confess, I started my fellowship in 1989. I was 12 years old. Um, and I started my first three months with John Fahey at San Francisco General. Uh, I was terrified of Dr. Murray when I started. I, he struck such an imposing figure, tall, bow tie. The tail of his shirt was always sticking out. Um, and uh, he didn't let you get away with anything. You could not BS him on a patient. Uh, he would call you out. Uh, and I remember one time in the ICU um, with the team, and one of the residents was presenting a patient, and they said, well, the patient didn't have a temperature. Oh. <laughs> that did not go over well with Dr. Murray. Every patient has a temperature. Yes, even a rock has a temperature. Um, and he showed me and taught me the, how important the precision of language is uh, and how to uh, effectively encapsulate what is happening in a patient in a concise way. And I also remember his notes. This is prior to electronic medical records, and you can always, you, you can tell a John Murray note from you know a mile away because he always wrote his notes with his black fountain pen in a beautiful, uh, had beautiful handwriting and you know no more than this long in an ICU patient that tells you everything you needed to know um, and uh, he raised the bar he made me um, a better person a better editor um, taken over for um, working on Murray and Adele uh, so uh, and I've gotten I got to know uh, John, over the years, I became less terrified of him. Uh, <laughs> and actually, uh, he was always very supportive of me and everything I do, and I really appreciate it. And um, as well as everybody at San Francisco General and UCSF, so thank you. So with that, some disclosures. I'm talking about global health. Uh, my research, my world, actually doesn't really focus on global health, um, but I've gain some knowledge uh, through ATS, so a lot of what I'm going to talk to you about is through the lens of the American Thoracic Society. I'm also, my other disclosure is, I don't have a clue of what I'm about to say. Um, must be the imposter syndrome. Nope, just incompetence. I'm going with the imposter syndrome. So bear with me. So as I was reading about that, trying to figure out what to say, I was really struck by this quote from C. Everett Koop, who is um, a former Surgeon General, probably one of the most influential Surgeon Generals in the United States. Healthcare matters to us, uh, to all of us at some of the time. Public health matters to all of us all of the time. And then from that, I asked, well, what is global health? So I did, <laughs> I actually, Ask chat GPT, what is global health? So, and I modified it a bit, but uh, they actually came up with a, a reasonable definition. Global health, the study and practice of promoting health, preventing illness and disease, and improving the overall health and well-being of people worldwide, regardless of their nationality, race, ethnicity, or socioeconomic status generally a multidisciplinary field that includes health professionals, policymakers, researchers, and community leaders from around the world to address health issues that transcend national borders, and also focuses on addressing health disparities, promoting health equity, 
and reducing the burden of disease in low and middle income countries, as well as in marginalized communities within high income countries. And this last statement really resonated with me. Um, you know, this idea that global health doesn't mean you need a passport. Uh, you know, I was in South Carolina. Our infant mortality in South Carolina rivaled that of any lower middle income uh, country. I'm in Wisconsin now. The disparities in, um, in health between uh, black and white for matern uh, maternal health uh, is one of the greatest in the nation and perhaps even the world. So um, there are health disparities throughout. Every country has marginalized communities, um, and we need to focus uh, our efforts in that. Now, the ATS mission, if you read it, to accelerate global innovation in the advancement of respiratory health through multidisciplinary collaboration, education, and advocacy. Our mission really speaks to what global health is. And so there is significant overlap between uh, our medical professional societies and global health. So what are the opportunities for professional societies in advancing global health? And I bucketed them in several different categories. Research, education and training, advocacy, partnership, and capacity building. And I'll talk uh, briefly about each of these. So research is the discovery of new knowledge. So professional societies can provide grant funding to investigators. Richard talked about some of the funding he received through ATS. Um, research by societies. This is something that ATS has kind of been dabbling with. We uh, have some tradition with uh, TB in the past. We currently have um, a grant from the Council of Medical Specialty Societies and the CDC to uh, increase COVID-19, influenza, and other routine vaccination rates among high-risk adult patients, and we're focusing on patients with COPD. So this is a grant that is awarded to the ATS to um, carry this out. Um, other professional societies do this to a greater degree than we do, um, but it's definitely an opportunity. A facilitation of global collaborations, again, um, we've heard a little bit from Richard, shared working group reports, uh, et cetera, shared registries. Um, I think that's a great opportunity uh, for medical professional societies to advance our knowledge. Uh, networking that happens and building those collaborations, those research collaborations. And then, of course, there's the dissemination of the discoveries. We do that through meetings, through presentations at meetings, through our journals, and more recently through webinars, um, which has definitely expanded the global reach of discoveries. Education and training, providing training and educational opportunities for providers in low resource settings. Um, I hear this is my preaching to the choir here um, for MECOR Methods in Epidemiologic Clinical and Operations Research. MECOR program is a great example of that. Sonia's uh, brainchild from 25 years ago now. 27. Okay, 27. Uh, more than 25 years ago. Uh, Juliana is now um, taking over the mantle, so uh, great leadership. What's the, uh, the, the areas in blue are the regions that uh, MECOR has uh, had an imprint uh, and has been incredibly successful. So it's this very specific example of building uh, education and training opportunities around the world. Develop guidelines and best practices to help healthcare providers in different parts of the world deliver high quality care. Um, we've partnered with a number of other professional societies to develop guidelines, and uh, I was going to point out we also have a guide to guidelines for professional societies that Sonia is part of. I don't know if you remember this one. <laughs> um, and importantly, moving towards how to ensure that our guidelines are appropriate in different settings. So an example of healthcare of the critically ill in le low resource settings. How do we ensure, for example, our definitions of ARDS that we were just talking about are appropriate in different resource settings? Um, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the challenges of, of uh, doing these joint guidelines. Advocacy. 
Medical professional societies can and should advocate for global health issues and work to shape policies and programs that address health inequities and disparities worldwide. Uh, we have commented and, and um, let's see, do I have that? Let me go back one. Uh, talking about the acquisition of Vectora by Philip Morris. Many of you may know that Philip Morris bought Vectora, which um, makes uh, uh, very key components for the inhalation uh, devices that we use for our treatments for asthma. Um, uh, talking about the respiratory health in migrant and refugee populations. We've advocated and gone down uh, to Washington, D.C. Uh, in this case, we were also advocating for increasing uh, research funds for TB, for um, research worldwide. So I think advocacy is a big part of it. And also as part of advocacy, I'd like uh, our um, Forum of International Respiratory Societies, and this is the quote from their website, is an organization comprised of the world's leading international professional respiratory societies presenting a unifying voice to improve lung health globally. Um, so FERS has uh, published a number of different uh, guidelines and articles. I give you an example of the global impact of respiratory diseases, um, and then uh, and I'm going to talk, look at the joint statement on the implications of Philip Morris's acquisition of Vectora, and I'll get back to the, the signatory societies in a little bit. So partnership. Partnership with other organizations, other societies, other NGOs, government, and private sector and entities. Um, to pull resources and expertise for joint initiatives to improve global health outcomes. You know, one example uh, that I came up with is um, our industry green initiative. So ATS has worked with uh, a number of our corporate partners, our biotech, uh, AstraZeneca, uh, BI, et cetera. Um, and one of the outcomes of that was uh, a set of best practices of green initiatives that companies worldwide can do to um, decrease their carbon footprint. Um, things, simple things like changing the paper that they produce their um, advertisements on to make sure that they're recyclable. Um, eliminating the door hangers. You remember at meetings you'd get the, the door hang with the bags with tons of paper that you just threw out. Um, we said we don't like it. The company said they're not really effective, and so um, we eliminated those things. So I think that's a great example of partnership with the private sector. Uh, MOUs with other societies to advance common goals. We, ATS has a number of MOUs with respiratory societies from around the world um, on dealing with uh, sharing of some resources, um, exchange of um, travel, uh, et cetera. Um, We've just started or working on um, a respiratory society of the Americas and realizing we are the American Thoracic Society, but the Americas is, uh, encompasses all of North and South America and realizing that we have a lot of uh, areas in common that we can advocate for. So this is a little more nascent. Um, we're going to be meeting um, at ATS. We've been we've met at several of the other um, at ALAT at the uh, Mexican Thoracic Society meetings where all the leaders have gotten together to talk about how do we how do we come together. We're we're neighbors. The time zone is actually um, makes it much easier to interact. Um, and then at this year's ATS, I'm making a plug. Uh, at the Women's Forum, we are highlighting uh, women international leaders in pulmonary medicine. Uh, what's pretty cool is how many of the respiratory societies around the world are being led by women or uh, just been led or president-elect. Um, Mina Gaga was, I just saw that she was um, she was supposed to come. She, was, she is the health minister of Greece, the former president at ERS. Uh, she apparently just canceled as of today. Um, but um, Marguerite uh, from the Brazilian Thoracic Society is going to be uh, coming in. Michelle, do you want to say anything else about uh, the, the luncheon? Oh, so, um, uh, please <laughs> Men are invited too. We encourage it. And Sonia started it. 
Yay. And then capacity building. Support the development of health systems and build the capacity of healthcare workers in low resource settings. So things like technical assistance, mentoring, skill building programs. And when I was reading more about this, I came across some, um, a number of writings, and in particular, uh, there's a professor at University of Michigan who um, wrote about, instead of talking about capacity building, we should really be talking about capacity sharing. Um, and it, stating that it really more overtly recognizes the function of all collaborators in learning from one another and not assuming one area is uh, superior um, to another. So that, that collaboration, that partnership is important. So challenges for professional societies in global health. Limited resources and whether that resource is money, whether that's time, whether that's bandwidth, and how do we prioritize? Richard talked about we, we can solve every problem everywhere, every time. And how, how should we prioritize given, the, given our limited resources? How do we make sure we are partnering and not patronizing? Um, there's you know, some history of imperialization, of, of, of colonialization, and that's not the way we should be moving forward. And we have to think uh, really thoughtfully about how to move forward with partnerships. How do we get to a unified voice? And if I have a few minutes, let's see, how do I? I was going to try to click on that. I just click on it? Nope. Well, nope. That's the wrong one. I have another video in there. The Cowboys, you want to click on the Cowboys? That's the one video I have. Okay, never mind. Well, getting to a unified voice is a challenge. So I wanted to point out that statement um, from Vectora, where all of the different societies signed on. That statement was supposed to be from FERS, but there was we couldn't get everyone to agree on the wording. Um, and so instead, the individual societies signed on. Um, and not all of the, the FERS uh, society members are on that, that byline. Um, so just illustrates the challenge for something that seems like apple pie, but there are you know, so many nuances um, with it. So. Uh, it, the Cowboys, if you've never seen this commercial, uh, it's a great commercial about herding cats. The Cowboys are herding cats. Love it. So sometimes when you're, ta when you're trying to get everybody on the same page, especially we're talking around the world, it is a bit like herding cats. There's often country-specific regulatory rules that may provide barriers to research collaborations. And whether that is um, regions or countries' uh, privacy laws, um, which has some challenges with the EU, whether it's our own United States with our IRB requirements, et cetera, um, those, are, those are barriers for collaborations and research. We touched upon this, but the idea of having universal clinical guidelines is challenging. There are different clinical resources. There are different drugs or medications that are approved in different parts of the region. Um, there's different languages um, that are being used. So you know, what's the balance? And no matter how many societies that we get on a clinical guideline, there is always some other society that then publishes one right around the same time. We are, it's impossible to get everybody on the same page. And then there are just some pragmatic issues like you know, differences in language, time zones. So I would say Zoom and, uh, has, has broadened the opportunity in some ways, has made it easier to interact around the world, but what time are you going to have the meeting? Um, I, we had our ATS meeting hybrid two years ago, so we scheduled sessions at all different times to accommodate people in different time zones. No matter 
I can't tell you how many emails we got complaining, how come my sessions at four in the morning or six in the morning or no matter what time we hear about it. Um, and so uh, not insurmountable, something to think about. Travel, I mean, I'm just so impressed with Juliana and Richard for schlepping out here. Um, it's, travel is harder these days, it's expensive, um, and it is a barrier, so uh, appreciate that. Then the other challenge, okay, now we can do it, and we can do it without sound. If, yep. So this is a great video, um, and what this illustrates is trying to understand what level should we be focused on? Because the challenges, the, the issues change depending on your perspective. Um, do we focus on local levels? So there's so much for healthcare disparities that is you know, at the local level. In the United States, which states have Medicaid expansion and which don't? Um, the, uh, our current reproductive rights are at the state. So where do we focus our attention? Um, do we focus at a, a country, a region? Uh, how, how high do we go? If you've never seen, this is a very cool video also. It goes all the way out to uh, the, the, the galaxy, and then it comes all the way down to quarks. Um, and figuring out which le what level should societies be focusing on and how to achieve that. We won't go all the way out. Um, and then to close, so I read the New York Times obituaries. Um, I always find them fascinating uh, and uh, give us a snapshot of different segments of the population. And actually a number of years ago, I read this obituary for Dr. Herbert Kleber, who was a pioneer in addiction treatment. Um, and he focused particularly on substance use in incarcerated populations, a really challenging uh, population, um, and he dedicated his career to this. And he was asked in an interview, how, you know, how do you, how do you keep doing that? Such, it's such a hard thing, how, how do you keep going? And so he quoted the Talmud, um, and what he said is, the day is short, this task is difficult, it is not our duty to finish it, but we are forbidden not to try. So, you know, I, I do think we are not going to solve everything, but we need to try. And then um, to finish, as I was completing everything and, and reflecting back on my own career uh, and uh, thinking, what is the role of professional societies in global health? And my conclusion is the role of professional societies in global health is that we bring the world together. And I think that um, getting to know people from around the world uh, is step one of solving our problems. Uh, and um, for me, that's been the biggest joy of being part of ATS is being given the opportunity to meet incredible people from all walk, walks of life um, and calling many of them friends and colleagues and mentors. So with that, I say thank you. Thank you, panelists. Uh, and the other speakers, too, we'd like uh, to welcome you, but we wanted to focus on pulmonary because today we've had the opportunity to consider different areas in which John Murray contributed to pulmonary and critical care medicine, and with that foundation to consider the future of our field. So I, you know, we had jotted down some questions for you, and I'd sent, I hope you got an email just basically said, think about the future. So with that, um, keep a global perspective in mind, as well as issues of equity and diversity as we discuss these questions. All right, Phil was going to kick it off. Well, we, we thought we had uh, had a nice touch by having the director's chairs so that <laughs> all of you could be a little bit elevated among the rest of us. It's like and, the firing squad. <laughs> <laughs> and it gives kind of a touch of... Hollywood to the proceedings, so although we're not very, really very Hollywood. But so as Courtney mentioned, we, we've thought about some questions. Um, 
and uh, the, the panel hasn't been pre-warned of what we're going to be asking, but they're, they're all things that uh, they should be able to, to, to answer. So um, I, I, I guess the first thing I would ask is, uh, and maybe this is a bit for Juliana, what, what do you think the impact of COVID has been on uh, pulmonary training programs? What have we learned from uh, the experience with COVID that can be applied in training programs everywhere? Um, that's, a, that's a great question. And I think you can look at that in, through several lenses. So if, I, if we ask that for, to, if we were asking the fellows who were uh, doing pulmonary critical care the year, well, 20, the, the ones that got into training in 2020 and 2021, they, well, the whole tr we do two years in Brazil, so they were basically trained in COVID. <laughs> so that's a big impact, I think, it, and it, it turned out to be an impact in terms of not getting as much experience in other areas. So everything from ambulatory care to bronchoscopy, for example. Uh, so that's a, a big impact. So at, at, at the moment, I think the impact was, in some ways, could, could be seen as bad in that sense that it interfered with training. But, uh, I, I'm happy to say, I, I guess, after a while and after we, f we feel and or we hope that the, the worst part of the pandemic is gone, I think there are lots of um, lessons that uh, have... Um, so, for example, a, a, an obvious impact. We had an, an increased interest in pulmonary and critical care fellowship in my institution. We had more applicants. And, and finally, well, Margarete Dalcomo, who is the president of the Brazilian Thoracic Society, gave an interview where she said that someone told her, oh, now I know what a pulmonologist is. And that's impressive, right? So I think it had, uh, it had um, and infectious disease doctors in Brazil also told me that there's an increase. So it was interesting to see uh, Steve was showing the the decreased interest in, in training in infectious diseases in the U.S., but that's not true, well, in my institution at least. So, so increased interest and, and greater awareness of the importance of those uh, specialists. I think there are many, many good things that, that apply to training. I, the, I think the ability to, to prepare and in some way respond to the pandemic made a big difference and they, I think fellows on one way, they, they felt they didn't get exposure to some of the opportunities that would usually happen to them. It was, they were really brave during the, 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 the pandemic and I think they had the opportunity to see that they mattered, that they can care for patients. They were there in the, the worst times and, and made a difference. So I, I don't know if I, I can answer because there are so many perspectives, but I, I think I think we all, we we must always be able to learn and take the best of every bad experience, and we never want to be around a pandemic again. But it, it might happen. How can we learn and adapt and and take the best? I think it's, it really depends on the perspective. Um, I think that one other thing. I found is that it reinforced that education is something that is a level playing field for all of us. So in many ways, the trainees often were seeing more patients with this disease than, than we would see if, if they're kind of continually taking care of patients. And we would learn from them. We would all be learning at the same time. Uh, and it was not the same kind of hierarchical dissemination of knowledge that we had gained over experience, except obviously with, with management in the ICU, but just in terms of knowledge of the disease, that is something that we all acquired at the same level. And, and I think, to me, it kind of reinforces that throughout training, we are learning at the same time as the fellows are. And I think that they should sort of recognize that, that we can learn as much from them in many ways as they learn from us. I just wanted to uh, re 
reiterate what you two had said because it brought back <clears throat> memories of my training. When I was a fellow, uh, 82, thereabouts, it was, it was all AIDS. We didn't know it was called AIDS then. We just had the young men coming in with pneumocystis and we were just bronking them and making the diagnosis of pneumocystis morning and night. And I hardly did anything else, at least at San Francisco General. But somehow I got through, I must have learned something. But it did seem as if everything else was pushed to the side because that's all we were doing. But at the same time, you got me started on a study, which was my introduction to research, and we got it published in Annals on Lavage to make the diagnosis of, of pneumocystis. So it was, as, as you say, finding the good in something was, uh, we really was all hands on deck. Yeah, so we really had to think, re rethink our ways of doing things because we're just getting slammed with bronchoscopies and we couldn't keep up with it. So developing um, what had already been looked at but um, hadn't really been refined with that using induced sputum and we made most of our diagnoses that way. Lynn, you looked like you're well, I would say the other thing. The other thing, okay, um, is how we, uh, and Steve alluded to this, how we did our educational offerings, our lectures, um, and what could be done virtually and what was better in person um, for our pulmonary fellows and for actually our entire department, for example. We went to a virtual format for medical grand rounds, and our attendance uh, probably quadrupled um, what it had been prior, and it has maintained that number. And you know, we're going to keep grand rounds uh, as a hybrid, actually, actually primary virtual format. Um, other formats, other areas, I think it's important to go back in person. So understanding what the role of virtual uh, and, and web-based learning versus in-person is important. Yeah, for us, because there, I mean, there's so few pulmonary and critical care, so our critical care and pulmonary divisions are separate, but we provide half of the critical care support and we expanded our high flow and our ICUs quite extensively. Pulmonology just shut down um, because we were the only ones that had the skill set to be able to manage that. And so our fellows got beaten up horrendously by, by COVID. Um, thankfully, the institution uh, had enough insight and grace to extend their training by six months. But effectively, we shut down pulmonology to a a bare minimum of writing up scripts and the odd scope. But um, yeah, we were full on hands on deck all day, every day. And so I think what we learned was exceptional skills in managing COVID, but probably not much else. I mean, the one funny caveat of that is that we had a standard kind of COVID protocol of hydrocortisone paralysis. Uh, Probofol, and then patient came in a few weeks later with a gunshot abdomen, and the registrar wrote up exactly the same, paralyzed the patient, put them on all the sedation, and we go, actually, this is just a gunshot. You don't need to paralyze the patient. So I think we, we learned some um, good stuff, but didn't realize that there were other ways of managing critically ill patients. My name is Steve. Um, if, if you think there are any impacts on the whole certification process, and um, would the, the regulators look at programs where uh, fellows did nothing but COVID, basically, and, and say, well, this wasn't really adequate training? Yeah, I, I think that this is a real, it's a real issue, um, basically. And I think what people will need to do during training is to have alternative ways of getting that same education without necessarily the same clinical experience, which I have to say is, is not great. Um, I, I will say, speaking from personal experience, I, I did my pulmonary fellowship as part of being a clinical associate at the, in the pulmonary branch at NHLBI. And um, what, what I was exposed to then would not pass muster for any of the regulatory agencies right now. We saw a lot of interstitial lung disease. We saw a lot of obscure things. But 
we didn't really see COPD, we didn't really see pneumonia, uh, et cetera. And so I think uh, I and my colleagues at the same time had to sort of supplement uh, with, with that. And it does take some responsibility of the trainees to try to find other ways of learning about that and getting the um, teaching from, from more senior faculty. But, but AC, ACGME provided waivers for a number of their, their requirements and regulations during COVID. I mean, there's a, a cap on the number of ICU rotations that the residents are supposed to do. And, you know, they did away with that. And, um, you know, so they were, the, the regulatory agencies were very accommodating in terms of the modifications that we needed for our training programs. Can I add something? And we don't use exactly the same framework in Brazil, but if we look at ACMG, um, requirements. There are six domains, right? And professionalism, teamwork, leadership, and lifelong training. These are all stuff that we, on the other hand, should have been able to 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 teach the fellows during those times. And and I hope we did in the sense that if they, as you said, if they didn't get training uh, in one of those areas, they can they can they can still do that if they learn how to do that. So critical thinking, uh, clinical reasoning, and, and in many of the other aspects that we could provide and model during the pandemic, I think were really important. So we can continue with COVID and some of these other questions. It's hard to, hard not to uh, keep it in mind, but one of the things we just wanted to ask was, well, again, back to John Murray, he had in so many of the areas, every single talk was set up to have something to do with his contributions. And he made advances and he you know, pointed the way on so many of those topics, whether um, training, journals, uh, global health, the definition of ARDS, so many, many things. Well, what is our future now? What should be, what, you know, that crystal ball uh, problem. But now that you're all together and you've heard each other's talks, do you have any sense of what the future will bring, what the key elements are. Maybe let's, let's just talk about maybe opportunities that exist. Lynn, you're smiling. Why don't you kick it off? <laughs> um, I, I think there's going to be a lot more focus on social determinants of health um, and how that impacts everything that we do in medicine and pulmonary medicine and critical care. I think um, you know, too bad Carolyn and, and Michael aren't here. I think precision medicine to pulmonary, specifically critical care medicine, uh, is, I'm hoping, coming uh, to us very soon. Um, and uh, uh, the use of digital technologies and how to incorporate them into care, telemedicine, et cetera. Textbooks. Well, yeah, and textbooks, and what the future of textbooks is going to be. <laughs> yes. John had a, um, it was a photo, or maybe he made it into a slide of, um, he had personalized medicine, and it was a picture of him examining a patient. <laughs> yeah, <my bedroom. laughs> Yeah, two areas that, that I think are really important, not just for pulmonary, but for all of, of medicine, and, and I mentioned some, some of these in my talk. One, and, and this is certainly something that, that I know John would resonate with, which is more of the partnership with patients in, in their care and in decisions about, uh, decisions about care. And, and I think that um, as all of us get older and we have our own medical problems and relatives who have medical problems, we realize that it's a very different view of the healthcare system when you're going through it yourself, and trainees do not often go through it. And I think it's important for them to recognize kind of what the impact of health and disease is on patients in ways that they don't necessarily recognize right now. Um, the, the second thing I think is the economic impact of, of healthcare on, on society. 
and the fact that we do need to be very much conscious of things that we are doing that will affect um, society's finances without necessarily as much benefit. Uh, we, we know just the, the percentage of GDP that is spent on health care you know, keeps, keeps rising. And um, society can't tolerate that forever. And we also know that there is a fair amount of health care that is unnecessary or wasted or doesn't necessarily benefit patients. And I can see what's really coming down the pike is we know with the development of uh, newer biological agents, um, gene therapy that is going to cost a fortune. I think that we as the physician community are going to have to have a, an important role in working with legislators, other people who are in, in a position of development of policy as to how we deal with this. I mean, when we're talking about a treatment that costs a million dollars a year, for example, it's coming. And of course that brings up equity too. Richard, uh, Giuliani, do you have any thoughts about your view of the future? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the one of the benefits of COVID was how small the world got, and that the ability to collaborate. That I mean, we recognised that we didn't have to travel as much to be able to collaborate, and I think that skill is important. I think there's challenges coming up that cost of travel is is increasing dramatically. I mean, I think they're talking about 30 or 40% higher current um, costs. So I think that, I mean, there is the importance of being in person, and I would have hated to have done this online. But I think the opportunities to collaborate much more broadly, because we are used to doing it electronically, becomes very useful. And cross-pollinating in terms of resources and ideas. And I think people have also become more free with their knowledge. Um, hopefully there's a lower middle income country discount on, on uh, Maria and Nadal. But people oh, there are- There is, there is. <laughs> but people are, repositories are coming up, people are being more free with their information and sharing. So I think there is a collegiality that has increased during COVID, which hopefully will um, benefit us all. I, I would add that one thing that also, uh, surfaced in many of the talks to today is, um, and especially in your talk about the, the book, which is evidence-based medicine and, and how we, I, th I hope that it could be a lesson on, on how dangerous it was to, to uh, deviate from that during COVID, for example, and, and trying ivermectin and several different doses and, and other medicine that, that uh, then show not to be effective, and how many people, and, and, and in Brazil at least, many physicians continue to use those drugs in spite of evidence that it didn't um, help. So I, I would hope that, I, I like the idea of trying to create the future, and I, I see the, the healthcare community has, has a, a call to, to, to help communicate the importance of, of trying to or using evidence-based medicine for, for everything that we do clinically, especially when if it, it's going to cost a lot, is it really effective? Or if it's going to have side effects, is it really effective? And how it's dangerous when we, we don't, when we, we use the excuse that it's a, it's a new disease or we're, we're in, in almost collapsing, so why not try? So that's what I heard a lot in Brazil. Well, what does it hurt to try? Well, it hurts a lot, so I, would, I think it's something that we also discussed here today, the importance of being uh, grounded in, in uh, sound science. It seems that's where our, some of our professional societies can help by giving us cover and, and, and guidance more so than just our, our hospital or our state yes. whole society. Um, and one of the things that we try to do um, is facilitate or accelerate the timeline for providing guidance, uh, sort of talking about uh, accelerating dissemination of information when you don't have the complete uh, picture um, and acknowledging that these are recommendations, they're not 
don't meet the, the criteria of clinical guidelines. Um, but I think what Juliana is talking about was so important with COVID and was fascinating to me as a critical care doctor and a, and a leader in pulmonary and critical care to see how many of my colleagues and leaders around the country were just, um, you know, felt like they were talking about a virus that came from outer space um, and this is totally new and abandoned our evidence-based practices are, uh, and uh, you know, wanted, just wanted to do something. And I think that causes more harm than good. And yeah. I mean, I think the other challenge is, is to make a statement about don't rather than do. Because with Twitter and social media, you just need one farmer to say, ivermectin worked for my sheep. And then we spend the next three or four years having to prove that it doesn't. And so from the society's point of view, I think it's, it's, it's very difficult for us as a community to say, actually, we don't think this is going to work. We're not advocating it until we have evidence, um, as opposed to saying, well, you can use it until we say no. I think with social media, we're going to be called on more and more to make a stance earlier to say no until we are sure rather than let it run. What Kirsten was saying was pre-but. Was that it to get pre-but? But it's, it's not even yes. saying no, it's saying use this as part of a clinical trial so we can understand yes. if it's effective. Um, if everybody just uses a drug and makes an assumption, you will never get that information. So use it and study it. So another question. Um, you did very well on that one. Yes, you, you all did quite well. <laughs> All the, all the children are above average. <laughs> um, so we talk a lot about inequities, but one of the areas where there are huge inequities is in critical care between high resource settings and low or even middle resource settings. I wonder what your thoughts are about how that, that gap, that equity gap can be bridged, what, what can be done to not, not bring down the quality of care in, in high resource settings, but bring it up in low resource settings. And there have been, you know, just for example, um, even before COVID, there was a scarcity of oxygen in, in many places uh, in low resource settings. And so patients, kids with pneumonia couldn't even be given oxygen. So what are your thoughts on that? I'll dive in with that because we have a, a, a really good example of, I think, what the answer is. And that, so in our intensive care setup in South Africa, we had eight, we have eight medical ICU beds at Khrutuskia Hospital. That's how you pronounce it, Khrutuskia. Big barn. Khrutuskia. Doesn't matter. Big barn is the English translation. So we had, we had eight medical ICU beds. We had two ICU teams and we expanded to five ICU teams. So we ended up running 45, 46 critical care beds. And the limitation, the decision to not expand was based on nursing. Because at 45 ICU beds, we were using nurses that had none or almost no ICU training. And the level of care dropped off so the limitation was not on doctors, the limitation was on nurses to special a patient. And so we, the hospital decided not to expand any further. We could have gone into the um, theatres, we could have gone into elsewhere, but because the level of nursing had dropped off at that point. So simple things like not flushing a central cannula, which is running adrenaline, um, which all ICU nurses know, these nurses didn't. So if you want to expand critical care, you need your nursing staff base. Um, for us, that's what limits. I mean, yes, ventilators and stuff are important, but you can have ventilators and oxygen and doctors. But if you don't have good nursing staff, you are wasting resources. I, I, I don't have a lot more to say because I, I, Broadly agree. I would say it's capacity building. I don't, I'm not sure it's just nurses. In Brazil, we had a shortage, shortage of um, 
ICU physicians during the, the pandemic in Sao Paulo. It was hard to hire. There was a lot of competition to hire new people. And, and as I showed you, we had that area in the top floor of the hospital that, that is a beautiful, that was a beautiful ICU, brand new with isolation rooms and everything like uh, high. And, and the government likes to, well, any governor loves to build a new hospital or build a new ICU because you can do a party and you inaugurate it and you spend that money and that's it and it has your name there forever in a plaque. Whereas when you hire a new physician or a new nurse, especially in, the, in my hospital, it's a public hospital, it's, that position is, is uh, there forever. So that's harder to invest. But that's where we should be investing. So it, it has to do with building capacity, but also it has to do with investing money, government money and private money as well, in, in understanding that we, it's not just the CT scans or uh, the equipment, but it's the people who are operating it and caring for patients and, and holding their hands in their most difficult hour. And I think of it, there's the limitation of physical resources, oxygen in areas or ventilators or specific things, and then there's the expertise um, to carry out the care. Uh, I do think there, it is not realistic, for example, to have critical care physicians in every region of the state, country, et cetera. So how do we, um, use other ways of providing that expertise. And that's, I do think, thinking creatively, can we use EICU um, to help extend knowledge um, and expertise in the care of patients in areas that are under-resourced uh, and don't necessarily have the nursing or physician or um, other staff for that. So I, I do think thinking how we can extend our knowledge with, without necessarily putting people in the hospitals in every region is going to be the key. Um, I don't know whether people are familiar with it, but one of the programs I think that has been uh, very innovative and effective is what's called the ECHO program, which has been developed by a guy named Sanjeev Arora at the University of New Mexico. And the idea behind it is to have physicians who have expertise in a certain area be able to disseminate that expertise around the country to more general physicians who may not have expertise in that area. And they get together uh, online, I think with video conferencing, on a, on a regular basis where physicians in less well-served areas will present their cases to an expert. Uh, Sanjeev himself is, a, is an expert on, on hepatitis, but this has now been expanded to other areas, and I think they have it in ILD now uh, as well. But it's one of the sort of innovative ways that you can be expanding capacity to areas that don't necessarily have that expertise. I think if Michael Mathe were here, <clears throat> he'd be bringing up the global definition of ARDS as a, you know, with the goal that if you can make it, you can uh, make it appropriate to different levels of, of resource, and you can improve the diagnosis of ARDS and maybe start treatment earlier and maybe keep people off ventilators. And so that, that, that's another approach to sort of think of the way we're diagnosing with uh, <clears throat> low resource areas in mind, uh, because, because with the Berlin definition, they weren't really going to be able to benefit from that until it was too late and they were on a ventilator, if they ever got on a ventilator. So that, I, I'm just speaking up for Michael because I think he would have said that if he were here. Because that, that's another way, I suppose, to ultimately... But you have to, like, do it in his voice. Oh, I, I can't... Uh, I need Rich Calais to, to do it in Michael's voice, but... Uh, great. Okay, well, we, uh, we're, we just had a couple more questions ourselves and perhaps the audience can be thinking of questions they have. But before we get to that, I, I know you've, you've touched on this, and I guess one thing I was wondering is how should we be preparing? We've been talking about all the things that could be done for the future, where we think we're going, but again, that was another thing John Murray did. He sort of 
saw that we didn't have enough pulmonary physicians. So he worked with the NIH to you know, start training programs. And he saw that uh, there was uh, uh, just a mishmash of training. So they got something set up that, that uh, uh, standardized training and standardized uh, the journal entry requirements. So many things that he, he saw and then did something about them that we still have today. Do you, do you see any, would there be any, anything on your wish list that we could work on to prepare as a project now that we could be working on? More work? Uh, Lynn, no, what was that you said? More work, you're asking? <laughs> yes, well, more work or smarter work. I mean, maybe we, you know, we focus on key areas that would make a difference if we, uh, I mean, many, you've, you've all pointed to many different issues. Are there some that you think are particular ones that you would want us all to be thinking about and get started on? Well, this is a little more specific to the United States, um, but in line with uh, you know, John Murray and his notes on patients, how do we change our electronic medical records so it is not a source of burnout for our workforce and that it is actually a useful communication tool um, to share and disseminate information about patients? So fixing. EMR, the HR, uh, would be a high priority for me. I think we'd say that at our institution too. It's sort of the, dog, the tail wagging the dog. We're all in, uh, trapped by this system that was not developed with doctors and patients in mind. Ah, some renegade in the audience uh, said single payer health. Mm. Well, I, I agree with that, although I was going to say something different. Um, I, I think that one of the challenges that we are going to be faced increasingly over the next few years is what's going to happen with artificial intelligence and its relationship to the medical field. And I think that we are going to have to be active in that area because of misinformation that comes and also see what happens in terms of the populations using that as a source of medical care, really. Um, so that, that's only going to be increasing. We, we've seen over the past month how it's exploded in the, uh, in the press, in the media. And so if that's the rate at which it's going, I think we, we've got a revolution potentially coming. Oh boy, and how do we do that? Uh, well, I think we have to, uh, I, I don't think that we know yet because we don't know exactly where it's I'm sort going. I'm puzzled as, you know, it's out there and you feel a, a little bit of a threat. I mean, I, right. that's about as far as I've gotten. But I, right. I don't quite know where it's going to pop up and exactly what it's going to do to harm us yet. Right. And it may help us. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. I, I think we have to be prepared for any eventuality there. Just ask. Just ask. <laughs> Just at JBG to say, how do we help us help you help us? How do, how do we prevent you from hurting us? Yeah. <laughs> okay. oh, ask it, yes. I guess one thing I would like to see in the future, although I don't have the answer for that, is strategies, because we, we talk today a lot, too, about health disparities and how that has been uh, uh, worsened during COVID. And I think we've learned over the recent years the impact of health disparities and social determinants of health. But there's little um, research on strategies to deal with that. And of course, you can think about society, society's response to inequalities, but that's not in our control. So I, I wonder if the medical society will come up with the strategies to mitigate the, the, the disparities and, and uh, provide more equitable care for everyone. Looking at you. Well, you know, one of the challenges that, or uh, one of the feedback that we've heard about journals and healthcare disparities is that journals are publishing 
the, about health, the existence of healthcare disparities, but we need to start doing research on how to mitigate healthcare disparities to do the next step and fund that research um, and determine what, what's effective. Um, and I don't think we've gotten, we're just, we're dipping our toes in there. We haven't gotten there yet. No, good, good point. I think Sonia had a question. Audience. Yeah, so now we turn to the audience, our wise audience. You've been quiet and very well behaved all day. Um, do any of you have uh, a question for our panel? Oh, uh, John, is that John? All right, I think you can respond to that. You too? I mean, I think I mean, John's absolutely correct. I mean, we, we had many discussions with various donors who were saying, can we, what can we do? Can we bring ventilators? Can we, um, and I mean, the answer is oxygen. If you don't have oxygen, you can't. And um, so we ran, so we ran our high flow service outside of the ICU in the wards, so much like Juliana, where they doubled their oxygen capacity. But at the height of the pandemic, there were four guys from our local called Afrox, African Oxygen, who basically drove 24-7 to deliver liquid oxygen to the hospitals. And if their truck broke down, we would be out of oxygen. And so, I mean, I think oxygen, it's a weird resource. Um, concentrators, unfortunately, in the COVID setting, concentrators didn't really help us too much. It helped us get patients out of hospital, so those in convalescence could go to step-down facilities with an oxygen concentrator, but that requires electricity, which is a major problem. Um, but liquid oxygen is a, is, a, is a difficult resource to put in to, to many places, but I mean, John's absolutely correct that without oxygen, nursing doesn't help. I think what you what you're talking about, John, is is a, a tough matter because it really is related to economics, because there's no oxygen there because there's no money to buy the oxygen because there's oxygen to be bought or there's no there's no uh, industrial plan to to produce the oxygen and it's all about the money. So I, I think at some point it will it will be related to what we talk about in in climate change. Wealthier nations across the globe will will have, in 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 some way, the responsibility to decide to uh, help or um, distribute the wealth that will be necessary to to build capacity in those countries. And and I understand it's really hard because when you from 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 the other country's perspective, you could be well. Well, we are, have our own pr troubles here. How can we, how can we even share? And, and I think um, I've, that's why I think it's complicated. But it's very simple in the sense that it, it, there's no way around the fact that there is has to be a, a a more just distribution of wealth across across the globe if we really want to tackle that problem. Uh, there may be some opportunities, um, not, not so much through a governmental level to provide that economic assistance, but places like the Gates Foundation, um, I think, have been very much focused, certainly, on, on international uh, aspects of health. And there may be other well-funded uh, organizations that, let's say, if the American Thoracic Society or other organizations could try to push those particular foundations to be funding some of these areas, that might be, might be one approach. I haven't heard anyone say strengthening primary health care is a key to Im improving, basically, I wouldn't call it critical care, but improving survival of critically ill patients. Um, you're just going to sh shake your heads yes, then. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you're so right that I, I don't have any further yeah. comments. But I, it, well, I can speak about Brazil, for example. We should be doing a lot more family, uh, 
family medicine and, and primary care medicine than we do, and, and not a lot of residents or fellows want to go into those specialties. So uh, I, I agree, and, and it's a strategic decision, maybe, that we should be focusing on, and it would have a huge impact, much, much greater impact than, than increasing oxygen, maybe. But, for, I mean, the, the come back to COVID, vaccination is, a, vaccination is a primary care issue. I mean, we even had the discussions of whether we should be admitting people to the ICU who had chosen not to be vaccinated, when vaccination clearly reduces your risks, but when you don't have vaccination available. Um, and so, again, but strengthening primary care is going to cost. Um, and, again, it comes down to economics, unfortunately. And it goes beyond medicine, right? Because it's access to clean water, it's access to food and adequate nutrition, um, it's access to electricity um, that is required. And so I think uh, we need to work closely with the infrastructure, the civil infrastructure in different parts of the world to elevate uh, the health of our communities. It's not simply providing oxygen around the world. It's how do we improve the overall, the malnourished kids who are more susceptible to getting pneumonia and are likely going to die in that, in that case? Um, I don't have the answer, <laughs> um, but yeah. You're heard. Well, I, th I think um, I, I think that the question has two components. What what are patients going to want? What is the general population going to do as far as using artificial intelligence? And the second part of that is what is the medical community go going to do? I think that there is going to be much more patient slash population use and with patients actually coming to physicians even more than they do right now with information that they have gotten from these various artificial intelligence sources. We need to, to know what to do about that. I think on the positive side for physicians, what it can do, hopefully, is kind of broad literature information searches uh, helping us to some extent with diagnostic evaluation, uh, particularly for, for obscure diseases. I think that the downside is going to be misinformation that's out there uh, that, gets, that gets spread, that it's going to be hard to counter, but we have to be prepared to, to do so. Other questions? Yes, <laughs> John. <laughs> yeah, my, my comment was, yes, how do we fix that? And what is the effective ways of doing it? Whether it's, you know, pre-K programs for education, it's, what, elevates, what elevates the education level and raises people out of poverty? What are the most effective ways? So I think we're on the same page. And yes. Other questions, comments? Sonia, you're being remarkably quiet. Oh, oh, Brian. <laughs> yeah, I, I do think that there's going to have to be greater customization of, of training based on what someone's ultimate career plans are. And um, I, I do think that it's, that there will need to be a certain level of general Education. I mean, in the same way, for example, that um, to be a subspecialist in pulmonary disease or cardiology or whatever, you have to go through internal medicine training. You know, do you really need to go through three years of that as opposed to two years, for, for example? And I would say as people are interested in more sub-sub-specialization, perhaps there are opportunities to shorten the, the basic training. Um, I wouldn't eliminate it. I wouldn't put it at less than two years, 
but on the other hand, I think that may be some, some opportunity. And similarly, we may want to think in terms of the pulmonary and critical care training. Are there opportunities to customize that, to make sure that someone gets the certain level of general education, but then can go in, whether it's interventional pulmonology, whether it's, you know, uh, pulmonary vascular disease specialization, what, whatever. I agree, it's very hard to come out at age 60 and, and suddenly be uh, starting your practice. A quick follow-up on the AI question, which Gerard brought up and, some, and you talked about. I wanted to ask the four, six of you, how is AI going to influence you and the work that you do? Because AI is going to affect everyone. I mean, it's going to be down to kindergarten level, college level, all our patients. But it will also affect us and how we write and how we review what other people have written and how we can use technology to look for AI. I think this tsunami is just about to overcome us. And I am, I see this in my grandkids, you know, this, that they're using this. How is it going to affect all of you? It is here to stay, um, and we need to understand how to use it best. And um, we can't bury our head in the sand because it is going to explode. Um, and I, what I've been trying to do is explore ways to, ha how to have chat GPT help make my life easier. And whether that's helping me start write a message or a communication or, you know, giving me a jump start on giving this talk about what global health is. Uh, I think I've only dipped into it, but you know, I, I think we all need to explore it and um, see what the capabilities of it are to figure out where it flows, where, where it belongs. Um, and I think we need, it's going to, it's going to be part of our, our lives. It is a part of our lives already. I'd also want to know how to identify it. Because there will be online ways there already are. I don't know if they'll be able to keep up with it. But ways to identify it, for example, I've wondered if when chapters start being uh, submitted for the textbook, if, if they'll include AI that we won't recognize and what would be our policy about that? I, um, at first, I'd like to be able to recognize that it's there, uh, but I would hope that we wouldn't have to deal with that. But um, from what we're hearing, it's going to pop into everything. So uh, that's what I'd like to know, how to identify it. This is, this is an extension of what um, happened a while back when there were software programs developed to uh, look at plagiarism, yes. essentially. And there are people now who are actually trying to develop software to identify when AI has been used. I mean, the, the one that's been publicized, there, there's apparently an undergraduate at Princeton who is doing this for his thesis, and he's the one who's kind of fairly far along with this. But th that's going to be the challenge. I, I think it is absolutely analogous to the plagiarism issue. I, I saw Kirsten shaking her head over there when Sonia was asking the question. What, what, what are your thoughts? You're, I mean, you're really going to be in the hot seat. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think it's, it's an interesting area. I do agree that it makes, um, it appears to make a lot of the work that we all do easier, and so that would be the reason why many will adopt it. I, I, um, I, I, think, I think the potential, uh, it's a potential ability to transform everything about the way we think about things, um, because Democratizes 
There are many people who are writing globally not in English, um, who we want to do peer review, who have perspectives, and you have a tool now that can make it easier to take a good review um, and to send it to me in a way that our editors can, can make use of that review. So it, it's, it's challenging, but it does have the potential to turn everything on it. Peter. I was going to call on you anyway. <laughs> no, I, I, I think there's an understandable anxiety about AI, but I think what's equally exciting and disruptive is the massive data sets that are available for help. It's no longer a stack of charts like this down in the basement of, of the general. And, and I wonder like how this Surveillance capitalism, right? You know, it's sort of how we pull in other orthogonal data to help improve patient care, whether it's like uh, credit card records rather than taking a social history, or genomics rather than taking a family history. And, I mean, it's kind of, it's got some scary outcomes, but it's also got, I think, a tremendous potential. And I just wonder, diverting attention away from the methodology of AI to the real gold mine. I, I like your point, and one thing that I was thinking about AI, if we don't, we don't focus on chat GPT, but any other models of artificial intelligence, one, one potential use that I see is, for example, developing models that really um, help you, uh, help people apply evidence-based medicine. For example, you, you see a patient in the ER and you input the data, the model will tell you this is 89% chance that this is pneumonia, there is a 12% chance that is, oh, okay, my percentages, my percentages are not adding up to 100, <laughs> but <laughs> there's a chance this is a pulmonary embolism and the, uh, the, the, the most rational way here is, I don't know, start antibiotics and uh, if the patient doesn't uh, improve in, I don't know, X hours, do a, a, a CT scan, for example. So I, I, I see the implications for that if you're doing this in large scale in places where you don't have as many doctors to, to make those decisions and people are making clinical decisions uh, in an in a unsubstantial way. So I think this, this is one, um, trying to be optimistic looking at it. The other one is also a democratic way of using it. I have tried and it works really well. You can ask ChatGPT to write codes for R, the statistical package that is open, open source and free. And it does a real good job. And it's really hard to program on R. So I, I've, I've learned uh, basic stuff, but then now ChatGPT does this really quickly and you can say, uh, write the code to, I don't know, uh, do a t-test and compare these two groups and, and write the, and also do a graph with those colors and it will do it for you. So I'm, I'm looking at ways of uh, bringing uh, the, all the data, all the knowledge that is around there and, and to everyone's hands. I think one of the challenges and with things that you mentioned in terms of mining other data, the argument against that is going to be a privacy argument. Uh, you, you mentioned specifically credit card information uh, and genomic data. And so I, I think that that's going to take a while and people are going to have to address the whole issue of privacy um, regulation before that happens. Mail. 
Yeah, I mean, I think you, I mean, you're absolutely right. And I mean, in a, in a low resource setting, I mean, electronic records are almost non-existent. And then when you have load shedding, so you only have power for a couple of hours a day, then you don't even have records. I mean, one of my experiences of simple paper records is the clerk happens to be drunk on duty and misspells the patient's name. And so that's it. You have no access to anything before. So I mean, AI would be nice in that context, but I think the implications of AI for low-income settings could be quite weird because some will have access to that knowledge and come and say, I have got this, um, and others will come with a paper record and you can't actually see it. So, yeah, it's, it's something that's going to be really interesting. I think the one element that is helpful um, is where... Um, inequalities don't really matter. So like interstitial lung disease and the ability of uh, CT, automated CT reading, where it doesn't matter what color of your skin is, the c CT actually works pretty well. And so where you have limited access to radiology, then the ability to have an automated CT read in certain things is important. We worked with a group looking at tuberculosis, for example, and TB is a really interesting one because your cavity starts at a certain size and when your cavity gets bigger, that's actually better than the cavity because the wall's getting thinner. So a enlarging cavity in one context is actually an improvement. In other contexts, it's not. So for some diseases, it's really easy. For others, it's a bit more tricky. But I think in the low-income setting, the automated the ability to analyze without a doctor, at least so that the primary care nurse has somewhere to start. Um, I think that's going to be its, its most useful space. There, there are certainly um, a, a number, I think, uh, systems with basically AI interpretation of chest radiographs that have been deployed and what that enables one a, a program to uh, utilize is to to take a chest radiograph as uh, a screening test for tuberculosis and not have to rely on getting that physical radiograph to somebody to read it but it uh, it's read by the the computer and it's it's good enough that it's for a screening test it might not be good enough to actually make the diagnosis but it's good enough to say this person needs to be further evaluated. So there's a lot of emphasis on uh, early detection and screening in TB, and this is one of the tools that is being pushed uh, to, to do this. Comments? Anybody else? Darlene, were you sticking your hand up? No, you're scratching your chin. <laughs> Phil won't give me his microphone. <laughs> um, I was wondering if we're ready for the next pandemic. I mean, it's been rumored that there's viruses uh, coming along, and we shouldn't be surprised if we have another escape from an animal or a lab or something and come our way. Do you think that we can handle this better now than uh, before? I mean, Juliana, you had a lot of preparation. You showed us how you went from uh, the first phase to the second phase. Would you, would you approach a, sec a second pandemic similarly? My, my gut response is, oh my God, please, not another pandemic. <laughs> but I, 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 I agree. I hope, I think humans have done a, a tremendous job in, in facing uh, adversity over the centuries. I mean, we've, we've fought, fought other pandemics with much less resources than we do today. 
And uh, I think now, looking at what happened with COVID, uh, I think we are better prepared. And I think my hospital was, we learned, we had learned from H1N1. And also, when um, the, the SARS-1, that didn't hit Brazil, but that's when we, we first had isolation rooms, we, we realized we had to have them in our hospital. So I think, I think we would leverage what we had from, from the previous experience and, and try to do best. So I, I, I think we, we would always be better prepared and it, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing because you I mean you learned because you suffered the other pandemic. But I, I think yes. But I hope it it's it's a, no, it takes a long, long time. I, I think one way we're better prepared um, is with the advent of mRNA vaccine technology. What a difference! It's something that can be expanded, extrapolated to other agents as as like they the come flu, into play. Maybe like we would have flu, whatever. You know. I would hope it's going to be a surgical pandemic because um, certainly in our third and fourth waves, our surgeons disappeared. And so I, I think in some way we are better prepared, but it depends how we respond, whether we respond like we did the first time when it was all exciting and we all come in, or we respond on the fourth wave where those that claim they don't know anything about respiratory dis disappear and leave the few. So. Yeah, I think it very much depends what it looks like and and what the psyche of the healthcare and the community looks like as to how well we respond. I mean, we know how to do it, but how well we do it, I think, is going to depend very much what it looks like and who's prepared to step up to the plate. And, and I would say I think COVID showed us that we have uh, divested in public health infrastructure in the country and that we need, need to make significant reinvestments in public health in order for us to be um, uh, prepared for whatever the next pandemic is. Uh, and I don't think that has happened yet. The other thing I am concerned about is the, political, the, the politicalization of science. Um, and we are now... Uh, People don't believe science. Uh, they distrust government. They distrust uh, the CDC, the NIH. And um, if another pandemic comes, we need people to be on board um, and follow the science. We, we, we also need a new Tony Fauci, basically. Yeah. Uh, someone who will take that kind of leadership role um, he needs to appoint a successor. I hope I hope so, but it almost seems as if we that misinformation is all primed. They all they know what to do. I mean, we we know how to go to the vaccines, get the ventilators, get the rooms, but they all know what to do too. So as soon as one little thing pops up, they're out there at, in force, and we'll have it. It'll be bigger and better uh, the next time around, probably. I say it looks like they're setting up the reception in the back, so it's uh, probably a good time to to take a break and adjourn to the back of the room for the uh, wine and cheese, and I'm not sure what else. And can I can I just thank Phil and Courtney um, and the family for all of their support and for organizing this? It's you guys did an amazing job and. Lots more people online, and uh, so congratulations. Couldn't have done it without you.